Hi guys, so first of all I am happy to announce that from our institutes, rest of our CA and CMA, we are going to release all CA Inter 8 subjects marathon for the coming May 2023 exams. So please watch this introduction without any failure because I am going to give you certain inputs before you proceed watching this marathon. Okay. Now, just a minute. Now, uh, for all the eight subjects we are going to upload and I am also going to give you the faculty details and resources that you need to use parallelly while you are watching this marathon. Now, uh, first of all, you know, relating to group one, paper one, paper two, paper three and paper four. And group 2, paper 5, paper 6, paper 7 and paper 8. Okay. By the way, I am doing this video, this introduction part. I am recording it on, you know, March 1st week, 2023. Okay. So, paper 1 is accounting. Paper 2 is law, costing and taxation and advanced accounts. And of course, audit which is handled by myself and EAS and SM and FM and economics. Okay, so these are the subjects that we are having. Uh, kindly watch this introduction. We wanted to provide you all eight subjects marathon under one roof. Okay, so completely in English. The marathons are going to be completely in English. Okay, this whatever you are watching, this introduction will be there in every subject related marathon which we have uploaded. Now, so accounts, the, the subject is being handled by our expert faculty, uh, you know, uh, Satya Raju sir, Satya Raju sir. So where we are going to upload for approximately, you know, 18 to 20 hours of marathon in two parts. Okay, one part will be of 11 and a half to 12 hours and 8 hours. Sir, by when I will be uploading these videos? By when you will be getting all these marathons? Already if you observe, paper 6 audit marathon is already uploaded. Like, if you open our YouTube channel, okay, if you open our YouTube channel, see Ram Harsha. So, if you come to the playlist, if you come to the playlist, so here, already audit revision May 2023 is already uploaded, part 1 and part 2. Now, what else is pending? Remaining subjects are pending. Now, here, we will create a playlist, Okay, separate playlist exclusively May 2023 CA Inter Revision or CA Inter Marathon. Something like this we will create a playlist which you will find from 8th March onwards. Okay, so I will create a playlist here and inside that you will find all the subjects marathon which we gradually upload in the coming 10-15 days. Okay, so anyhow by the time you started watching those subjects this introduction will be outdated for you. Okay, now throughout this marathon we are using certain materials. Okay, we will use certain materials as basis for teaching in these marathons. Now, one more important clarification that I want to cover is for paper to company law, especially in paper to we have other laws and company law. In company law, we have got certain amendments. Paper for taxation, we have huge number of amendments and uh, remaining all other subjects, there were no amendments. Absolutely, even in audit, there were no amendments. Only in company law and taxation, there were many amendments and you know what, in the marathon that we are going to upload, in the beginning itself, now my introduction you are watching right, immediately after my introduction, amendment video will be there. Whatever amendment is it, that amendment video will be there, especially in case you are watching the law marathon, getting it. So look, this is an introduction to the marathon video, if you continue watching, it will be a marathon of the respective subject. Suppose you are watching right now law marathon. So, after my introduction, immediately law amendments video will be there. And after watching that amendments, then watch the actual marathon. Getting it? Now, I'll guide you. Please listen to this carefully without skipping this introduction part. And by the way, you will find timestamps in the below video description. You will find timestamps like what chapter at what time we are discussing. When amendments are being discussed, all the timestamps were given clearly, including the introduction is 00, zero timestamp, nothing but. Okay. Now, you know, suppose if you look at law, so this is an amendment material which is applicable for May 23, which is prepared by our faculty team member, uh, D.V. Subramaniam, sir. So, he prepared this material. So, we have clearly given, uh, you know, what is the amendment? Amendment number one, there is an increase in limits for small company. Amendment number two, rectification of name, there is a reduction in time limit. Amendment number three, so some another amendment. Amendment number four, 
some returns related. Amendment number five. This is a newly inserted provision. Okay. Um, and in amendment number six, some registration of charges. Amendment number seven. Amendment number eight. Like this, we have created an amendments material. Now this is for law. This is for law. Now if you look at, if you look at, so this is a general introduction which I am giving. Now where you can download this material, where you can download, you know, just a minute. Now, if you open Google Play Store, so rest of a CA CMA, there is an application. In Google Play Store, there is an app called rest of a CA and CMA. You just download that application. Once you download and log in, you will find an application like this. You see bottom, you know, store, charts, profile. Now there is a home option, right? Home. Okay. Or even you can go to store. Better go to store. Follow the procedure, whatever I tell you, so that you can download the materials, amendment materials, marathon related, whatever materials we have used. Suppose you go here, there is something called here, both the group subscription model. There is something called both the group subscription model. What I ask you is, this procedure I am explaining you right now is regarding how to download the material which we use in the marathon. Now go to the content. Okay, if you come bottom, here bottom at last there is a file called May 23, Number 23 study materials and inside that there is something called group 1 study material. Inside that if you see paper 3 costing, sorry, paper 4 if you observe, paper 4a if you observe, main material if you observe, see main material we have for income tax we have two modules, paper 4a, one module 1, paper 4a, module 2. And amendments material for paper 4A, amendments material for May 23 was given for you. Just download that. Here it will not open because it is screen shared, right? So it will not open. You can download here. Same way, you can come to the company law, paper 2. And you open paper 2A company law. The first file is then a paper 2A company law. Ignore that. That accidental again will delete. Okay. Paper 2A, module 1 we have. Paper 2A, module 2 also we have. Paper 2A, amendments for May 23, whatever the file I have showed you right now. Getting it? So, you will find, you will find all the resources here, all the resources inside this. Same way, group 2 study material. Suppose you see paper 6, we have given you all the CA inter main material and smart notes. You know, this colored smart notes is what we have used throughout CA inter audit marathon. So, that's it. So, what are the few instructions which you need to follow for sure? In order to get maximum output, in order to get maximum benefit, what are the important instructions that you must follow while watching these marathons? The first and foremost thing, first and foremost thing, please, please watch the class at standard speed only. What is standard speed? You know, playback speed. In YouTube, you are watching this marathon, right? There is something called playback speed, watching at 1.2, 1.5, 1.8, 2 times speed. Please, please, please maintain 1x speed only. 90% of the students don't recognize the standard speed power. If you watch the lectures at standard speed, you know what is the impact? You will understand much more strongly. Remember, when you are listening to the class, the objective is not to listen. The objective is to understand, to analyze, to digest. Getting it? If you listen to the class at standard speed, you capture the content so in depth. If you listen to the class at higher playback speed, what happens is you just listen to the words and you just move on to the next content. But you know what? Your brain will not process it. What is important is whatever we are listening, the brain should process it. Only then we can emotionally connect. Only then we can feel it. Best example, you listen to any song at a higher playback speed. Just take any song. Just increase the playback speed and you try to listen. Your mind will not accept you are listening to the word, you are listening to the tune, but at a higher rate. What is happening is you will not connect with the song. You will listen to the song, but you will not connect. You think you will not get that feel, connection. Exactly. Very simple. I know why you are watching at higher speed. The reason why you are watching at higher speed is to save your time. But you know what? If you watch at higher speed, what exactly happens is you will not get emotional connection with the subject. You will not get that command on the subject. Your brain will not process it faster. Very simple. If at all we can finish 12 hours content in 8 hours, we would have used 8 hours technique only, right? Why? We spent 12 hours. 
I know, sir, 12 hours content, if we watch at one and a half time speed, we can finish in 8 hours, sir, we can say 4 hours time. Forget about your time, man. If at all, we our time is also precious, right? If at all, we could finish a content within 8 hours by rapidly, you know, explaining the things, why the hell we take 12 hours? As simple as such. We spent 12 hours without our knowledge. We spent 20 hours on marathon without our knowledge based on whatever we feel to explain. Understand? And some of the students may say, we are, high, we are fast learners. We are too. Even though you are a fast learner, just listen to the song at higher speed. If you are a fast learner, you will understand the tune, everything, emotion, everything. Okay? So it's not about fast learner, intelligent, brilliance, nothing. If at all something is given at a particular video, especially, see, you know why many students feel face-to-face -face classes effective? Because there you don't have the option to increase the speed. Why student feel face-to-face -face class is effective? Because he will connect to the subject very easily because he is watching the lecture at standard speed. Same apply to online also. Same apply to YouTube video also. There is no different principle for watching YouTube video. Don't apply shortcuts. Don't try to finish faster. Getting it? Give the time whatever is needed. So this is one important instruction too. Now some students know while watching this marathon whatever PDF we have used right for the subject. They'll be asking some, they'll be asking these doubts. Sir, should we take print out of this? No need. You are watching this marathon for revision purpose. Enough. If at all you are already our Sreshta student, subscription or regular student, you might have already placed order for books and that is already there with you. So, what are the things? Like first thing, I told you, we are uploading for all the eight subjects. Okay. Our Sreshta team, which is very well renowned, like everybody knows how our Sreshta team classes are. Getting it? Believe me, you are going to enjoy the classes in a completely different level. You are going to get. And by the way, one more important clarification. Now, whatever marathon lecture we uploaded right now, right? Whatever you are going to watch, right? These were recorded for November 22 exams. These we have not recorded freshly for May 23. Please understand. These were recorded for November 22. Amendments we newly recorded. And that video also we have added. Sir, for May 23, you can record freshly. No, not required. Why? institute itself has not given a new material so whatever same material was there for november 22 the same material is applicable no changes at all same way the lectures were also same which is applicable no changes at all getting it wherever there is a change we have uploaded amendments also as part of the marathon and one more important cl clarification for paper for taxation okay amendments videos were all put together gst income tax all put together comes around close to 10 to 12 hours. So what we are doing, you know, for taxation alone, amendments video will be separately given in addition to the marathon. So if you are watching our income tax and GST marathon, you are supposed to watch our amendments as well. I think it, that's it. So these are the clarifications which I want to give. So I spoke about what instructions care you have to take. And I spoke about all the eight subjects related marathon that we are going to upload. And I spoke about where you can find this, all the marathons. I know you might be watching this video, but you don't know about where you will find just open CR Amarsha I mean the channel where you are watching open playlist you will find in the playlist CA Inter May 23 divisions or something like that you will find a playlist so inside that you will find all the eight subjects gradually and I am recording this video on 7th March 2023 and I will be uploading all the eight subjects marathon in the next 15 days okay every day every alternative day we will be uploading one subject so, okay so take care have a nice time please continue watching without any failure Hello students, welcome to Sresta for CA and CMA classes. Myself, DV Subramaniam, faculty for corporate and other laws at CA inter level. This video is all about amendments in corporate laws that are applicable to May 2023 examination. So let's begin our discussion. Amendment 1, first amendment. This is from preliminary chapter. The amendment is there in uh, the definition of small company. If you look into the definition of small company, section 2, clause 85. Small company means any company satisfying three conditions. Condition 1, other than public company. Other than public company. Condition number 2, paid up share capital shall not exceed 50 lakhs or such higher amount as may be prescribed but not exceeding 10 crores. Condition number 3, turnover as per the Profit and loss account of immediately preceding financial year shall not exceed 2 crores or such higher amount as may be prescribed but not exceeding 100 crores. So this is the definition of the small company as per Companies Act 2013. 
so here when you look into the word you know prescribe what it exactly mean so for understanding this word let me tell you one small point in our india so we had three departments one is you know legislative law making body simply next one executive you know law implementing body next uh, judiciary judiciary law interpretation body law making body legislative law implementation body executive law interpretation body judiciary so legislative you know parliament and president of india covers under legislative department so time to time they will frame laws they will frame acts understood now which will be implemented by you know central government which is covered under executive department so here the legislative is delegating some power to the executive what is the power sir so right now we are fixing the limits you know for paid up share capital 50 lakhs turnover 2 crores but executive you know central government if you want you can increase the limits you can increase the limits to the extent of you know 10 crores in case of paid up share capital 100 crores in case of turnover and using these powers you know today central government it enhanced the limits originally you know these limits were enhanced paid up share capital to 2 crores turnover to 20 crores later you know one more time they enhanced the figures as per latest amendment you know this figure was enhanced to 4 crores and turnover figure increased to 40 crores so re, re, uh, considering the rules central government rules now a small company means a company other than public company and paid up share capital shall not exceed 4 crores and turnover shall not exceed 40 crores are you all getting my point no being a small company it had some advantages like you know no need to prepare cash flow statement so the company is required to follow schedule 3 company is required to prepare financial statements as per schedule 3 as per schedule 3 cash flow statement is mandatory but for small companies cash flow statement is optional it's, it's not optional it's not required next one in case of annual returns you know uh, actually company secretary should sign the annual returns of the company but coming to the small company if that company is not having company secretary director signing annual return is sufficient so like this you know some privileges are there now these privileges are extended to the companies you know having turnover some 38 crores 39 crores 40 crores paid up share capital 2 crores 3 crores 4 crores understood that means you know many more companies were covered under the concept of small company Therefore, ease of doing business will be achieved. Instead of concentrating on the rules, they can concentrate on the business. So the amendment, the amendment effect is many companies are going to cover under small company concept. Now, with respect to financial year 2023-24, I repeat financial year 2023-24, whether a company is a small company or not, how can we check, sir? Very simple. For financial year 22-23, what is the turnover? And what is the paid up share capital? Turnover, sir, it's 38 crores. Paid up share capital, sir, it's 3.9 crore. Okay, fine. Now, this is a small company. Of course, one more condition is there. It is a, a company other than public company. Understood, ma? So, that is the amendment in small company concept. So, paid up capital and turnover of the small company shall not exceed rupees 4 crores and rupees 40 crores respectively. So central government can increase the figures up to what extent in case of paid up share capital they can increase up to 10 crores in case of turnover they can increase up to 100 crores fine next one next amendment you know this is uh, from chapter number two incorporation of companies incorporation of companies section 16 section 16 is all about you know rectification of company name when a mistake happens you know with uh, intentionally or unintentionally we need to rectify the mistake yes or no we need to rectify the mistake that rectification is of two types as per section 16 one is infringement of trademark the other one is the name of the company similar to the name of existing body corporate or existing company so two cases were covered under section 16 case one infringement of trademark case two uh, name similar to the name of existing company now there is an amendment with respect to infringement of trademark as you all know infringement of trademark means unauthorized copy of copying the name of trademark unauthorized copying the uh, name of the trademark so without permission 
if i use the trademark you know if i use the word in my name it leads to infringement of trademark in that case the owner of registered trademark is having a power to file an application with central government he need to file an application within 3 years of incorporation of a, a new company now if central government is satisfied with the application of the owner of registered trademark then it will issue a direction it will issue an order to the new company come on change your name so within how many months i need to change the name sir within 6 months you need to change the name as per original provisions you know within 6 months you need to change the name as per latest amendment the time period of 6 months got reduced to 3 months so from the date of central government direction you will be given 3 months time period within 3 months you need to rectify the name what is the process sir simple call for a general meeting pass an ordinary resolution file this you know amend moa amend aoa a copy of resolution copy of amended moa amended aoa and central government direction file all these documents with roc roc will issue fresh certificate of incorporation if you make any delay if you make any delay originally there is a penalty clause there is a punishment clause now what is the punishment company fine 1000 rupees for every day of default and every officer who is in default fine 5000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees this is the punishment you now as per original act but now you know that punishment was eliminated that punishment was deleted instead of punishment you know the legislative the parliament is given is giving power to the central government what is the power given to the central government central government as per the rules as per the manner prescribed it can allot new name to such companies suppose i incorporated a company with the name reliance with the name using reliance the name having a word reliance is a registered trademark held by you know mukesh ambani ambani brothers without their permission you know i used that word in my name in my company name central government gave me direction to rectify the name but i know i'm not listening to the central government direction now central government is having a power to change my name and it is having a power to give new name to my company so accordingly it will give direction to the roc roc shall enter the new name in the register and roc shall issue a fresh certificate of incorporation that means you know without involvement of company only you know without involvement of company central government is having a power to change the name of the company and of course you know central government you know it gave me a name i don't like it i'm not interested in the name now can i change that name voluntarily yes for the voluntary change of name you need to follow the provisions of section 13 as per section 13 so alteration of name you need to follow a certain steps so first you need to call for a board meeting you need to recommend a name you need to file a form with roc to reserve the name and next step pass board resolution in calling for you know general meeting so in the general meeting you need to take approval from the members what kind of approval special resolution now alter moa alter aoa and then you know copy of special resolution all these documents you need to file it with roc and roc will issue fresh certificate of incorporation subsequent to changing the name of course this benefit is not available to the companies which had defaults with respect to payment of deposits debentures interest on it and then defaults in filing returns with roc annual returns and financial statements If these defaults are there, such companies are prohibited from voluntarily changing its name. Do you remember all these provisions? So the point is, nothing in this subsection shall prevent a company from subsequently changing its name in accordance with the provisions of Section Thirteen. Everyone understood. Everyone. So two changes, ma. Two changes in Section Sixteen. One change: reduction of time limit. Originally, six months time period is given to you. to change to rectify the name but now it is reduced to 3 months next one if you fail to rectify the name central government is having a power to rectify the name they will give you new name and they will uh, order roc to issue fresh certificate of incorporation so roc shall enter the new name in the in the place of old name and it will issue fresh certificate of incorporation so with this you know amendments in second chapter that is incorporation of companies is completed next amendment is with respect to prospectus and allotment of securities section 42 private placement so no company offering securities no how many modes are available uh, to the company to offer securities three modes 
one is to the existing members rights issue next one employees and a re employee stock option plan and next one you know others simply other than existing members and employees are simply outsiders when you are going with outsiders you had two options making offer to public at a large we call it as prospectus making offer to the public at a large you know for that prospectus is required or offering securities to the specified persons identified parties known parties which is uh, which will come under private placement concept so under private placement you know the board of directors shall prepare a list a list of members you know list of persons not exceeding 200 in a financial year per security you all remember these points you know while counting 200 employees and qualified institutional buyers are to be excluded right so the point is whenever you are preparing a list you now the list should contain the details of the persons to whom you are making an offer and in those persons if any person you know any person belonging to the country which is sharing a border with india land border with india listen carefully see my company want to uh, offer securities to a person a resident of china a resident of pakistan a resident of nepal simply you know the countries which are sharing land border with india in that case you can make offer but for that prayer approval from central government is required without prayer approval from central government you can't offer securities to the citizens of a neighboring countries sir i want to offer securities to a resident of usa sir i want to offer securities to a body corporate you know uh, body corporate incorporated in south korea now these two countries are not sharing any land border with india so you can proceed you know you can offer securities to those persons for that you know this rule is not applicable this rule is applicable only when you are making offer to the persons you know body corporates uh, which were incorporated in a country and that country is sharing a land border with india only understood so prayer approval from central government is required now see the point so this this provision came into the picture only uh, to protect public interest so national interest that's it we should not you know we should not divert our funds to the china we should not divert funds to the pakistan so that you know they can't they should not invest money in the defense becoming uh, strong when compared to india this aspect should not happen that's the only agenda the only agenda is national interest so you all know trading with allied enemy is void why what happens in that situation so there you can observe you know flow of resources from one country to another country that another country will become you know strong compared to the first country this shouldn't happen that's the only agenda so no offer or invitation of any securities under rule 14 shall be made to a body corporate incorporated in or a national you know citizen of a country which shares a land border with india unless you know negative statement finally ending with unless word unless such body corporate or national as the case may be have obtained government approval under the fema not debt instrument rules 2019 and attach it the same with private placement of a come application letter so when you want to offer to the persons you know resident of the uh, country which is sharing land border with india in that case you know you need to attach a letter to the private placement offer come application letter that letter is nothing but you know central government approval you need to take government approval under fema non debt instrument rules 2019 or else that offer is treated as void the private placement is no more a valid document are you all getting my point students this rule is applicable only to the persons resident of a country which is sharing land border with india clear once again i'm repeating the person you know usa residents sir, usa citizens sir, or uk citizens sir you now these countries are not sharing any land border with india now for them this rule is not applicable so with this prospectus and allotment of securities completed next amendment is with respect to deposits you now share capital and uh, debentures there is no amendment ma in deposits we had one amendment that is you know filing of return of deposits with the registrar now every company to whom uh, chapter number 5 deposits chapter applicable 
know that company is required to file a return of deposits in form number DPT3 every year. The due date for filing this DPT3 is 30th June, 30th June of the year. Suppose if you take financial year 2022-23. 2022-23 so as on 31st march 2023 as on 31st march 2023 the status of loans and advances you need to bifurcate you know you need to bifurcate all these amounts into two parts so amounts which are considered as deposits amounts which are not considered as deposits not considered as deposits you need to give this bifurcation and next one opening balance additions and then uh, additions nothing but you know new loans and advances N next uh, repayments finally closing balance so you need to give this statement in form number dpt3 every year the company is required to file this form uh, by 30th june of that year so with respect to financial year 2022 23 on or before 30th june 2023 the company is required to file form with roc so just now we discussed the contents of the form you know opening balance uh new loans and advances next uh, repayments done during the year and what is the closing balance out of these amounts uh, the amounts which are considered as a uh deposits the amounts which are not considered as deposits like that you know you need to give bifurcation is it clear ma this is a regular process my every company should comply this concept you know whether it is a small company or private company or public company all companies should comply the provision the amendment in this rule is the amendment in this rule is you need to attach a declaration the declaration should be given by the statutory auditor of the company simply you know auditor of the company external auditor or principal auditor you know a declaration should be taken from them and this should be filed along with the dpt3 you now in dpt3 the return of deposits which you are filing with roc it is an audited one more first point you know auditor has to give a certificate with respect to these amounts you know opening balance additions and then repayments done during the year and what is the closing balance so these figures should be audited first point who will audit you know who will conduct the audit the statutory auditor of the company will conduct the audit so auditor has to give certificate with respect to the point in addition to it auditor should give a declaration a declaration means what sir you know he's simply auditor will auditor is required to add a word the word uh, auditor is required to add a statement the statement is i hereby declare that the amount mentioned in the particulars of deposits and particulars of liquid assets are correct and as per the you know it is as per the relevant provisions of companies act 2013 simple declaration what is the declaration i hereby declare that the amount mentioned in the particulars of deposit column particulars of the liquid assets column are correct and they are according to the provisions of companies act 2013 only like that he need to give a declaration that declaration should be filed along with uh, form dpt3 simply you no know, responsibility of the auditor got enhanced tomorrow if there is any mistake in that statement auditor is going to get punishment under section 447 if he commit a fraud understood simply you know enhance the degree of confidence on the form dpt3 along with auditor certificate you need to take declaration from the auditor understood everyone so with this deposits amendments also we completed deposits amendments also we completed next one amendments in charges charges two amendments are there in charges chapter the main objective of charges is uh, you know whenever a company uh, create charge on a property in favor of you know a lender money lender so it is required to register the charge with roc yes or no so whenever a company creates charge on any asset in favor of the lender you know for borrowing the money or for any other purpose you know if you are providing any asset as a security if you are creating any charge on the asset the charge should be registered with roc but there is a one exception what is the exception sir if you are a banking company listen carefully conditions to be satisfied if you are a banking company first point and if you are taking a loan from reserve bank of india yeah central bank reserve bank is nothing but central bank bankers bank 
so all these companies you know sbi icici hdfc if they want money they will borrow money from rbi so whatever borrowings you know these banking companies are making now whatever amounts they are getting from reserve bank of india for those loans for those advances any charge created on the banking company asset any charge created on the banking company asset those charges should not be registered there is no obligation on the company to register those charges with roc let me repeat the point one more time a banking company getting loans or advances from the reserve bank of india and for which it is creating charges in favor of reserve bank of india those charges are not required to be registered under this chapter chapter 6 registration of charges i'll ask you one question the axis bank it approached dv subramanyam yeah it's me and they asked me 100 crores loan i said okay i'll grant you 100 crores loan but i need a uh, uh, security they provided some 10 immovable properties you know 10 land and buildings as a security in favor of me and they got 100 crores loan from me now my question is this a charge yes is there any obligation on the company to register such charge yes yes why here banking company got loans advances not from reserve bank of india but from a person other than rbi are you all getting my point students so exempted from registration of charge only in one case that is banking company getting loans from rbi and any charge created in favor of rbi no need to register that charge with roc provided provided the loans or advances has been made to it under clause sub clause d of clause 4 section 17 of the reserve bank of india act 1934 so new point ma new point next one verification of registration of charge now when you want to communicate something with roc you need to file a form with roc yes or no so yes for registration of charges we need to file chg1 chg9 depending upon the loan no debentures one form chg what other than debentures you know one form chg9 so yes chg1 chg9 is for registration of the charges so every form you file it with roc yes they should be signed the form should be signed by the a person representing the company popularly a director of the company you no know, cs of the company manager ceo cfo these people will sign the forms verification is nothing but you know looking at the form cover you know reading all the contents if everything is okay then you need to sign the form now the point is whenever a company goes into the a resolution or liquidation both are different words my dear students resolution is different liquidation is different liquidation is like a, a end end to the company the company is going to get killed the company is going to die a resolution means you know the company is almost you know it is in a death position only but some kind of revival you know some external assistance we are giving to the company externally and internally we are giving assistance to the company so that it can be revived understood see ma whether company is in survival or not you know you need to check going concern if a company is uh, able to do business for the next one year yes the company is said to be in going concern if company going concern condition is satisfied then you know you all know financial statements are prepared according to the historical cost everything is fine but whenever you know company is unable to uh, repay its debts which will which will get matured in the next year in the upcoming year or company assets are not in a position to repay the debts to, to meet the obligations of the company then two options are available to the company one is liquidation closure of company the another one is uh, you know a resolution it's like a reconstruction a revival understood now during this resolution or liquidation phase the powers of the directors are transmitted to an independent person none other than irp insolvency resolution professional or you know resolution professional or liquidator now the powers of directors will be transmitted by operation of law to these people so during the process of resolution suppose you know a company wants to uh, survive in the tough position and company file an application with a uh, government sir this is our position we need survival we need some assistance 
government appointed dv subramaniam as irp insolvency resolution professional now yes so what is my main uh, objective in doing that resolution is simply whatever assets are available you know again once again mortgaging the assets once again you know hypothecating the assets whatever additional money i'm getting so with that with this additional money i'll repay the short term borrowings or i'll i'll uh, use those funds for continuation of the business so simply in a tough situation this irp or resolution pro professional will try to revive the company for longer period they will try to keep the company in a solvency position so they will deal with all the creditors they will deal with all the bankers and they will uh, enter into an agreement you know so bankers or creditors will relinquish some amounts will waive some of the debts it's almost like you know internal reconstruction you all know that point you know in accounts you know, you have solved the problems with respect to internal reconstruction so now during this process you know suppose you know 6 months time period was given actually as per law also 180 days time period was given for revival so corporate insolvency resolution process 180 days time period is given to revive the company during this 180 days if a company borrow any loan amount company borrow any loans by mortgaging any of its property now it is nothing but charge the charge should be registered with roc actually charge document should be signed by charge document should be signed by the company directors or company secretary or you know manager ceo cfo but when a company is under resolution or liquidation process those forms shall be signed by irp or rp or liquidator simply signing power was given to the irp you no know, professionals so form number chg 148 and 9 shall be signed by irp or resolution professional or liquidator for companies under resolution or liquidation as the case may be and filed with roc understood everyone so with this amendments with respect to charges also we completed next amendment is with respect to management and administration chapter in management and administration chapter as per section 94 any member or an outsider can come and inspect register of members of the company and even if they want to take copies of it yes they can extract they can get copies of the persons you know they can get copies of the registers also so just uh, read the point notwithstanding anything contained in sub rule 1 and 2 the following particulars of the register or index or return in respect of the members of a company shall not be made available for any inspection what are those matters address of the individual registered address of a body corporate email id unique identification number like other pan number so the details of the members the personal details of the members are not available for inspection or not available for getting extracts or copies simply to protect their privacy to protect their privacy see man i am a member of the reliance industry limited so yes my contact details are shared with reliance industry limited my phone number my email id my address everything you know reliance industry is having it now any person want to know my address you know i want to maintain it secretly but they came to know that i am a member of reliance industry limited so now easily they are going to reliance industry company they are telling that sir we want to inspect members register sir and you know opening register of members there they are finding my details so obviously my privacy will be disturbed my privacy will be uh, affected now you know what happen what happens sir you all know one point you know whenever you attend for an examination in ca you know ca inter exams many institute uh, uh, you know uh, agents you know institute employees you will find uh, all the places near to the centers so they will take your mobile numbers they will take your email id the next day onwards you know they will send you promotional messages yes or no so yes launched so and so batch launched so and so batch batch details come and join and sometimes they may call you directly come and join come and join and many of you got irritated yes or no so similarly you know i'm the major investor to the reliance industry limited if my details are known then many people will try to contact me so which will affect my personal life 
that's the only reason you know lawmaker came up with this amendment the amendment is personal details of the members are not disclosed you just share the details of the members like you know name of the person holding how many shares when he became a member and how many shares he transferred during his membership and date of cessation of membership you know provide the details not you know personal details so this is the the newly inserted point ma so with this you know management and administration amendments we completed the next amendment is iepf you know dividends declaration and payment of dividends chapter the eighth chapter declaration and payment of dividends chapter so what is the amendment in this chapter sir in section 125 you know that certain amount should be transferred to iepf account like unpaid dividend you know which is not claimed for a period of 7 years you need to transfer to iepf account next one shares related to this dividend shall be transferred to iepf account so simply you know credits to the iepf account so these amount should be credited to iepf like that you know we studied a list to that list one more point was added what is that one more point sir all the shares held by the authority in accordance with provision of subsection 9 of section 90 what is this section 90 significant beneficial ownership what is this beneficial ownership concept sir actually ma the legal owner the person holding the shares it is deemed that the benefits accruing on that shares you know will be entitled by that person by that person only that person that person only just listen dvs i am holding 10% share capital in reliance industry limited now who is the legal owner dvs only and who is entitled to claim all the benefits because of holding those shares now because of holding those shares every year you know company is paying dividends every year i am entitled to attend general meetings every year i am entitled to vote at the general meetings so all these benefits you know i am enjoying so legal as well as beneficial owner with respect to this share capital is dvs yes or no but sometimes you know sometimes a person will hold shares for name sake and all the benefits with respect to those shares will be given to this some other person some other person simply you no know, binami transactions binami see holding shares in my name example it leads to income tax problems i'm having 100 crores money i want to invest that money in the share capital of the company the problem is tomorrow income tax department definitely will come to me and they will ask me how you got these funds so that's the reason what i did i appointed some you know 50 binamis all these binamis you now i'm transferring funds to them small small amounts these small small amounts you know they are investing a money in a company and you know the decisions will be taken by me and i'll tell i'll communicate the decisions to those people and those people will act according to my decisions and whatever the dividend or interest you know accrued on those investments those people will uh, give that funds to me only so now here the legal owner is binami beneficial owner is you know person behind the binami binami owner are you getting my point now significant beneficial ownership concept you know i am holding 10% of capital of reliance industry limited but shares are not in my name shares are in the name of my binomi say for suppose mr uh, prashant mr prashant as per section 90 both of us you know prashant and dvs should file a declaration with company and company will file those returns with roc of course if prashant and dvs makes default in filing these forms with company then you know company can file an application with uh, tribunal it can file an application with authority what authority can do it will suspend the rights over that share capital as a legal owner or a beneficial owner no one can have a right over such capital but once you file this forms again you know it will suspend those uh, orders and it will give us powers it will it will give back powers the point is until and unless you know you communicate with the authority the authority is having power to transfer all these shares to iepf account without any restrictions without any restrictions now you know prashant is holding shares on behalf of me so both of us should file a forms with company 
in case of default you know company company will take back all those shares and company will give those shares to authority and authority will transfer all the shares and any benefit resulting from those shares to the iepf without any restrictions after that if you comply with the rules and regulations you know you will get back those shares but the point is the new point is shares held by significant beneficial owner non compliance of section 90 it, it gives power to the authority authority can transfer those shares and can transfer all those benefits arising out of such shares to the iepf account everyone understood fine so with this you know amendment in dividends chapter also we completed the next amendment is in accounts of companies chapter you know the last chapter in audit and auditors there is no amendments ma no amendments were given so last chapter with respect to amendments that is accounts of companies can i start yes sir fine see uh here you know we had three amendments one is with respect to csr corporate social responsibility and the uh, next one is also with respect to csr only amendment number uh, two and finally you know amendment with respect to maintenance of books of accounts in electronic form and again amendment in csr only corporate social responsibility so major amendments are there in corporate social responsibility so before going with corporate social responsibility i'll cover a small amendment that is you know maintenance of books of accounts in electronic mode so it's the option no company can maintain books of accounts in electronic mode books of accounts in electronic mode but a company which is maintaining books of accounts in electronic mode it should comply some provisions some conditions what are those conditions and what are the amendments in those conditions let us discuss the books of accounts and other relevant books and papers maintained in electronic mode shall remain accessible in india at all times this word is introduced as per recent amendments this word is not there in previous publication you know at all times anytime 24 hours 7 days in a week at all times those information should be made available and to be usable for subsequent reference so that that, that, that means there should be no restriction like you know the information will be available only from morning 7 to uh, noon uh, 12 o'clock noon 12 noon so there should be no such restrictions it should be available at all times for subsequent reference provided that the financial year commencing on or after first day of april 2023 originally first april 2022 ma but they gave a relaxation so two it's not 2022 it's 2023 from 23 onwards now coming financial year 2023-24 onwards every company which uses accounting software company using so accounting software for maintaining its books of accounts shall use only such software which has a feature of recording audit trail of each and every transaction audit trail simply you know how the transaction is getting recorded who is recording the transaction no, simply you know employee details and you know any modification to the transaction it should be recorded deletion of the transaction it should be recorded so simply audit trail so that accounting software should have a feature what is the feature audit trail audit trail no it it enables auditor to go through the modifications done to the books of accounts alterations to the books of accounts understood it's very simple ma no you are sitting in a room and you are studying your parents are not having trust on you they kept cc camera in your room now they will record all the acts done by you whether you are reading or whether you are uh, watching movies or whether you are uh, playing games everything you know your parents will come to know whatever accounting software you know a company is using in that software audit trail feature should be enabled so creating an edit log of each change made in books of accounts along with the date when such changes were made ensuring that audit trail cannot be disabled so yes this condition originally it came uh, into the force with effect from 1st april 2022 but now 2022 word was replaced with 2023 and one more amendment that is you know backup the backup of books of accounts and other books and papers of the company maintained in electronic mode including at a place outside india if any shall be kept in servers physically located in india on periodical basis is the original provision on periodical basis now that word periodical is deleted and you know daily was inserted daily basis it's not you know weekly or monthly it's a daily so daily you need to take backup 
because you know electronic devices are not that much trustworthy you know if virus attacks the data will be corrupted so company information company financial information is not not you know it's a very much sensitive information investors you know government employees stakeholders many people you know they had interest they had a interest in the company today as yes i know government is getting taxes shareholders are getting dividends next employees are getting salaries creditors are getting their money that us you know they are getting a, a supplies from the company point you know each and every information is sensitive so on daily basis you need to take a backup what kind of backup sir you know in your eis it will come incremental backup you know full backup differential backup you all know this concept right so yes by backup technique may be different but every day you need to take a backup and the company shall intimate to the registrar on an annual basis at the time of filing financial statements if you know this point was newly inserted ma this point is newly inserted what is the point sir where the service provider is located outside india sir we are maintaining books of accounts in electronic mode but the storage services you know cloud services were provided by a person but he is a, not a resident in india he is a located he is a person outside india in that case name and address of the person who is having control of over the books of accounts and other books and papers in india are you getting my points students so simply you know uh, today we are using facebook gmail so all these clouds you know all these companies originally they were not incorporated in india they were located outside india using cloud technology using server cloud server technology we are having these services gmail you know every person is having 15 gb uh, storage capacity in the gmail yes or no correct me if i am wrong so yes this cloud storage services if they are located in india you need to provide the details of that person if they are located outside india then you need to provide the name and address of the person who is having control and uh, you know in uh, control who is the control uh, in charge simply you know address of the person in charge of the maintaining books of accounts and other books of papers in india so additional a disclosure requirement only disclosure point next one we are left with csr ma csr points so let's discuss corporate social responsibility points one is you know the minister of corporate affairs has made clarifications with respect to csr you all know in 2020 a pandemic covid pandemic came into the picture almost a half year no economic activities many of uh, middle class families you know poor class families got affected liquidity crunch we faced and many people you know who got attacked with a virus so some of them have died and some of them you know for them it is very difficult to get a treatment also many of the people of uh, uh, faced difficult positions in getting the treatment so central government came up with a topic with a with a concept csr corporate social responsibility this is already a topic which is prevailing in india so this concept is not new so company having you know paid up share capital or turnover net worth net worth 500 crores turnover 1000 crores net profit 5 crores any of the limits you know any of the limits if company uh, satisfy then that company is required to spend 2% of last 3 years average profits on the society so what kind of activities you know they can take up what kind of activities they can take up in promoting you know uh, society all those activities were specified in a schedule schedule 7 to that schedule 7 some items were added with respect to covid and with respect to that uh, item certain clarifications were given you know the circular number 9 2021 dated 5th may 2021 as per this circular what is the clarification we got just see in continuation to mca circular number 10 by 2020 dated 23 march 2020 wherein it was clarified that spending of csr funds for covid 19 is an eligible csr activity so spending a funds you know 2% of average 3 years 3 years average profits average 3 years average profits so this is you know funds belonging to the society you need to spend funds only for society now you can spend these funds with respect to covid 19 also so spending with respect to covid 19 means what activities that clarification was provided in 2021 you know may 5th 
See, it was further clarified that spending of CSR funds for creating health infrastructure like you know hospitals, arrangement of doctors, establishment of medical oxygen generation and storage plants. Yeah, many people died due to lack of oxygen. Yes or no? So oxygen generation, oxygen, you know, uh, manufacturing of these gases was very crucial at that point of time. No need to explain this point as you all know. Manufacturing and supply of oxygen concentrators, ventilators, cylinders and other medical equipment for countering COVID-19 or such similar such activities. Eligible CSR activities under item number 1 and 9, uh, 12 of Schedule 7 of the Companies Act 2013 relating to promotion of healthcare including preventive healthcare and disaster management respectively. So the items uh, under healthcare, preventive healthcare and then disaster management, you know some items were there under this list. So this list, these points were added. It's just a clarification. Ma. They simply gave a point that, you know, with respect to COVID-19, you can spend CSR funds. So with respect to COVID-19 means what, you know, what uh, COVID-19, okay, fine. So COVID-19, uh, uh, for the purpose of COVID-19 spending funds means on what? Suppose, you know, I'm using these funds for construction of hospital. I'm using these funds for uh, purchase of beds, purchase of oxygen cylinders, oxygen ventilators, you know, oxygen concentrators, ventilators, cylinders. Now, is this an eligible CSR activity or not? So many questions came up. So to provide solution to those questions, uh, MCA came up with a clarification. And reference is also drawn to item number 9 of Schedule 7 of Companies Act 2013 which permits contribution to specified research and development projects as well as contribution to public funded universities and certain organizations engaged in conducting research in science, technology, engineering and medicine as well as, as eligible CSR activities. You all know, you know developing me medicine, vaccine for curing, you know, uh, curing or preventing COVID. A lot of expenditure we need to spend on research. Now, any expenditure you spend on research, it is also eligible CSR activity. That means that amount you spend on that, it can be reduced from CSR funds. And the companies including government companies may undertake the activities or projects, programs using CSR funds directly by themselves or in collaboration as shared responsibility with other companies subjected to fulfillment of company CSR rules 2014 and guidelines issued by ministry from time to time. So government companies can also undertake the activities either independently or you know in collaboration with other companies next one more clarification the mca you know circular number 10 2020 dated 23rd march 2020 clarified that spending csr funds for covid 19 is an eligible csr activity in continuation to the said circular it is further clarified that spending csr funds for vaccination you have seen that you know uh, Whenever you call your friend, you might have heard this. Uh, almost 225 crore vaccines were distributed so far. 225 crore vaccines were distributed. So some of the vaccines, you know, some of the people purchased these vaccines. You know, they paid 1000 rupees, uh, 750 rupees based on the, you know, uh, vaccine. And many, in many centers, these vaccines were distributed at free of cost. Free of cost. Free of cost means what? No, the people getting vaccinated, they are not required to pay money. But from where we get these vaccines? For manufacturing of vaccines, yes, we need to spend money, yes or no? Manufacturing is not free of cost. For manufacturing, if you contribute some amount, that is also an eligible CSR contribution. That is a clarification given. So for COVID-19 vaccination for persons other than employees and their families. Suppose, you know, I went to one rural area. I went to a rural area and I entered into a contract with the uh, medical hospital. So you bring all the vaccines, you pay the money, I'll reimburse you and distribute these vaccines free of cost in this particular rural area. In that rural area, if any of the people belongs to the employees of the company, if any of the people are, you know, belonging to the employee families, then, you know, that, uh, that uh, expenditure is not eligible. That expenditure is not treated as CSR expenditure. So free vaccination, right? Any amount you spend on free vaccination, you no, know, it is eligible CSR expenditure. It is an eligible CSR expenditure. That is the clarification given. So if I spend that vaccination on my employees, on their employee families or employee families, 
Now is it an eligible expenditure? Eligible CSR expenditure? No ma. Next one. Yes. Now 75th independence. Recently you know, in 2022 we celebrated 75th independence. Uh, Amrit ka, uh, sorry, Ajadi ka Amrit Mahotsav. Do you remember this name? So there, uh, you know, with respect to this campaign, with respect to this program, whatever money you spend, you know, company, whatever money you spend, whatever amount you spend, it is also an eligible CSR expenditure. The Hargar Tiranga, a campaign, a campaign under the edges of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav is aimed to invoke the feeling of patri patriotism in the hearts of the people and to promote awareness about the Indian national flag. flag. In this regard, it is clarified that spending of CSR funds for the activities related to this campaign, you know, promotion expenses, you know, flags, manufacturing, and then, you know, food distribution, anything such as a mass scale production and supply of national flag, outreach and amplification of efforts and other related activities are eligible CSR activities under item number two of schedule seven of companies act 2013 pertaining to promotion of education relating to the culture. So culture, it's nothing but, you know, set of traditions we follow. So every person should have a patri uh, patriotism feeling towards the Indian nation. For that, you need to educate them. See, ma'am, the freedom struggle, actually, the freedom fighters know about the struggle. We people, you know, we in 21st century, we may, we may not aware about of those freedom fighting struggles. But because of, you know, reading the books, reading the novels related to uh, Gandhiji, Nehruji, you'll come to know so what happened in 1947, you know, how they fought for getting independence to the India. So everything we come to know. But you know, uh, recent generations, they will come to know only when someone teach them, when someone educate them. Then only, you know, we can promote our old culture, you know, ancient culture. So for doing this, whatever amount you spend, it is also an eligible CSR expenditure. Understood? And next one, with respect to CSR only, you know, for filing forms with ROC. Ma. Company filing forms with ROC. Actually, every year, company is required to file financial statements with ROC in form number AOC4. Form number is AOC4. Understood everyone? The form number is AOC4. But a company to which corporate social responsibility section 135 is applicable along with AOC4, they need to file CSR2 form with ROC. AOC4 plus CSR2. CSR2 should be added. Companies to which CSR is applicable, those companies are required to file CSR2 with ROC. And what is the time limit for filing CSR2? Those time limits were also prescribed. Let's see the paragraph. Let's see the points. Every company covered under provisions of subsection 1 of section 135 shall furnish a report on corporate social responsibility in form CSR2 to the registrar for preceding financial year and onwards as an addendum to form AOC4 or AOC4 XBRL or AOC4 NBFC as the case may be. Generally AOC4 ma. But to some companies AOC4 XBRL is applicable. And to NBFC, AOC4, NBFC is applicable. So simply as the case may be. For the time being, I will use form number AOC4. If that company is covered under section 135, along with AOC4, they need to file form CSR2. Now, for financial year 2021, you know, this form was notified, uh, you know, very late. After due date, this form was notified. That's the reason, you know, the time limit for filing CSR2 with respect to financial year 2021 was given uh, was specified as 31st March 2022. Later, three months extension was also given. That is 30th June 2022. So with respect to financial year 2020-21, you might have filed AOC4 previously. AOC4 was already filed. Now file CSR2. What is the time limit for filing CSR2? It's 30th June 2022. Now coming to the uh, financial years 21-22 onwards. Small correction. Financial year provided that for the uh, preceding financial year 2021-2022, form CSR2 shall be filed uh, separately on or before 31st March 2023. 
that is after filing form AOC4 or AOC4 or XBRL or AOC4 NBFC as the case may be. Understood ma? So due dates, there is a change in due dates. That's it. Understood? And the last amendment, CSR applicability. The last amendment. Actually ma, CSR applicability, you know that net worth, turnover, net profit, any of the limits, you know, any of the limits exceeds the particular, you know, any of the points, you know, net worth or turnover, net profit, if they exceed the limits or if they match with the limits, then CSR is applicable. So net worth uh, 500 crores, turnover 1000 crores, net profit uh, 5 crores. So once CSR is applicable, you need to constitute CSR committee. And you need to spend 2% of last 3 years average profits on this society. Okay. And we had a point, you know, see, every company which ceases to be a company covered under subsection 1 of section 135 for 3 consecutive financial years shall not be required to constitute a CSR committee, shall not be required to comply with the provisions contained in subsection 2 to 6 of the said section. Till such time it meets the criteria specified in subsection 1 of section 135. Now this is omitted. That means you know what is the effect of the amendment. Previously ma. For financial year 2022-23. Is CSR applicable or not? For that you need to check last 3 years financial year figures. So 21-22. 2021. And 1920 last three years if your net worth is less than 500 cr if your turnover is less than 1000 cr if your net profit is less than 5 cr then only for 22-23 csr is not applicable suppose sir 1920 my net profit is 6 crores sir my net profit is 6 crores Achha, fine for 22-23 csr section 135 is applicable section 135 is applicable are you all getting my point everyone right now this is omitted that means every year to check csr applicability you need to check preceding financial year figures so with respect to financial year 2023-24 you know upcoming financial year financial year 23-24 you need to check 2022-23 financial statements in 2022-23, if your net profit is less than 5 crores and if your turnover is less than 1000 crores and your net worth is less than 500 crores, then for 23-24, section 135 is not applicable to you. Previously, you need to check last 3 years. Now, no need to check last 3 years. You know, checking previous year is sufficient. Relaxation. Relaxation. That's it. Actually, you know, once CSR is applicable, next to 3-4 years, you need to comply section 135. Right now, one year I crossed these limits sir next year CSR is applicable so next year my uh, turnover net profit net worth is less than the limits only sir less than the limits prescribed then upcoming year no need to satisfy section 135 clear and then next amendment the board shall ensure that CSR activities are undertaken by actually you know CSR activities uh, yes a company directly it can spend CSR funds on CSR activities or sometimes it can enter into a contract with the following entities. It can transfer funds to the following entities. You know, following entities will spend money on behalf of the company. And there is, you know, new points added in the following entities. Actually, you know, this is the main provision. Ma. Company established under Section 8 of the Act, a registered public trust, a registered society. So these are the points, you know, you can enter into contract with these uh, societies, you can enter into contract with this public trust, you can transfer funds to the trust, you can transfer funds to the society. Now that society will spend money on behalf of you. But recently added point that is, you know, a society which is exempted under section uh, 10 clause 23c, you know, 4, 5, 6, 6a are registered under 12a and approved under section 80g of the income tax act established by the company either singly or along with any other company. Simply, you know, any society which is got exempted, you know, privileges under section 10, subsection 23C or 4, 5, 6, 6A. So those are also eligible. 
those entities are also eligible now you can deal with them you can enter into contract with them you can transfer funds to them now those entities spending money on behalf of you that means you are spending that csr funds and the for, for the purpose of this clause c you know entity you know there is a explanation part this is also newly inserted ma entity shall mean a statutory body constituted under the act of parliament or state legislature to undertake activities covered in schedule 7 of the act generally entity means we call we, we call it as something you know some separate person separate legal entity right a body corporate but here entity refers to a statutory body which came into the picture because of you know parliament act or state legislature act understood next one next point impact assessment impact assessment so what is this impact assessment you know with respect to csr only this is the uh, additional point ma companies you know which is spending 10 crores or more on csr activities are eligible to carry some social impact assessment impact assessment you know simply you know evaluating evaluating the funds it's it's not an audit but it is like an audit See, our company is having a, a net profit 200 crores or 500 crores suppose net profit 500 crores 500 crores into 2 percent you know 10 crores or you know my net profit is 10 crores my net profit is 10 crores I'll listen carefully so my net profit is 500 crores 500 crores into 2 percent means how much ma? 10 crores so this year I need to spend 10 crores on CSR activities so I had uh, two to three proposals or some three proposals I'm having, you know, education in rural areas. Next, uh, uh, eradication of poverty. And next one, uh, uh, infrastructure facilities in rural areas. So three main projects, three big projects. So every year I, I need to spend some, you know, three crores on each and every project. This is my proposal. So simply, you know, framing a proposal is not sufficient. You need to verify whether the proposal is getting fulfilled or not. Whether the proposal is getting fulfilled or not, you need to verify. So simply, you know, uh, framing a budget is not a, a sufficient. Uh, this year, 10 crores with respect to our rural areas education, education in rural areas, not sufficient. Whether the proposal, you know, it is meeting the criteria or not. So whether the funds is reaching to the uh, rural areas or not, whether the intentional plan, you know, whatever the plan you frame, whether it is getting fulfilled or not, for checking it, you can carry impact assessment. You know, simply evaluating the social and economic impact of your CSR proposal, whether the beneficiaries are getting adequate benefits or not. So for doing assessment, you know, for carrying those activities, we call it as impact assessment. So company undertaking impact assessment may book the expenditure towards CSR expenditures for that financial year, but there is a limit on that uh, uh, expenditure. There is a limit. You can't spend, uh, you know, more and more funds on impact assessment. Impact assessment means what? It's like a verification. It's simply like an audit. I told you it's not an audit, but like an audit verification. So my strategy or my plan so some 10 crore people should get benefits because of this CSR activity whether 10 crore people are getting benefit or not for evaluation you need to carry assessment we call it as impact assessment for carrying those impact assessments you know you need to recruit agencies and you need to pay fees to those agencies so the fees paid to the agencies should not exceed the following limits what is the limits Originally, it is 5% of total CSR expenditure, but right now it's 2% of CSR expenditure or 50 lakhs, whichever is higher, whichever is higher. So previously, ma, suppose, you know, CSR expenditure is 10 crores. Ma. Listen carefully before amendment, CSR expenditure 10 crores. So option A, 10 crores into 5%, that means 50 lakhs or 50 lakhs which are is less obviously 50 lakhs i'll take another figure you know say for suppose 20 crores for understanding purpose you know 20 crores 
20 crores into 5 percent you know 1 crore or statutory limit 50 lakhs whichever is less you know 50 lakhs you can spend 50 lakhs on impact assessment not more than that even if you spend more than 50 lakhs it is not eligible csr expenditure again you need to uh, spend additional funds but after amendment what is the impact sir after amendment what is the impact now you know 20 crores first one it's not 5 percent 2 percent 2 percent on 20 crores how much a 1 percent means 20 lakhs 2 percent means 40 lakhs or b point 50 lakhs whichever is higher it's not whichever is lower it's whichever is higher now you can spend 50 lakhs for carrying impact assessment similarly you know if csr expenditure is 100 crores imagine 100 crores as per uh, you know before amendment before amendment limit a is 100 cr csr expenditures into 5 percent that means 5 crores or 50 lakhs whichever is less that means 50 lakhs but right now after amendment 100 crores into 2 percent that means 2 crores or 50 lakhs whichever is higher 2 crores you can spend 2 crores on carrying impact assessment understood so these are the amendments with respect to accounts of companies so this video is all about amendments i covered all the amendments exhaustively is it clear ma okay fine have a nice day hello students let's begin the marathon of corporate laws as you all know total company act 2013 is divided into 29 chapters 470 sections but at CA inter level you had only 10 chapters and from sections point of view section 1 to 148 are applicable to you so the first topic of our companies act is preliminary in this chapter you will find only two sections section 1 to section 2 so only two sections are there and from exam point of view you can expect some 5 to 6 marks from this chapter so very small chapter and important from exam point of view so companies Act 2013 it received consent from the honorable president of india on 29th august 2013 and it was notified in the official gadget on 30th august 2013 so it had total 470 sections and seven schedules and you are very familiar with schedule three you know financial statements of companies right so the first one is write a short note on definition of a company and applicability of companies act this is what section number one so section one for the time being take any act any act for the time being you'll find you know section one is all about scope extent and applicability of the act you'll find only three points in section one what is the scope of the act extent of the companies act and applicability of the companies act so here you know in section one this companies act 2013 is applicable only to the companies so then what is a company sir a company means you know company means a company which is incorporated under companies act 2013 or any previous law so what a, what is a company ma company means a company which is incorporated under Companies Act 2013 or any other previous law. So incorporation is must. So company is nothing but you know association of person, but every association is not treated as company. Listen carefully. Every company is an association, but every association is not a company. The association which is getting incorporated under Companies Act, then only you can call such association as a company. And if you see, the Companies Act 2013 is not our first Companies Act. Our first Companies Act is Companies Act 1866. Later, it was repelled and we got one more Act, Companies Act 1882. And in the year 1913, we had third Companies Act. And after independence, in the year 1956, we had one more Act, you know, Companies Act 1956. And recently in 2013, we had one more Act, you know, repelling all previous company laws and we introduced one more Act, uh, we, uh, companies act 2013 now the point is we are changing act but we are not changing companies if you take itc it was incorporated in the year 1910 under 19 1882 act if you take asian paints it was incorporated in the year 1945 under companies act 1913 if you take infosys it was incorporated in the year 1981 under the companies act 1956 
now you know these three old companies they are in a dilemma whether we need to follow new act or is old act applicable old act already deleted already repealed now which act they should follow they should follow new act who told sir the definition is telling the definition is telling company means company incorporated under companies act 2013 or any other previous law any other previous law means you know previous four company laws companies act 1866 companies act 1882 companies act 1913 companies act 1956 so if you are incorporated under any of these four previous company law you are still treated as a company and you need to follow our act you know companies act 2013 understood so th this is what you know definition definition so firstly the scope is very simple the scope is companies act 2013 is applicable to all the companies sir act shall extend to the whole of india this companies act is applicable to whole of india that means whether the company is incorporated in jammu and kashmir or you know kerala or you know maharashtra madhya pradesh it is irrelevant where it was incorporated in india sir then you know companies act 2013 is applicable next one the provisions of this act shall apply to the following companies first one is as we already discussed if you are a company incorporated under companies act 2013 or previous company law then you need to follow companies act 2013 second second third one and fourth one if you see this three points you know b c d points you will find some companies you know insurance companies banking companies and generation or supply of electricity companies banking companies insurance companies and electricity companies so here banking companies if you take sbi access bank they are already companies and they need to follow the respect to act you know banking regulation act 1949 best example preparation of financial statements actually our indian companies will follow schedule 3 per presentation of financial statements but coming to the banking companies they had a different uh, financial uh, statements concept you know different schedules were prescribed now whenever there is a conflict between the respect to acts and companies act 2013 which one they should follow sir respect to acts or applicable respect to acts or applicable if there is no inconsistency or if banking regulation act is silent with respect to some topics then our companies act 2013 is uh, applicable so to all these three special companies you know banking insurance and uh, generation or supply of electricity they will follow our companies act but if companies act provisions are inconsistent with the provisions of their regulatory acts then they can follow their regulatory acts and next one any other company governed by any special act for the time being except in so far as the said provisions are inconsistent with the provisions of such act so if you take lic lic life insurance corporation it was governed by lic act so if lic act is silent then our companies act 2013 is applicable but lic act is very clear that you know provisions of companies act is not applicable to them they clearly specified that companies act provisions are not applicable to lic now lic is not required to comply the provisions of uh, companies act 2013 and you know such other body corporate incorporated by any act for the time being in force so any other body corporate now you'll get a doubt sir what is a body corporate what is a company are they both same or different are they both same or different obviously they are different and you already know this statement you know all companies are body corporates but all body corporates are not company did you remember the point so what is a body corporate sir you know body corporate is an association which is incorporated under any act for the time being an incorporated association an incorporated association is called body corporate but if you take company it is also an incorporated association but such incorporation happened under companies act so if you are an incorporated associate if you are an incorporated association you will be treated as body corporate if such incorporation happened under companies act then you will be treated as company suppose sir i was incorporated under llp act sir i am a body corporate i am limited liability partner you know i am llp whereas i am an incorporated association but my incorporation happened under company act sir now i am a company so body corporate is a wider term company is a narrow term so every company is a body corporate but every body corporate need not be a company so if any of the provisions any of the provisions 
with respect to llp is silent in llp act now you can take uh, advantage of such concepts uh, in company act for the time being i am telling you and if you take foreign company another example foreign company is also a body corporate because it is incorporated under an act which is uh, outside india you know it is incorporated under an act it is not incorporated under company act so foreign company is also body corporate some provisions of our company act 2013 are applicable to the foreign company so what are those provisions i will let you know uh, in our uh, upcoming uh, points understood so very simple you know scope of the company act it is applicable to companies extend whole of india applicability you know companies banking company insurance company electricity you know generation or supply of electricity companies and then uh, any body corporate governed under some other acts provided that such other acts should be silent or if there is any contradictory points then follow your respective acts next we had you know features of a company or a characteristics of a company you can see here you know company is an artificial person it's just a piece of paper ma so if someone ask you what is a company instead of telling a definition just tell them that company is simply a piece of paper right whatever you heard is correct so roc is having authority to issue certificate of incorporation once you file documents for getting incorporation of a company so an association when they file documents with roc upon verification roc will issue a certificate called certificate of incorporation the moment you get certificate of incorporation yes that is the result that is the uh, proof that company came into existence and the same authority you know roc under the uh, power of you know central government or you know the help of nclt they can cancel that paper that is nothing but you know uh, liquidation of the company liquidation of the company understood so company is simply a piece of paper or it is an artificial person whose existence existence birth and death of the company is decided by operation of law and you know you can observe that you can know that you know members liability is always limited and separate legal entity so here you know company is separate owners are separate we call owners as uh, members of the company owners who are the owners of the company members of the company so separate legal entity comes into the picture so company being an artificial person it can't do its activities on its own that's why company require human agency that human agency we call them as board of directors board of directors so if you observe there is a relation between company and board of directors what is the relationship sir principal and agent principal and agent for the acts of company owners are not liable because separate legal entity you know the, this fiction this fiction separates owner and company now for the acts of owners owners are responsible for the act of company company only responsible now on behalf of company board of directors will do certain activities if all these activities are within the scope of memorandum of association articles of association then you know board of directors are not liable only company is liable only company is liable so company is always having unlimited liability but the owners liability is limited so what this limited liability indicates sir the risk is limited risk means what whatever amount they invested whatever amount they invested so if company is doing business very well they will get profits they will get share in the profits we call them as you know dividends but if company performance is not good and company is continuously suffering losses then who will bear such losses sir company members will bear the loss to the extent of their invested capital any loss beyond their invested capital you know owners won't pay any single rupee extra so this is a one of the differential characteristic between you know company and partnership type of organization and you know in partnership type of organization act of one partner all other partners are liable but here act of directors company only liable it is not at all related to owners of the company understood so as long as directors act within the authority yes company is liable if directors act beyond the authority if directors act beyond the authority you all know as long as agent works within the principal authority principal is liable if agent exceeds authority 
principal is not liable agent is personally liable here also as long as board of directors are doing activities within the powers of you know moa aoa company is having unlimited liability or else board of directors are personally liable and their liability is unlimited here we are talking about you know limited liability this limited liability is applicable only to the owners but not to the company but not to the board of directors and the next one is perpetual succession perpetual succession means you know independent existence simply so here you know the incoming of the members uh, outgoing of the members won't affect the association this won't affect the company survive yes company is independent body so its existence as well as death is decided by operation of law so the incoming of the members or no or outgoing members won't affect the life of the company and since it is an artificial person it will express consent it will express consent through common seal through common seal it is official signature of the company so that's it this is all about section 1 of the company act now let's begin section 2 of the company act so section 2 of the company act 2013 here you can find different types of companies so very very important different types of companies very very important you can expect five marks from this small topic so why i'm talking very very important because small topic and you can easily score five marks from this topic that's why you need to concentrate so listen carefully you know by the end of this uh, lecture you know this preliminary topic you'll be in a position to answer any kind of question that you are going to get in the exam so listen carefully listen carefully on the basis of uh, certain categories you know companies were divided into many types on the basis of uh, certain prescribed categories for example on the basis of uh, number of members the companies are classified into two types private limited public limited and later we we had one more concept called opc one person company this is also part of uh, private limited company only next one on the basis of uh, ownership on the basis of ownership you know if government is having majority of ownership then it is a government company other one non government company next on the basis of control on the basis of control relationship you can observe holding company subsidiary company associate company and on the basis of listing you can see listed company unlisted company on the basis of liability of members you can see three companies limited by shares limited by guarantee unlimited companies so let's begin this the uh, topic of you know types of companies first one on the basis of number of members so we categorize companies into three types private limited public limited one person company so how can we differentiate a company you know whether is it a private company or whether is it a public company very simple download the aoa articles of association of the company in articles of association of a company if you find conditions sir conditions with respect to what sir you know restricts the transfer of shares limits the number of members to 200 prohibits the transfer of, uh, prohibits the invitation to the public to subscribe any securities of the company if you are able to find these three conditions in the articles of association of a company then it is a private limited company sir i am unable to find these three conditions sir then it is a public limited company many people will tell that if you if you find you know if you find private limited in its uh, name clause then it is a private company if there is no word called private then it is a public company it is 100% wrong why because a government company irrespective of uh, this uh, a private limited or public limited it should use word called limited yes it should use word called limited so if if you are a government company it is irrelevant for me private or public the name of a government company shall always ends with limited now how can you categorize whether is it a private company or public company understood so how can we categorize you know company as a private or public simply take aoa in articles of association if you are able to find three conditions so what are those three conditions restricts the transfer of shares once again i am telling you here the transfer is not prohibited restricted sir in what manner the transfer is restricted sir very simple very simple no i am a member of private company first of all why uh, to place restriction on the transfer sir reason my name itself is selling private privacy confidentiality 
to protect confidentiality there should be restriction on the incoming and outgoing members so if there is a free free transfers are available just imagine free transfers are available you know incoming members outgoing members you can't control ultimately outsiders will easily come into the company by purchasing shares in secondary market and they will come to know all our trade secrets all our trade secrets this should not happen so simply to protect the confidentiality here we are restricting the transfer how so i am a member of a private company i want money i want to transfer shares now i'll write a letter to the directors i'll write a letter to the directors about my intention of selling these shares directors first they will offer these shares to the existing members if existing members are ready to purchase then i will sell to them if existing members are not ready they are not having funds then i need to sell shares to any person to whom board of directors gave approval so to whom board of directors gave approval to those persons only i can transfer these shares at what price sir you know the price is determined by the management and certified by the company auditor so here transfer is allowed but the transfer is restricted so don't write that you know transfer is prohibited it is uh, absolutely wrong so restricts the right to transfer its shares next one here the number of members is limited to 200 how many ma 200 in case of opc maximum only one so we are talking about private company here the maximum number of members is 200 but while counting 200 care to be taken to exclude certain people who are they sir first one employees first one employees so my company employees who became members during their employment period I repeat during their employment period they are not counted for the purpose of this 200 sir my company employees they retired you now because of you know 60 years of age they retired after five years they came to us and they acquired some shares sir so we allotted some shares to them now are they included or excluded included not excluded included why because you know they became members not during the employment but after employment so once again i'm asking you when they become members during the employment excluded after the employment sir included okay sir my company employees they became members during employment only due to age factor they got retired sir now are they included or excluded sir excluded because when they became members no they were employees so simple rule simple rule employee becoming member or any person becoming member during the employment period shall be excluded whether he is in service at present or you know whether he is not in service uh, at present are you all getting my point that means you know present employees are excluded past employees who became member during the employment period also excluded you now one more point one more point if you see this d point sir at the time of incorporation, I am the promoter of the company and I am the member of the company, sir. So we incorporated a company. Few after few years, when company offered job, you know, I applied for the job and I got selected. Now I am employee of the company, sir. I am employee of the company. Sir, am I included in this 200 count or excluded? Obviously included. Why? When you became a member during the employment period or before the employment period sir before the employment period sir so then you are you'll be included you'll be counted understood ma everyone so simply who will be excluded ma only the em persons who became members during their employment shall not be counted so this is with respect to employees and we had one more category the that is uh, you know joint shareholding first of all what is meant by joint shareholding two or more persons holding two or more shares under a single share certificate jointly uh, for example me and my mother holding one share certificate one share certificate in that certificate there might be you know 2000 shares 5000 shares okay no problem so one share certificate held by me and my mother now for the purpose of this 200 we are counted not as two but as one only one so in case of joint shareholding you know all the number of members all the members will be excluded and only count one shall be included so this is with respect to limitation on number of members is it clear 
and next one prohibits any invitation to public to subscribe for any securities of the company so that means a private company strictly prohibited from offering its securities to the public so they can't make public offer they can't make public offer name itself is selling you know private company they can offer securities only to the closely held people private people they can't offer shares to public sir how can you categorize whether is it a whether whether a private people or public people see any person an unknown unidentified person becoming member of the company that means you know public only identified person very known person to whom we are giving offer and from whom we are getting money and to whom we are allotting securities is a known person you know private private are you getting my point so in a public company you can't identify the persons who are becoming members of the company any person from general public they can come and they can purchase share they can become member of the company but in private company it is not like that so you can see the restrictions you can see the limitation and you can see the prohibition so these three conditions are very important ma, to categorize whether a company is a private or a public and you know other conditions you know it, it should have minimum two persons and it's minimum paid up share capital it should have minimum paid up share capital as may be prescribed these two points you are already aware of it that's why i'm not making stress on those two points whereas the three points are very important restricts transfer limits number prohibits public offer understood next one you know that minimum paid up capital how much sir previously it is 1 lakh rupee but you know companies act 2013 in companies act 2013 uh sorry companies amendment act 2015 they deleted the word 1 lakh and they wrote the amount prescribed so they may prescribe in future under rules so far they were not prescribed but i'm telling you next one this minimum paid up share capital requirement is not applicable to section 8 company However, that Section 8 company should be in regular in filing uh, financial statements with ROC, in filing annual returns with ROC. If you are a regular filer, then this exemption is available to you. Next one, public company. So what is a public company? Very simple. Any company which is not a private company, it is a public company. Any company which is not a private company, we call it as public company. And it should have minimum paid up share capital as may be prescribed okay so far this is good but if you read this third point you'll get more and more clarity or more and more confusion so what is this third point For sometimes a private company is also treated as public company when sir you know if a private company is a subsidiary to public company so what is this subsidiary sir i'll tell you uh, after a few minutes but for the time being listen majority of control in this private company if more than 50 percent of voting power is held by public company then this private becomes subsidiary to public company subsidiary to public company if a private company is a subsidiary to public company then this private limited is deemed to be public company deemed to be public company i repeat deemed to be public company by its articles it might be a private company through articles it might be a private company but in fact this is a deemed to be public company that means the privileges the status which was given to the private company those privileges status is not available to this company understood sir can it enjoy the benefits of public company no why because you know it had restrictions it had limitation it had prohibition so simple you know nutshell point a private company which is subsidiary of public company it will have only the disadvantages of public company as well as disadvantages of private company it won't have any advantage of private it won't have any advantage of public company so this is like you know a control point to eliminate the situation then simply name any private company if you are a subsidiary to public then you will be deemed to be a you are deemed to be a public company so with this you know private company public company we completed next one one person company one person company so here you know minimum and maximum number of members is one how many minimum and maximum one and here you know uh, who can uh, who can become member of the company sir an indian resident so how can we get residential status very simple you know under income tax rules uh, 
or uh, if you take pema rules you can see that a person who is having who is having a uh, who is who stay in india for a period of 182 days or more he will be treated as indian resident and that person is capable of uh, incorporating one person company but you know latest amendment act the time limit of 182 days with respect to companies act i'm telling with respect to companies act they gave one more alternative that if your period of stay in india is 120 days then also you can incorporate a one person company so the key highlights of one person company is uh, number of members you know minimum one maximum one coming to the directors it can have only single director one director of course it can have uh, up to 15 directors but minimum one director is sufficient and you know it will be treated as a private company so all the privileges available to private company are, ev are equally given to the one person company and it will have a nominee who cannot act as a nominee for more than one OPC so there are restrictions on the member and there are restrictions on the nominee what are those restrictions on the nominee on the one person as well as you know on the company you will get to know in the next topic that is incorporation of companies so for the time being you know one person company means a single person now how many members will present in opc minimum one maximum one and it will have one more extra person called nominee nominee and for the time being you know these limits are not applicable Re recent amendments you know these limits are not uh, applicable next uh, on the basis of size companies are classified into you know two types small company other than small company okay so this is not a separate category ma this is just based on the uh, you know paid up share capital and turnover uh, limits this is not a separate company like you know private public like that you know small company is not a separate company it is not a separate company it is not a separate company but based on the paid up share capital turnover limits you can find this small company so small company means you know any company satisfying three conditions three conditions to be satisfied in order to call a small company so what are those three companies sir one is it should be a company other than public company that means you know private company and its paid up share capital should not exceed two crores two crores you know limits have been revised limits have been revised you can see revised limits here you can see revised limits here so three conditions to be satisfied in order to call a company a small company one is other than public company a second one is paid up share capital should not exceed two crores and third one turnover should not exceed 20 crores turnover should not exceed 20 crores if these three conditions are satisfied then you will be treated as small company in addition to the privileges of private company you will be given extra privileges you know you no need to comply some provisions of the company side the logic is very simple of introducing this concept is to encourage all you know mid-size partnership firms mid-size associations to come into the company type of uh, organization today you know for doing business we had multiple options as a sole proprietor you can do the business for this you know they provided an alternative called one person company so for getting into the for attracting you under one person company they made members liability limited understood they made uh, you know uh, yes simply you know members liability got limited and they can do wide more and more operations they will get an identity in this india they can do operations from any place in the india and then next one you know mid-size entities like you know second time second organization second type of organization is the partnership firm association of persons are you getting my point cooperative societies so to attract these kind of entities they provided a privilege called private company and in private company also they gave extra privileges so like uh, uh, under small companies okay so if you get incorporated as a private company and if your turnover is below 20 or 20 or if you and if your paid up share capital is 2 2 crores or below 2 crores then you will be called a small company you no need to comply all the provisions of companies act you know for complying few provisions is sufficient understood ma so why what is the need of attracting them into the company the reason companies act is asking company to file n number of forms with roc 
like you know for financial statements AOC4 my annual returns uh, MGT7 so all these forms you know the, uh, with respect to liabilities you know DPT3 deposit forms so when a company is filing all these forms with ROC it indicates you know transparency now any person from the public can download this information from a public domain that is mca.gov.in they can go through the uh, affairs of the company they can go through the activities done by the company everything so this information general public is getting only because it is filing documents with a, an authority called ROC but can you find you know a sole proprietor a partnership cooperative society filing forms with government no then how a general public know about this type of organizations so transparency point of view for getting you know for better transparency each and every business organization should be incorporated under company for attracting them we are providing these privileges nothing more than that ma nothing more than that so next one so you can expect a question on the small company ma you can definitely expect a question from small company uh, like uh, regarding these exceptions if you fall under these five categories if you fall under these five categories even though your turnover is less than or equal to 20 crores even though your paid up share capital is less than or equal to 2 crores but if you fall under these five categories you will not be treated as a small company you will not be treated as a small company so what are those five companies sir you know holding company subsidiary section 8 company and then body corporate governed by special act and then public company and then public company there is a possibility that you know there is a company called pqr private limited its turnover is 19 crores its paid up share capital is at 1.9 crore and this pqr private limited in this pqr private limited you know in this 1.9 crore paid up share capital some 1 crore share capital was held by abc limited abc limited now directors of pqr private limited contend that pqr private limited is a small company because of turnover and paid up share capital requirements so since they met the requirements of turnover and paid up share capital they want to they want to take status of small company do you agree with the directors of pqr private limited so this is one question you know you can expect for five marks now answer to this question my dear students is PQR private limited a small company the answer is no why out of 1.9 crore 1 crore that means more than 50 percent was held by ABC limited that means this PQR private limited is a subsidiary to ABC limited this PQR private limited is subsidiary to another company so subsidiary company is already excluded a subsidiary company is already excluded so accordingly PQR Private Limited is not a small company. The contention of directors of PQR Private Limited is uh, invalid. Understood, ma? So, in this manner, you can expect question for 5 marks. Next one, you know, benefits of small company, just academic interest point of view. So some benefits, they are not required to prepare a cash flow statement in the financial statements, ma. Mm, you can see D point. So, this single point you know this on this point there is a question for six marks in the latest attempt i think one year back there is a question on this small company with respect to this point and that question is for six marks so that's why we are telling you concept clarity is very important so don't uh, mug up entire things you know understanding is very important then only you can analyze the questions in the question paper you can attempt each and every question with a hundred percent perfect knowledge okay so small company had many privileges some of the privileges were given here this is not that much important from exam point of view but this c point you you can uh, cover c point under management and administration chapter and d point in accounts of companies and uh, b point under auditors chapter and you know a e f g these points you can find in the some other topics so there we were going to cover these points next only private limited companies can be regarded as small companies subject to satisfaction of the above provisions so with this small company we completed next one on the basis of relationship you can find you know the companies are uh, classified into three types holding company subsidiary company associate company holding subsidiary associate see 
these are different different companies they are different different companies but based on the relationship based on the relationship we are categorizing some companies as holding some companies as subsidiary so if you see the definition of holding company there is a point that we had two companies tata sons tcs with respect to tcs this tata sons will be treated as holding company if tcs is subsidiary to tata sons you now if you read the definition that is the point you know one company will be treated as holding company if it had subsidiaries if it had subsidiaries so any company having subsidiary that company we will treat as holding company and this word is very important you know here the expression company includes body corporate company includes body corporate for example you know lic if you take lic this is not a company this is not incorporated under company act 1956 this is not incorporated under 2039 this was governed by separate law called lic act 1956 so this is a body corporate now lic is having some 60% of uh, holding 60% of paid up share capital in some pqr limited now lic is treated as holding company and pqr limited is treated as subsidiary company so holding company category is not only given to the companies this category is also given to body corporates understood so holding company nothing to learn more and more so it is very important to remember subsidiary company and you can expect six marks question from this subsidiary company so what is a subsidiary company sir ma on the basis of control i'm categorizing companies into two types controlling company controlled company controlling controlled controlling means a company which control other entity controlling company means a company which control other entity controlled company means a company which was controlled by another entity suppose here two companies are there company a company b you can call company a as controlling if it control another company company b is a controlled by company a so company b is called controlled company understood so here subsidiary company is a company controlled by holding company now here you know this control is of two types this control is of two types yes holding company can get control over another company in two ways one is acquiring more than half of the voting power sir how can we get voting power sir simply you know acquire paid up you know acquire shares of the company if you had more than 50% of capital of another company then then that entity becomes subsidiary then the entity becomes subsidiary if you take tcs for example tcs in tcs 73% of paid up share capital was held by tata sons now tata sons is the public company tcs is the holding company tata sons is the holding company sorry tata sons is the holding company repeat tata sons is the holding company tcs is the subsidiary company so here to become a subsidiary here to become a subsidiary you know two types of controls are there if you had any one control you will be treated as holding and you know in which entity you are having control that entity is treated as subsidiary first type of control is having more than 50% of voting power and second type of control is you no know, control over directors control over directors if you had a control on the composition of the directors control on the composition of the directors then then your entity will be treated as holding company and in which, in which entity you are having control that entity is treated as subsidiary company are you getting my point students so any type you had you know you will be treated any type of control you exercise you will be treated as holding the other entity is treated as subsidiary so what are the two types of control ma one is control over directors so here control means what sir in a company say for suppose there are total 15 directors are there as per our companies act also you know maximum number of directors in a company is 15 of course subject to aoa you can increase you can increase but out of 15 directors if one entity is having power to 
appoint or remove majority of the directors in that 15 majority means how many you know 15 by 2 7.5 you know round of 8 so if one entity is having control over appointment and removal of eight directors out of 15 then that entity is said to have control so entity having control holding company and the control where it was exercised we call it as subsidiary company we call it as subsidiary company understood my dear students but you know this control you can exercise you know control of voting power you can exercise on your own or through another subsidiary companies through another subsidiary companies sir example sir Tima, tata sons tcs this is you know direct holding subsidiary relationship direct holding subsidiary relationship one more case we'll see suppose you know tata sons along with tcs so tcs is already under the control of tata sons imagine they had control in another company called abc limited in this abc limited tcs is having some 26 percent control tata sons is having some 25 percent control in abc tcs is already a subsidiary company tcs is already a subsidiary company now in this case abc limited automatically becomes subsidiary to tata sons how sir no they had 25 plus 26 how much 51 percent control so for becoming a subsidiary more than 50 is sufficient here you know you can find 51 percent control are you getting my point students so that means together with one or more of its subsidiary you know there is completely indirect subsidiary concept is there totally indirect how sir suppose there is a company a limited to this a limited we had two subsidiaries b limited and c limited so b and c are the subsidiaries to a so in our resulting company you know, in d limited b limited is having 26 percent control c limited is having 27 percent control 27 percent control now d automatically becomes a subsidiary to a limited how oh, sir you know a limited is already controlling d in what manner through its subsidiaries p and c b and c so if you put if you put the voting power put together you know 26 plus 27 almost 53 percent is there so now d is a subsidiary to a limited so this is totally indirect control indirect control so to make one entity as a subsidiary either you can exercise voting power directly or you along with another subsidiary can exercise voting power or you no, your holding is zero but your subsidiary is having more than half of the control then then also you know that company will become subsidiary to you understood next sir deemed subsidiary a company shall be deemed to be a subsidiary company of holding even if the control referred as above is of another subsidiary company of holding company that's what my last example if you take you know if you take last example a limited holding in d limited is zero but d limited is still holding uh, sorry d limited is still subsidiary of a how through its subsidiaries through its subsidiaries and you can see example here also uh, c is a subsidiary of b b is subsidiary of a then automatically c becomes subsidiary of uh, a you just analyze practically you know uh, in the ultimate in our company who is getting control the above you know holding company sir that's it that's it who controls our entity for that control how much voting power they should have more than half more than half so how you get voting power through acquiring shares of the company acquisition of shares you will get the voting power understood next one ma you know very very difficult point many students won't understand this point held in fiduciary capacity held in fiduciary capacity shares held by a company or power exercisable by it in another company in a fiduciary capacity shall not be considered for the determining the holding subsidiary relationship that means what take an example we had two companies a limited b limited so b limited uh, paid up share cap please 1 lakh 1 lakh 
out of 1 lakh a limited is holding some 46000 46000 that means you know 46 percent control is there can you tell me with this 46 percent control do you think a limited controls b limited no you know from holding subsidiary point of view can you call you know a limited as a holding b limited as a subsidiary no not at all hmm. understood next one continuing this example continuing the same example member m one member is there member m for the benefit of society of uh, the benefit of employees of a limited for the benefit of society he made a donation you know sorry mr m is holding 10000 rupees shares let me take in one note you know you'll get a clarity so company a limited and b limited b limited paid up share capital is uh, 1 lakh rupee out of 1 lakh a limited is holding 46000 and another person independent person mr m is holding some 10000 shares 10000 rupees shares so paid up share capital 1 lakh uh, paid up share capital 1 lakh out of 1 lakh 46 percent was held by a limited with this 46 percent you can't call a limited as a holding company b limited as a subsidiary company and mr m is holding some 10000 rupees paid up share capital for one purpose i repeat one purpose m contributed all his shares to that uh, trust to a trust you know this trust is for the benefit of uh, employees of a limited employees of a limited or you know general public whoever it might be so there is a trust and this trust was headed by a limited you know a limited is a trustee of trust i repeat a limited is trustee in charge in charge that means uh, in charge will hold all the assets and uh, uh, all the assets are on behalf of trust now mr m donated ten thousand rupees shares to the trust so he registered all the shares in the name of trustee who is the trustee a limited now here a limited is a trustee holding these shares not for itself but holding on behalf of employees now 10000 shares they are holding as a trustee as a trustee that means all these 10000 rupees who is the beneficial holders employees of a limited employees of a limited or the beneficial holders it's not a limited now if you observe a limited in its own capacity it is holding 46000 rupees capital and as a trustee that means in the fiduciary capacity it is holding 10000 rupees paid up share capital now for the purpose of determining holding and subsidiary relationship you should not add this 10000 so many people will do that many people think that 46000 plus 10000 total 56000 56000 out of 1 lakh that means 56 percent so a limited is having 56 percent uh, paid up share capital of b limited 56 percent control is there so b limited is a subsidiary a limited is holding company it is wrong it is wrong so if you held any shares in a fiduciary capacity that means you know you are holding shares on behalf of someone for the benefit of someone then you should not add those shares for determining the holding subsidiary relationship not only here ma but also you know in associate company also we are going to cover that point so i hope everyone understood my point you know one is if you are holding shares in a fiduciary capacity that means you know you are holding shares on behalf of some other person in that case those shares will not be added to your existing holding for the purpose of determining holding subsidiary relation next one note a company cannot have more than two layers of subsidiary company for the immediate wholly owned subsidiary company will not be counted as a layer so this is also one more uh, uh, difficult point to understood no it creates one dilemma just listen carefully our entity is c limited it is having a subsidiary s1 limited s1 limited is having a subsidiary s2 limited that's it you know two layers permitted two layers up to this only allowed 
so s2 limited having one more subsidiary not allowed only two layers are permitted say for suppose c limited is having wholly owned subsidiary wholly owned subsidiary uh, limited one subsidiary it is having a limited as a subsidiary a limited is having a subsidiary of b limited permitted this is permitted because here the count is zero one and two one and two but whereas here if you take count one two no two layers completed two layers completed maximum it can have two layers you know subsidiaries of two layers so down the line that is nothing but layer you know you need to check down the line horizontal it can have many suppose you know c limited can have hundred subsidiaries c limited can have hundred subsidiaries in a horizontal manner that means you know direct subsidiaries direct subsidiaries it can have you know there is no limit on it but you know sub subsidiaries concept i'm telling you if you take s2 limited this is sub subsidiary to c limited in vertical manner there is a prohibition you know sorry there is a restriction maximum two layers are permitted while counting two layers if you had wholly owned subsidiary then that count you know that layer is not counted so simply if you observe the chart you know s1 limited s2 limited yes and the line now s2 can't have one more subsidiary s2 can't have one more subsidiary layer is permitted you know the layer is restricted but if you take that uh, left side one wholly one subsidiary can have a limited a limited can have b limited so there you can find three companies but you know count is two only count is two only wholly one subsidiary count is zero right are you getting my point b limited should not have subsidiary because this company won't permit from this company point of view you should think you know this company point of view two layers are allowed one two completed one and two already completed so now b limited can't have one more subsidiary so this point they won't uh, test you practically in the exam they may ask you in multiple choice type of question so but for the time being how many layers are permitted two layers are permitted horizontally you can have n number of companies vertically two layers are permitted while counting these two layers if you had wholly owned subsidiary immediately then that count will be treated as zero understood ma next one associate company associate company so an associate company in relation to another company means a company in which that another company has significant influence but which is not a subsidiary company suppose we had two companies you know a limited and b limited so b limited becomes associate to a limited only if a limited is having significant influence in b limited sir how can i get that significant influence is there any definition to significant influence yes what is the definition sir you know having 20 percent or more of voting power but it should not exceed 50 percent of voting power because once if you exceed 50% of voting power, then there are just holding subsidiary concept. So having 20% of more and less than or equal to 50% of voting power, then you know, then you can call that second company's associate to first company. And many will get a doubt, sir, a, a single company, can it become both associate and subsidiary to another company? No, 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 no. A company can become either associate or subsidiary. It can't become both subsidiary and associate. Extending this example, in B Limited, total there are 10 directors are there. 9 out of 10 directors appointed by A Limited only. Either appointment or removal can be done by A Limited only. And A Limited is having 26% control in B Limited. 26% of paid up share capital in B Limited. Now my dear students listen carefully is b limited associate company or subsidiary company the answer is subsidiary company how sir 26 percent means it is within the range of 20 to 50 right sir so it should become associate no sir i clearly told you associate company excludes subsidiary company here if you observe this case b limited 9 out of 10 directors were headed by you know governed by a limited that means you know composition of directors a limited is having control over the b limited composition of directors so b limited automatically becomes subsidiary once b limited becomes subsidiary you can't call b limited as an associate company 
and extending this point you know the main purpose of classifying holding subsidiary associate is to verify the group as a whole reason reason sima owners members they invested some 10 crores in company a limited a limited it diverted certain funds to a b limited you know a limited acquired some 60 percent of voting power from b limited for that they paid some funds to b limited now a limited standalone financial statements i repeat a limited standalone financial statements are not correct picture of a limited it's, it's not a correct picture of a limited because what about the performance of these funds what about the performance of these funds are you getting my point students see they diverted some two crores two crores to b limited that means a limited is doing business with eight crores only eight crores paid up share capital two crores you know investment in subsidiary investment in subsidiary two crores sorry paid up share capital is 10 crores paid up share capital is 10 crores but they did business only for eight crores remaining two crores they invested in subsidiary now the performance you need to show for entire 10 crores for entire 10 crores the performance you can show only through consolidated financial statements so in consolidated financial statements holding company in addition to its figures it will add the figures of subsidiaries and associate companies so now the owners of holding company will get a clear picture correct picture of the position of holding company performance of the holding company you know as a group group as a whole understood my dear students so let's see the point one more time so associate how you know how a company becomes associated to another very simple if one company is having significant influence in another company that significant influence they can get through voting power or through any agreements through agreements also they can get voting uh, control so mem uh, memorandum of under under understanding whatever the agreements they write you know they had between themselves through those agreements also they will get a significant influence and associate company includes a joint venture so that means you know joint venture is an associate company and again the point is repeated one more time the point is repeated that is shares held in fiduciary capacity you should not consider them while 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 considering whether you know whether a company is a holding or subsidiary next one next one we are almost at the end of the topic ma listen carefully foreign company government company foreign company what is a foreign company so foreign company means a company incorporated outside india and having business place of business in india they can do they can do business through agent in india either physical mode or electronic mode electronic mode for example if you take a online e-commerce transactions electronic mode means online e-commerce transactions physical mode means having branches for example hsbc bank hsbc bank it is a company incorporated outside india but having business in india physically through branch operation through branch through branch it's a foreign company electronic mode say for suppose alibaba alibaba if you take you know they were incorporated in china and having business in india through electronic mode understood but if the same entity come to india and if they incorporate company in india then that company will be indian company only that company will be treated as indian company only if you take best example you know of uh, facebook amazon and then uh, kia motors kia car company so their foreign com their parent companies were incorporated outside india they came to India and they started one more company in India as per Indian Companies Act. Now, whatever company incorporated in India, they are treated as Indian companies. See here, one more point I need to tell you. The nationality of a company depends upon the place of incorporation, but not the nationality of members. Suppose today, five Korean people came to India and incorporated company in India. Now, the company in India, we call it as Indian company, domestic company. It's not foreign company. So, and conducts any business activity in any other manner. Understood. Of course, you know, foreign companies also very important to learn. 
and they they are required to comply provisions of our company act 2013 not all provisions but very few like you know complying uh, csr activities csr if they get profit from india 5 crores or more they need to spend 2% of the profits in india under csr section 135 and they need to file uh, some financial statements with roc those financial statements should be prepared according to section 381 so they need to comply some provisions next uh, government company government company see once again i am telling you private company is different private sector undertaking is different private company different private sector different public company different public sector un undertakings are different psu we popularly call them as public sector undertakings right so public sector undertakings are different public companies are different so what is the difference sir you know through articles of association you can categorize a company as a private or a public you can categorize a, a company as a private or public in a private in a private company you can find restrictions limits prohibits where you can't find these three words in a public company now what is a public sector what is a private sector if government ownership is there in an, any organization then you can call it as psu public sector undertaking like sbi bpcl indian oil corporation bsnl bsnl so government stake you know government is having majority of ownership then you know it is called as public sector undertaking if such public sector undertaking is incorporated under company act we call it as government company understood if public sector undertaking is incorporated under company act then we call it as government company then what is a private sector undertaking sir you know government ownership is uh, uh, zero or negligible government ownership in this entity is zero or negligible then it is a private sector undertaking if the private sector undertaking is incorporated under company act under company act it is nothing but non government company it may be categorized as private or public depending on aoa of company articles of association of the company are you all getting my point students everyone so don't treat that you know private sector undertakings are private companies public sector undertakings are public company it is wrong it is wrong public sector undertaking means government owned entities understood so now you can categorize government company as a public sector undertaking government company comes under public sector undertaking see ma'am government company means a company in which not less than 51% of paid up share capital held by you know central government state government one or more state governments or you know combination of central and state governments and finally subsidiary to government company is also a government company subsidiary to a government company is also a government company and this note point you will get to know when i teach share capital chapter you know until uh, share capital i won't uh, i won't tell i mean i won't uh, you won't get this point differential voting rights for the time being i'll tell you differential voting rights means a uh, share giving vote either more than one or less than one more than one or less than one so it won't carry equal voting rights you know the voting rights are differential in nature in that case you should not take paid up share capital you should consider the vote called voting power see of course at the end voting power comes from share capital only if share capital you know if there is no classes if there is no different class in the share capital obviously paid up share capital or total voting power both will have same effect both will have same effect but in the share capital of a company if they had differential voting right shares that means giving more than one vote giving more than one vote for example for example a company had 1 lakh shares ma 1 lakh shares all 1 lakh shares belonging to only one class then each share can give you one vote total number of votes 1 lakh votes total number of votes how many 1 lakh so i am holding 46000 shares that means 46% of share capital of 46% of voting power both same both are one and the same both are one and the same say for suppose out of this 1 lakh shares 80000 shares 80000 shares will give you one vote per share 
one vote per share and 20000 shares listen carefully 20000 shares each share can give you each share can give you five votes how many votes five votes five votes now i'm holding 46000 of 80000 shares 46000 of 80000 shares can I tell that you know I am having 46% voting power? No. Why? Here the voting power, if you calculate voting power, 80,000 shares into 1 vote, 80,000 votes. 20,000 shares into 5 votes. Each share will have 5 votes, right? 20,000 shares into 5 votes, 1 lakh votes. Total 1 lakh 80,000 votes are there. Now I am holding 46,000 ordinary shares. I repeat, I am holding 46,000 ordinary shares my voting is 46,000 votes only. 46,000 out of how many sir? 1,80,000. Now how can I call it as 46% voting power? No, my voting power is 46,000 out of 1,80,000 votes. So there is a difference only in that situation. You know, if company had differential voting rights, then don't go with paid up share capital word. Replace paid up share capital word with voting power. That means here, here 51% of 1,80,000, not 1 lakh paid up share capital, not 1 lakh paid up share capital, 50, 51% of 1,80,000 votes you need to consider. Are you all getting my point students? Are you all with me? Everyone, so listen carefully. If company is having equal voting rights, then you know, paid up share capital, voting power, both are same. But if company issued, you know, company is having, you know, differential voting rights in that case only, you know, paid up share capital word is replaced with voting power. So for the time being, you know, a few examples, you can see BPCL, Indian Oil Corporation, Hindustan Petroleum Oil Corporation, and then BHGL, ITCL, BDL and NLCL. So all these are government companies. All these are government companies. Uh, say for suppose central government that means you know government of india holding 80 percent paid up share capital in uh, irctc now irctc becomes a government company suppose government of india is holding 25 percent in uh, a limited ap state government is holding 25 percent and then next uh, tamil nadu state government is holding some 20 percent now all put together total how much must 70 percent now a limited is also a government company one more point one more point subsidiary to government company subsidiary to government company is also treated as government company understood everyone subsidiary to government company is also treated as government company next one write about types of companies based on the liability you know just academic sake and i'll just revise it quickly so we had three types of companies one is uh, limited by shares here the members liability is limited to the extent of unpaid value per share into number of shares held by them number of shares held by them now their liability arises in two situations one is whenever board of directors make calls on shares the other one is the other one is in the event of liquidation if assets are not in a position to meet the liabilities then liquidator may call that amount liquidator may call unpaid value amount we call it as contribution amount so member liability arises in two cases one is during going concern board of director making calls on shares and during liquidation liquidator calling a contribution money but their liability is limited to the extent of unpaid value Next one, limited by guarantee. Here, member's liability is limited to the extent of guarantee they given in they provided in the memorandum of association. And here, you know, member's liability arises only in the event of uh, liquidation. During going concern, you know, their their liability is zero. But in the event of liquidation, if assets are not in a position to meet liability, then only their liability arises. Next one, unlimited company. Here there is no limit on the members liability you know only uh, in india in practice private companies were incorporated under unlimited liability companies few private companies few private companies 
can incorporate as a unlimited liability here there is no limit on liability of the members the members liability is joint and several it is unlimited understood so with this my dear students we completed preliminary topic preliminary topic completed and next one next we will start with the uh, incorporation of the company so the next topic is incorporation of company and matters incidental thereto so total 20 sections are there section 3 to section 22 you can expect easily some 8 marks from this chapter so in this part 1 incorporation process so the first question is write about the concept of promoter so who is a promoter so we had two meanings one is you know one who take one who take initiative in forming the company that means you know drafting memorandum of association and articles of association so filing all these documents with roc entering into preliminary contracts on behalf of future company so whoever do all these kind of activities we call them as promoter but our companies at 2013 gave definition to the word promoter so you can see here definition of the promoter so a promoter is a person who has been named as such in a prospectus or annual returns so if someone is named as a promoter in prospectus or annual return then he will be treated as promoter if you open a uh, reliance industry limited prospectus there you'll find so late shri dhirubhai ambani is, is our promoter so now who is the promoter of reliance industry limited sir you know dhirubhai ambani sir next point one who has control over affairs of the company so this control you can get either as a shareholder or as a director or otherwise that means you know through agreements through agreements sometimes you can get majority control in one entity so sometimes you know creditor can take control over the entity for example one company took finance from multiple banks and it failed to pay the loan amount now banks you know consortium you know groups of banks they come together they, uh, and then appointed one person to control over the affairs of company now that person will be treated as promoter so simply named promoter that means who is named as promoter in the prospectus or annual return he is the promoter next thing who had control over affairs of the company so simply with respect to voting power you can take shareholder with respect to directors yes you can take managing director example and sometimes you know creditor who get authority or who get control over affairs of the company so these people are also termed as promoter now if you see reliance industry limited so sri dhirubhai ambani already deceased some 15 years back 15 20 years back he deceased now who is controlling the affairs of reliance industry limited sir so uh, mukesh dhirubhai ambani so now mukesh dhirubhai ambani sir is the promoter of reliance industry limited and next one in whose advice in accordance with whose advice directions or instructions the board of directors of the company is accustomed to act that means he is neither a shareholder nor a director but still his word his advices his directions you know board of directors are accustomed to act then in that case that person is also treated as promoter for example if you take a ratan tata sir tcs company tata group of companies so ratan tata sir he already resigned from the position of chairman he already resigned from the position of director but still board of directors are used to listen to mr ratan tata sir words are you getting my point so in that case so whose advises directions instructions you know the board of directors are accustomed to act now that person is also treated as a promoter and care to be taken from the c point from the c point one person is excluded that person is professional professional for example to draft moa and aoa definitely a ca or cma or cs services are required because MOA had several restrictions when while drafting MOA we need to comply many rules and who will assist you in framing those uh, clauses of MOA AOA definitely sir you know a chartered accountant now you know every year company has to prepare financial statements they need to conduct general meeting and in that general meeting they need to lay down the financial statements and on those financial statements they need to get members approval all these directions you know 
provided by chartered accountant in practice now ca is providing all these advices to the board now board of directors are following those advices now can we call that ca the chartered accountant as a promoter of the company no because he is rendering those services merely in a professional capacity suppose if that ca provide any service in addition to the professional services suppose he is giving business ideas he is uh, helping a uh, board of directors in framing a new business strategies now that ca is also treated as promoter of the company so my dear students so who is a promoter if you get the question in the exam who is a promoter one who was named as a promoter in the prospectus or annual return as a promoter next one who has control over affairs of the company either as a member i mean simply shareholder or director or otherwise or in accordance with whose directions advice this instructions the board of directors are accustomed to act but from the c point you know a professional rendering services in professional capacity that professional is excluded next one sir how many members are required for forming a company suppose if you take sole proprietorship one person is sufficient if you take partnership from two partners minimum two partners are required similarly for starting you know for forming a company how many members are required sir you know here companies are again classified into three types one person company private company public company as we already discussed in one person company minimum one natural person is required maximum also one natural person listen to my word natural person indian citizen is required for forming one person company whereas for private company two or more persons are required here i am using word person that means you know person includes artificial person so yes a company can start a private company a company along with a natural person or two companies can start a private company the point is for forming a private company minimum two persons are required and then for public company coming to the public company minimum seven persons are required and we can form this company only for one purpose that is you know only for lawful purpose if you form company for any unlawful purpose then you know tribunal is having power to lift the corporate will so lifting of corporate will they can uh, identify the real persons behind the will and they can punish the those persons so simply one person company one member private limited company two persons and then uh, public limited company seven persons are required next once you select the company you will be given three more options that is do you want company limited by shares do you want company limited by guarantee or do you want a unlimited company so th this is nothing but members liability in case of limited by shares members liability is limited to the extent of uh, unpaid value in case of guarantee company member liability is limited to guarantee which was provided in the moa and in case of unlimited company members liability is unlimited and section 3a you know this is a, a additional point you know this is not a part of original act but in latest amendments uh, 2019 amendment act or 2017 companies amendment act 2017 they introduced uh, this concept if i'm not wrong okay fine so here section 3a what it tells us very simple so we doing business in a private uh, in a public company you know public company is our style of uh, uh, organization we had seven members sir but unfortunately one day two members got deceased you know two members died so now we are total five members sir okay is there any obligation on us to increase the number of members yes you need to inc increase this five to seven you know at any point of time the number of members in a private company should not fall below two in case of public company should not fall below seven suppose in any situation if the number falls below 7 in case of public company now the lawmaker is giving you time period of 6 months 6 months to increase that number how many how many months they are providing ma 6 months within 6 months if you increase the number you know by allotting shares to new person or you know by uh, uh, registering shares in the name of uh, legal heads of deceased person yes you need to increase that 5 to 7 if you do it then no problem members liability you know it is limited forever members liability is limited forever suppose you fail to increase number of members 
you fail to increase number of members six months completed now what happened you know from this point of time you know from this point of time whatever debts incurred by the company whatever debts incurred by company it is not company liable you know members members of the company who are aware of the fact that company is doing business with reduced number of members i repeat so the members who are aware of the fact that company is doing business with a reduced number of members only those people are liable for the additional debts for the debts contracted after expiry of six months and their liability is joint and several company liability already seized at this point of time so the debts which company incur after expiry of six months from the date of reduction of number of members are you getting my point all those debts company is not liable you know only members are liable which members are member who is uh, aware of the fact that you know company is doing business with a reduced number of members sir how roc will know this matter sir Arre, every year company has to file annual returns with roc there they need to provide the details of members active members you know they need to provide the details of members in that in that case you know definitely roc can know how many members are alive is company having full-fledged you know is company having seven members or not roc can verify it understood so in that manner roc will issue notice accordingly you know members liability uh, it will be you know converted from limited to unlimited next one so section 3 is all about minimum number of members section 3a is all about members liability members liability you know in in what case members liability uh, will be converted from limited to unlimited that is one case you know reduction of number of members next one incorporation procedure you know procedure for incorporation of a company very simple very simple to remember ma first thing fundamental documents of the company you know moa aoa so first you need to finalize memorandum of association and articles of association next uh, this should be signed by subscribers who will sign moa AOA? subscribers now once these documents are signed once these documents are signed next uh, prepare two declarations one declaration is about compliance compliance declaration yes so whatever you know the association we are registering or we are incorporating under company sac 2013 so this association had complied with all applicable rules and regulations so we have complied all applicable provisions rules and regulations like that we need to furnish a declaration this is like a self declaration and this should be signed by a director or secretary or company secretary or manager who was involved in the incorporation process who was involved in the incorporation process and a professional professional so who comes under professional sir company secretary chartered accountant cost accountant advocate in practice any of any person from this uh, four four you know i told you four ca in practice cma in practice cs in practice advocate in practice any one person should sign this declaration and there is one more declaration one more declaration you know this declaration is all about no defaults so certificate about defaults it's it's a certificate simply you know yes the subscribers of the company and uh, proposed directors of the company they need to sign this declaration stating that last five years we haven't we didn't commit any offense in the promotion or management or incorporation of the company and we are not guilty of fraud we didn't commit any offense under this company act in the promotion or incorporation or management of the company so these people will file a declaration it will cover three points ma it will cover three points two points is with respect to past five years one point is with respect to present company so what information they are declaring sir very simple last five years remember this time period last five years we have not committed any offense in the promotion or management or incorporation of company and we have we are not guilty of fraud or we didn't commit any misfeasance so during the last five years 
in the management of any other company that means only a people you know only a people without defaults even if they commit defaults you know five years they should wait five years they should wait for example i'm a director of abc limited i failed to file annual returns of abc limited actually i'm having a duty to file annual returns of the company but i failed to file annual returns of this company consecutively three years now five years ban will be imposed on me next five years i can't incorporate one more company i was prohibited are you getting my point so here the point is whenever i'm incorporating new company i need to declare myself that i haven't i didn't commit any offense during the last five years so this is with respect to past future point of view so whatever documents we are filing with roc all those documents are complete and correct to the best of my knowledge like that they will certify and these two declarations you need to file it with roc in addition to this you know moa aoa two declarations you need to provide address for temporary correspondence you know details of address for temporary correspondence once you know once you get a uh, certificate of incorporation once company comes into existence it will uh, have a registered office and that registered office address will be filed with roc within 30 days of uh, incorporation and then next one you, we need to give particulars particulars of uh, whom sir particulars of subscribers as well as directors simply you know uh, kyc documents kyc documents are you getting my point so proof of nationality proof of residence all those points and then you know directors should give inter i mean the should disclose interest in other body corporates they need to mention you know they need to disclose their interest in other body corporates this is for identifying related parties that's it understood so you need to file all these documents with roc then only roc will issue certificate of incorporation so is there any obligation on us to incorporate you know to file all these documents for with roc for getting certificate of incorporation yes why if you read the definition of company it starts like with like this company means a company incorporated under companies act 2013 that means without incorporation no company comes into existence all companies will come into existence only through incorporation for incorporation you need to file all these documents along with this you need to pay prescribed fees ma that fees you know it depends upon state to state recently i incorporated one company uh, in chennai you know tamil nadu having registered office having a uh, you know tamil nadu uh, the premises is located in chennai tamil nadu i kept authorized share capital 10 lakhs it asked me to pay stamp duty of just 520 rupees whereas one month back i incorporated company in telangana i kept 10 lakh rupees stamp duty uh, sorry 10 lakhs rupees authorized share capital it asked me to pay 2020 rupees stamp duty so stamp duty depends upon state laws so no need to remember that amount how much amount what is the form we need to file because uh, it it changes very frequently it changes very frequently understood so pay fees or amount of the stamp duty electronically obtain certificate of incorporation and file declaration about address of the registered office so if you go through this question you know i have already completed everything so you can see there signing declaration of complaints declaration of subscription to shares declaration of not guilty non guilty so i haven't committed offenses i was not found uh, guilty of fraud and all the documents filed with roc for registration is complete and correct and then address for temporary correspondence temporary correspondence next one subscriber details director details that's what i told you, you know particulars of subscribers and directors so once you file all these documents roc will issue certificate of incorporation and that certificate of incorporation will have a number called corporate identity number you know individuals we will have other number other other number companies will have seen simply you know identity number again you know company need to file an application for getting pan uh, so income tax ssc that number is again different sin is different pan is different so don't think that both are one and the same 
and then whatever documents you know we prepared and filed with roc those for incorporation those documents you need to preserve till the liquidation of the company so where to preserve sir where to preserve sir you know at one place that is none other than a registered office so preserve all the papers all the documents which you use for uh, getting incorporation certificate where at registered office how long sir you know period of maintenance period sir you know till the liquidation of the company next one next one sir you know everything is fine sir but after you know one month after incorporating a company yes we came to know that yeah we got certificate of incorporation by furnishing false information you know which is not true for example all the subscribers are minors ma all the subscribers of the company are minor however you know the person you know one of the person they he morphed all the other card uh, date of birth pan card date of birth he morphed somehow he used software and he morphed all the documents and you know he projected that all the subscribers are uh, having contractual capacity so to enter into a contract so this matter we came to know after one month of incorporation now what we can do sir very simple go and file an application with nclt go and file an application with nclt now nclt is having power to do anything so here the point is i furnished false information roc came to know that the whatever information i furnished is false you know during incorporation phase only roc came to know that i filed a false information now what roc will do roc will impose section 447 punishment on the persons who signed that declaration i told you right you know we need to furnish two declarations one is about compliance one is about uh, you know self declaration with respect to no offense we committed next one no breach of trust no guilty of fraud and then uh, you know whatever information we furnished is complete and correct that declaration who ever signed those people are going to get punishment under section 447 so if roc identify yes you know company is getting incorporated by false information he will stop incorporation and he will levy punishment on uh, the persons who signed the declaration but already company got incorporated sir you know roc roc upon roc verification roc thought that information is true and he issued certificate of incorporation later these minor children you know children are there no their parents came to roc and told that sir how can you give certificate of incorporation to an association who are having only minor persons sir please cancel it please cancel it now my point can roc cancel that certificate of incorporation no roc had power only to issue certificate cancellation of that certificate vest with nclt now any person any aggrieved party can file application with nclt here what nclt is going to do sir nclt is going to levy section 447 punishment on the persons who signed the declaration so that punishment is common and nclt is also going to punish company how sir how they are going to punish company so you can see here five points ma you know this question in what one attempt it came for five marks uh, if uh, i'm not if i'm not uh, uh, sorry i'm not sure but in november 2019 i guess november 2019 this five points were asked for five marks so state the powers of tribunal if company was incorporated by furnishing false information if company is incorporated by for, by false information then you know nclt will impose punishment on the persons who ever signed the declaration under section 447 and you know company you know how they are going to punish company they can modify moa aoa simply you know nclt may ask the the promoter come on change all the names of the subscribers change the details of the subscribers so modify moa oa or they may no sorry nclt may declare members liability as unlimited liability actually in company type of organization members liability is uh, limited but they will simply lift the corporate will now members liability you know it get converted from limited to unlimited or else nclt may ask roc roc this association not it started business so what is the need of liquidation simply you remove the name from the register simply strike of the name 
you just remove the name from the register suppose you know that company already did some business now nclt will order winding up of the company will order for winding up of the company in that case you know liquidator will come he will take assets of the company he will consider the liabilities and he will he will settle all those uh, issues so he will make affairs zero next one or he may pass you know nclt may pass such other order it may deem fit it may deem fit are you getting my point students removal of name is different winding up is different removal of name you know it is not a liquidation it is not a winding up it is simply you know just remove the name from register that means no one can think that that yes company came into picture company got dissolved it is not like that you know company didn't came into picture simply company didn't came into the picture whereas under winding up you know the world will know that company came into existence it did some operations later it got liquidated it got liquidated so in winding up you can see the birth of the company as well as death of the company whereas under removal of name you won't find company existence next one you know tribunal before passing any order it will give one opportunity of being heard it will ask the association why you committed this fraud why you committed this fraud you know it will ask you after collecting response from you only they will pass final order and before passing any order they will also consider the transactions which you entered during the uh, i mean during the uh, birth i mean uh, uh, company incorporation date and company order date simply nclt order date nclt order date so right from incorporation till nclt order whatever transactions you know company entered into they will consider all the transaction and they will give final judgment so my dear students with this incorporation procedure completed so first we studied who is a promoter and what are the documents to be filed with roc for getting certificate of incorporation and what happen if i furnish false information for getting certificate of incorporation so we covered these three areas so far next one moving on to one person company so what is one person company as we already discussed you know in one person company only one person can act as a member see it is also one type of private limited company whereas uh, you know number of members is restricted to one and who can act as a one person sir indian resident previously it is indian resident you know period of 182 days stay is very important but now it is not 182 120 is also sufficient if your period of stay in preceding financial year is 120 days then you can incorporate one person company in this year not only that condition second one you must be a natural person and you must be indian citizen indian citizen if you are able to satisfy these three conditions then you can incorporate one opc you know you can become member maximum in only in one opc if you want to become member in another opc you just liquidate this company you just liquidate this company and you know become member in another opc so at a time you can hold membership only in one opc so students let me let me let me ask you one more time what are the three conditions to be satisfied to incorporate one person company so first one indian citizen next one natural person third one residential status you know period of stay should be 120 days or more i repeat 120 days or more understood ma everyone okay fine next one sir when i should satisfy these conditions sir you should satisfy these three conditions at the time of incorporation of company as well as sub, um, as a uh, member after incorporation of the company that means you should satisfy these three conditions not only at the time of incorporation but also subsequent years but also subsequent you know whatever tenure you are acting as a member you should satisfy these conditions suppose you know one year i left india almost 365 days you know one complete year i'm in australia now disqualification gets attracted automatically there arises vacancy in the position of member vacancy in the position of member now the nominee will become member of the company and the nominee so became member now and the nominee so became member will appoint another person as nominee to this company listen carefully this point was tested two times 
in last uh, four attempts same point same point you know uh, one person started a one person company with a nominee n and n want to leave india n want to go to australia for higher studies so uh, that n is going to cancel indian citizenship and n is planning to get citizenship of uh, uh, some america now is there any disqualify is there any vacancy in the nomination clause yes there is a vacancy in nomination clause because the three conditions of residential status citizenship natural person you should satisfy not only at the time of incorporation but also subsequently while acting as a nominee while acting as a member in the company are you all getting my point students now you know these three qualifications these three conditions so along with member nominee should also satisfy both nominee and member should satisfy these three conditions and i already told you you know at a time you can become member in only one opc you can become nominee in only one opc but there is a there is an issue suppose in a opc mr a is the member and mr b is the nominee mr b is the nominee in b opc in b opc reverse b is the member a is the nominee allowed us sir allowed why because you know a at a time he is a member in one opc he is nominee in another another opc so there is no a uh, breach of number so it is within the permissible limit only right now one day a got deceased as a result b became member in aopc b became member in aopc now here if you observe member b is holding membership in two one person companies one is aopc the other one is bopc are you all getting my point students in this case 180 days uh, period is given to mr b either to continue with a liquidate b or continue with b liquidate aopc so 180 days uh, election period is given to such member now within 180 days he should take a decision whether to continue with uh, uh, his opc or with another opc understood ma next one prohibition on minor prohibition on minors you know minor cannot become member of the opc and minor cannot become nominee of uh, opc simply you know minor can't hold even single beneficial uh, interest in the company minor is not allowed to hold beneficial interest also so uh, member position as well as nominee position minor is strictly prohibited minor is strictly prohibited and you know this opc on member you found some uh, restrictions similarly on company also you can find uh, restrictions you can find restrictions so what are those restrictions it can do any lawful business except three activities one is charitable activities the main objective of opc is to promote commercial establishments so charity won't come under commercial purpose so opc is prohibited from charitable activities opc is prohibited from carrying nbfc activities opc is prohibited from investment activities so opc can't do these three activities one is investment the other one is nbfc the other one is uh, section 8 activities are you all getting my point students so next one next one this nomination clause you know there arises vacancy in nomination clause because of three reasons because of three reasons there may be a vacancy in nomination clause one is resignation by nominee second one is removal of nominee by member third one is disqualification disqualification either death or you know revocation of citizenship or you know uh residential uh i mean uh, residential status you know his period of stay uh came to below 120 days it fall below to 120 days so that is nothing but disqualification so because of these reasons there arises vacancy in the nomination clause i repeat what are those cases ma first one is you no know, resignation by nominee second one is uh, removal of nominee by member third one disqualifications in these cases within 15 days of vacancy a sole member should appoint another person as a nominee and within 30 days sole member has to communicate the same with the roc simply you know that company has to file forms with the roc with respect to change of nominee that's it so if you see moa 
in a OPC company, you will find seven clauses, not six. That seventh clause is all about nomination clause. Next one, next two concept is Section 8 company. You now, one more important concept you uh, alternative items. You now, this question is coming in Section 8 company. Just listen, there are three conditions if you want to incorporate or if you want to convert your company into Section 8 company or if you want to start Section 8 company, three conditions are must and should. One is objects should be you know commerce art science sport education research etc simply charitable activities religious activities charitable or religious activities and second one this company is prohibited from declaration and payment of dividend then whatever surplus is there you know that surplus should be invested in promoting the objects of company so that is the third condition so total three conditions my dear students one is you know object should be charitable or religious second one so prohibition on declaration and payment of dividend third one invest the surplus in promoting other objects of the company if you are able to satisfy these three conditions file a form with file an application with a roc so simply you know central government but power delegated to roc okay file an application with cg CG upon verification CG may grant license subject to some other conditions so you need to uh, give priority to these areas you need to give priority to this state like that you know they may levy additional conditions so once you get license register that license with ROC from that point onwards you will be treated as you know company with charitable objects simply section 8 company and these section 8 companies are allowed uh, to take you know CSR license in accounts of company you are going to get that point CS or corporate social responsibility and these section 8 companies are allowed to claim uh, section 12 AS certificate section 80 G certificate section 80 GG certificate from uh, sorry 80 G from income tax department you know commissioner of income tax will give these licenses to section 8 company in that case these companies are uh, not at all required to pay any tax to the government subject to the conditions okay that is entirely tax subject ma but come to our subject so here once you get license register that license with roc and you will be treated as licensed company or section 8 company you will get all the privileges like statutory all the privileges like uh, uh, com section uh, other companies other company but the point is here you had additional privileges here you had uh, additional uh, disadvantages being a section 8 company you are given some privileges and uh, you are given uh, some uh, uh, restrictions so privileges coming to the privileges even a partnership firm can become member of section 8 company they can acquire shares of the section 8 company in other companies firm is not allowed to become member because firm has no legal identity partnership firm is just a relation right so firms can become member under section 8 company and then you know uh, no need to constitute several committees like you know uh, nomination and remuneration committee shareholder relationship committee those committees are not applicable to section 8 companies and then one more advantage for calling general meeting normal cases 21 days notice is required but here 14 days notice is sufficient this is one more privilege but the main biggest uh, demerit is if company want to change its object clause simply if company wants to change MOA or AOA they need to take permission prior approval of central government without approval of central government they can't modify MOA AOA and sir is there any uh, possibility that can I convert you know section 8 company to other companies yes after taking members approval file an application with the central government if central government allows you then you can convert into other kind of companies simply you know from non-profit companies not for profit companies to profit companies so not for profit making companies to you know profit profit making companies but the point is at the time of such conversion whatever surplus you are having whatever assets you are having on the date of application those will be transferred to similar section 8 company understood so cg approval is must and should next one you know question number seven is very important revocation of license revocation of license so when revocation of license will take place three cases one is you violated section 8 conditions 
you distributed you distributed surplus in the form of dividends and you changed objects without permission of cg so section 8 you violated or you violated the conditions of central government or you 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 are doing some fraudulent activities or your affairs are fraudulently managed that means you know you are taking lump sum amount in through bank account and paying cash amount to the don donors simply you know you are involved in converting white money into black money or you are involved in converting black money into white money so simply if you are doing such kind of activities you know fraudulent activities then cg will give you one opportunity of being hurt simply it will give you notice later they are going to cancel your license then what is the consequence of revocation of license sir you know consequence of revocation of license here you will be amalgamated with similar section 8 company or you may be liquidated in the event of liquidation whatever surplus you are having whatever amount having in your bank account all those amounts shall be transferred to either insolvency and bankruptcy fund either insolvency and bankruptcy fund or to the similar section 8 company sir similar section 8 company means what a section 8 company which was engaged in similar activities similar activities means suppose you know i started a company with a object of sports sports and there is there are two section 8 companies one is engaged in a, a rural development the other one is engaged in sports now whatever surplus there in my company it will be transferred to it will be transferred to a section 8 company which is having sports objective that means in which activity i was incorporated you know showing which activity i was incorporated in that activity uh, you know in in the company which is having similar activity we are going to transfer the funds are you getting my point students so either uh, liquidate or amalgamate with similar section 8 company in case of liquidation surplus arising from such liquidation transfer to insolvency and bankruptcy fund or transfer to similar section 8 company but if you violate nclt order or if you violate section 8 conditions this is the maximum punishment to company it is 10 lakhs to 1 crore and to the directors and officers in default the punishment you know it ranges from 25000 to 25 lakhs so punishment you need to remember how sir you know revision multiple times revision you need to perform next uh, write about effect of registration this is similar to features of company ma or this is similar to characteristics of company once we get certificate of incorporation then what is the effect very simple separate legal entity body corporate contractual capacity it can acquire properties it can incur liabilities it can enter into the contracts so simply you can write the features of the company not that much important you can skip this one but give one time reading ma so that uh, uh, any practical question you uh, comes into the exam you can attempt it easily next one part 2 moa definition so part 2 moa and moa write about definition of memorandum and its uh, significance so if you read the entire definition of moa you will find this memorandum of association means memorandum of association so memorandum means memorandum of the company which was uh, originally framed at the time of incorporation you will find original moa at the time of incorporation and you will find altered moa or altered from time to time in pursuance of any previous company law or of this act so memorandum covers not only original moa but also altered moa there is a significance in framing definition like this you know the provisions which are applicable to memorandum you should comply not only at the time of drafting original moa you should also comply same provisions at the time of altering such moa that means both original moa and altered moa should be in according in, a, in accordance of the provisions of companies act 2013 that is the only significance of this definition nothing more than that but moa is a chartered document moa is a constitutional document right we natural persons we had our own constitution you know indian constitution uh, indian constitution 1950 right so in that constitution 
things were defined in a negative manner we can do anything except few things which were notified in the constitution you can do anything you can read you can stand you can walk you can talk you can sing anything but you can't kill another person you can't kick another person right similarly you know to a natural person you can find indian constitution and to the artificial person like company you can find moa but the uh, significance of moa is a company can do anything which is there in moa and a company is prohibited from doing anything which is not there in moa are you getting my point students so company can do any activity specified in moa and company is prohibited from doing any activity which is not specified in moa it helps two group of people one is investors the other one is the uh, outsiders so investors investors can assess the risk of their investment by reading moa so yes what a company can do what a company can't do you can find in object clause of memorandum of association right so so because of that activity what risk is involved how long company can do business how much profit company can earn so you can easily assess reading that document so investor point of view risk assessment outsider point of view contractual contract validity outsider point of view it is all about validity of the contract if an outsider enter into a contract you know enter into an agreement with company which is clearly outside the object clause purview then we call it as ultra virus transactions ultra virus acts in such a cases company is not liable to outsider that means who is going to bear that loss who is who is going to suffer outsider of course outsider will recover that thing from directors of the company keep it aside but company is not liable to the outsiders are you all getting my point students so here MOA serves two group of people. One is investors about their risk assessment, and the other one is outsiders about the contract validity. Next one, so MOA will have some six clauses, sometimes five clauses, sometimes seven clauses. If you are a company with share capital, you can see six clauses. If you are a one person company, you can find seven clauses. But if you are a company without share capital, and if you are not a one person company, then you can't see capital clause. there you can see only five clauses understood so it depends upon nature of the company but for the time being you know six clauses name registered office simply you know situation clause object clause and then uh, uh, capital clause association clause are you getting my point students liability clause so the six points you can see in memorandum of association starting with name clause so moa definitely moa first clause is name clause based on that name clause only certificate of incorporation will be given in certificate of incorporation you are going to have a name of the company so it is nothing but you know the name which you furnished in moa now the point is while selecting the name you need to comply the conditions which was specified under companies act as well as company incorporation rules 2014 so what are those restrictions sir you know your name should not be identical or resemble to the name of existing company because companies today they had identity only through its name so company is not a natural person if you if you see natural person you can identify them you can differentiate one natural person from another so two or three persons won't have same appearance right exceptional cases you know avoid them you know twins avoid them but i'm uh, telling you so we can dist we can dist we can differentiate natural persons but company we can make differentiation only through name that's why a unique name will be given you need to select unique name your name should not be identical with or resemble to the name of existing companies and it should not be undesirable in the opinion of central government so what is meant by undesirable very simple it should not be similar to the name of existing registered trademarks existing registered trademarks and it should not give any impression that company is some way connected with a you know government or local authority or any corporation which was connected to government so using such a phrases you know it creates some kind of impression some kind of uh, uh, impression in the mind of the people 
the readers they may think that this company is somewhere connected with the uh, government for example if i incorporate a company like this uh, andhra pradesh state capital developers limited andhra pradesh state capital developers limited now the reader or an outsider who is going through this company details they may think that this is linked with ap government you are getting my point so you should not use some words like you know uh, which create impression that company is connected with the government and then specific words not to use for example you know commission authority undertaking board federal republic president so all these names are strictly restricted if you want to use uh, these undesirable names file an application with cg if cg allows you if cg gives you permission you can use them or else strictly prohibited strictly prohibited so now the point is every year millions of companies getting incorporated or lakhs of companies getting incorporated now whatever name you are proposing is it available or not if available reserve the name now prepare moa aoa now file all these documents with roc now roc will issue certificate of incorporation so for preserving the name simply you know for reserving the name we are going to file an application so here the promoters of the company shall make an application uh, may make an application to roc for reservation of the name set out in the application as the name of the proposed company or name to which company proposes to change its name that means existing company it wants to change the name example satyam computers initially the name of the company is satyam limited later they changed the name to mahendra satyam mahendra satyam so existing company wants to change its name whether new name is available or not or sir myself you know an association not at incorporated we want to incorporate it under we want to incorporate under company sir in that case yes file an application for name of proposed company so this form who will use new company as well as existing company so previously it is form run reserve unique name but now you know practically it is a, a spice form simplified procedure for incorporating company electronically plus so spice plus is there so practically different book is different so for reserving the name file run sir reservation of name means what sir you know during this period so say for suppose you know that name is reserved to you for 20 days you are a new association you want a company you want to register a company in that case the name will be reserved for 20 days sir no sir i am existing company i want to change my name so i am filing this form for uh, whether proposed name is available or not if it is available it will be reserved for a period of 60 days now this 20 or 60 what it indicates sir you know during this 20 days or 60 days if some other association is filing an application for same name for similar name for identical name they are not going to get that name because it was already reserved to you so within 20 days or within 60 days you need to file remaining documents then only this name is allotted to you or else the reserved name shall be cancelled and it will be made available to the rest of the public next one cancelling name so when they will cancel the name sir no whatever information you furnished if it is false if it is not correct so after giving one opportunity of being heard they are going to cancel the name are you getting my point so if company has not yet incorporated then reserved name shall be cancelled now that name is available to the rest of public already incorporated sir now you know roc will ask the company to change its name change the name we are giving you time limit of three months change the name sir uh, one example sir uh you know my name is similar to the existing company in that case i need to furnish declaration or noc no objection certificate from the existing company if you see reliance group of companies reliance group of companies you can find word reliance uh, you know similarly to some 60 or 70 companies you can find reliance word is used by some 70 companies how because all those 70 companies are in a group so now i want to use the name reliance so for that i need to get no objection certificate from mukesh ambani 
so but what i did i forged the documents i morphed the documents i created documents uh, and i signed as if mukesh ambani sir now the point is now the point is forged documents i furnished and somehow the name got reserved company not at incorporated i repeat company not at incorporated now you know roc came to know that yes this document is fraud forged document now roc will cancel the name cancel the reserved name or suppose you know roc came to know that after incorporation of company you know after giving certificate roc came to know that now roc will give me time period of 3 months to change the name or else it will verify the affairs of the company if no business was started then it will remove the name simply you know striking the name of company sir business did sir some transactions i uh, company entered into sir now an roc will file application with nclt nclt will order winding up of the company so that's what i told you previously roc had no power to liquidate the company roc can issue certificate of incorporation but liquidation power lies with nclt and you know your name should satisfy this emblems and names act also so with this name clause completed next one is domicile clause so this is nothing but you know uh, state you need to furnish the name of the state name of the federal state federal state means uh, india as a whole we have a central government government of india and each and every state will have their own governments so that's what you know federalism means so the name of federal state is mentioned where the register office is to be situated so here we are not going to give complete address of the company here we are giving only the name of state here we are going to give only the name of state once we get certificate of incorporation we will file uh, electronic form inc 22 there we will we, are, we will mention complete address of the company that's what registered office address next one object clause so there is no restriction on object clause but you know two things you need to keep in mind your object clause should not be in violation of companies act 2013 your object clause should not be in violation of Companies Act 2013 and your object clause uh, should not carry fraudulent activities fraudulent activities simply Companies Act made some prohibition you know Companies Act prohibited OPC from doing uh, investment activities NBFC activities charitable activities now OPC MOA should not contain those clauses OPC MOA should not contain those clauses even though they are legal you should eliminate those clauses are you getting my point so it should be in accordance with the uh, company sec 2013 and it should not contain any fraudulent activities or you know any kind of you know uh, affairs which are opposed to public policy it should not contain any object which is opposed to public policy if you include them and if you get certificate of incorporation then also you can't you are not allowed to do such activities you are not allowed to do such activities right so next one anything you know if company is entering into any transaction which is beyond the powers of object clause beyond the powers of object clause simply we call it as ultra virus beyond the powers so ultra virus effect of ultra virus is void ab initio repeat the word void ab initio that means void from beginning if something is void from beginning you can't ratify it you can't ratify the activities which are void ab initio so ultra virus acts are simply void ab initio and you can't ratify them you can't ratify them understood ma but if any activity which is beyond the powers of directors i repeat beyond the powers of directors but within the powers of company then company can ratify it company can ratify it here you know ultra virus is of three types beyond the powers of companies act beyond the powers of uh, uh, let me write so ultra virus is beyond companies act one point beyond moa beyond aoa but within moa within moa this ultra virus as to companies act is illegal void as well as punishable ultra virus as to moa is simply void 
अल्ट्रा वायरस एस टू ये वो ये वैलिड इफ रैटिफाइड बाय मेंबर्स इन द जनरल मीटिंग इन द जनरल मीटिंग द मेन ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ अल्ट्रा वायरस इस टू प्रोटेक्ट स्टेक होल्डर फंड्स सी टुडे आवर मेंबर्स कंट्रीब्यूटेड मनी टू द कंपनी थिंकिंग दैट कंपनी विल डू ओनली वन बिजनेस यू नो ओनली वन एक्टिविटी व्हिच इज स्पेसिफाइड इन एमओए डायरेक्टर्स विदाउट देयर परमिशन इफ दे डू इफ दे डू सेकंड बिजनेस विद दिस फंड्स इफ दे डू अदर बिजनेस विद दिस फंड्स सो कंपनी इज नॉट लायबल कंपनी इज प्रोटेक्टेड दोस डायरेक्टर्स हु एंटर्ड बियॉन्ड एमओए ऑफ द कंपनी आर पनिशेबल so they need to return funds to the company in that manner investors funds will be protected stakeholder funds will be protected are you getting my point students and case studies you can refer ma just you just read it uh, you can easily get that information next one liability and capital clause liability and capital clause so this clause decides the liability of the members not company Company liability is always unlimited. This liability clause decides the liability of members. If it is limited by shares, then limited to the extent of unpaid value. Simply, you know, unpaid value multiplied by number of shares held by the person. Here, there is no concept of joint and several liability. That means, Mr. Y held some one thousand shares. Unpaid value two rupees, and Mr. B held ten thousand shares. Unpaid value simply two rupees. Now here A is liable to the extent of two thousand. B is liable to the extent of twenty thousand. Suppose if B fails to pay, A is not liable to B share. A is liable only with respect to H share of one thousand shares only. So no joint and several liability here. Only individual liability limited to the extent of unpaid value. And company limited by guarantee. Here also members liability is limited. now you know in case 1 limited by shares or case 2 limited by guarantee the members liability is subject to two, three amounts three amounts so here two people are liable for three amounts who are the two people present members and if present members fail to pay then list b contributories that means the persons who transferred shares within one year before commencement of liquidation list b contributories and they are liable for three amounts one is deficit portion so excess of debts over assets that deficit portion second liquidation expenses third one you know adjustment among members adjustment among members suppose few members they are holding fully paid shares some members they are holding 80% paid up and remaining persons they are holding 40% paid up you know they are holding three types of shares one is fully paid up second one is partly paid up third one is you know 10% paid up imagine now yes this person last person should bring money so that it will be adjusted among the contributories so these people are liable for three amounts three amounts one is deficit portion liquidation expenses and adjustment among the contributories next one share capital clause you know in capital clause you need to give three details one is authorized capital or nominal capital divided into number of shares face value divided into number of shares face value you need to furnish all these three details in the capital clause must simply disclosing you know authorized share capital 40 lakhs is not sufficient 40 lakhs divided into 4 lakh shares each share 10 rupees you need to give that information also are you all getting my point students next one subscription clause you know here you'll find the details of subscribers the persons who subscribed moa who subscribed moa you will find the details of those persons and then ma these are the tables you know we had five companies just write the companies in a list like first one limited by shares limited by shares next one limited by guarantee without share capital next one limited by guarantee with share capital unlimited company without share capital unlimited company with share capital so remember this order now with respect to moa with respect to moa just write the order like this so in schedule 1 we had 10 tables in first uh, uh, session only i told you we had total seven schedules 
in that schedule 3 is financial statements schedule 1 is a MOA AOA so write the order so A B C D E and then E F G H I J simply you know original order is F G H I J simply interchange these two interchange interchange you'll get the list you can easily remember limited by shares limited by guarantee without share capital limited by guarantee with share capital unlimited company without share capital unlimited company with the share capital so MOA tables A B C D E AOA tables F H G J I in this manner you can remember this next one so with this MOA we completed AOA articles of association so AOA is for internal governance I repeat AOA is for internal governance MOA it speaks about you know what a company can do what a company can't do but coming to AOA how the things can be done because company being an artificial person it can't do things on its own it definitely requires some human agency now the powers of human agency you will find in AOA the powers of director simply simply speaking what a director can do on behalf of company who is going to sign the contracts so in simple statement what is meant by AOA so AOA is for internal governance and if you ask me the definition of AOA simple similar to the MOA articles means articles as originally framed or as altered from time to time in pursuance of any previous company law or of this act that means simply if you put it in equation format articles of association equal to original articles plus altered articles that means both original as well as altered articles they both should comply the provisions of companies at 2013 next one ma so here the point is you can have own articles or you can have model articles that means you can copy the articles of table f uh, table simply you no know, table f you can copy it or you can have both own and model articles but MOA everything is own everything is own so a company should have own MOA whereas company can have model articles next one entrenchment of AOA so entrenchment simply for certain clauses alteration in AOA certain clauses alteration in AOA we need special resolution but if you are making you know however if you are making you know uh, sir not special resolution I need 90% approval I need 100% approval for altering some clauses that means you want to make entrench certain provisions we call it as entrenchment in simple word you know entrenchment means something very simple you want to make it complicate making something complicate is nothing but entrenchment if you ask me getting special resolution is easy are getting 90% approval easy so special resolution is easy because here you know three times votes in favor simply here votes in favor if it is greater than or equal to three times of votes against yes special resolution is said to be passed if votes in favor is exceeding three times you know, is exceeding or equal to three times of votes against then special resolution is said to be passed are you getting my point but you want 90% approval that means you know almost 90% uh, 90% approval only yes 90% approval required means it is more than 75% so this is nothing but entrenchment so entrenchment means making something more protective next one you can have these entrenchment provisions at the time of incorporation or subsequent to incorporation if you are a new company you know uh, you, are, you want to incorporate under 2013 act then you can have entrenchment provisions right at the time of incorporation only or sir uh, i forgot to entrench my aoa sir now you can entrench it how sir simply take members approval sir i am a private limited company sir how much approval is required sir in case of private company all the members consent is required sir myself public company sir just special resolution is required now after taking this approval entrench your AOA file these documents with the ROC ROC shall register the same 
so it is irrelevant where when you have uh, entrenchment provisions is irrelevant but whenever you are introducing entrenchment provisions you need to communicate with roc or else that entrenchment provision is not enforceable are you getting my point students entrenchment provisions are enforceable only when you give notice to roc and you had examples you can go through it forms of articles just now i told you you know table f to j how to remember i gave you note point next one doctrine of indoor management so just now we studied you know doctrine of uh, ultra virus a uh, company is protected company is not liable to the outsiders extension of doctrine of constructive notice sorry extension of doctrine of ultra virus if you see we had three doctrines doctrine of ultra virus continuation to ultra virus is doctrine of constructive notice and to this doctrine of constructive notice we had an exception that is nothing but doctrine of indoor management what this doctrine of ultra virus is telling you know uh, activities beyond the powers of moa company is not liable company is not liable to the outsiders company is not liable to the outsiders now outsiders are asking sir is there any obligation to read the uh, objects of moa yes there is an obligation that was you know dealt by doctrine of constructive notice constructive notice constructive deemed notice information the moment i file a piece of paper with roc it becomes public information it is available to all the persons in public simply by paying a prescribed fees nominal fees of some 100 rupees they can download those documents the main intention of filing information with roc is to make it public now every member should read those documents so doctrine of constructive notice makes an assumption that any person dealing with company is having knowledge of moa and aoa and further it is making a presumption that these people already understood those affairs of the company so similarly that means you know under ultra virus uh, company is protected similarly under constructive notice also company is protected outsiders are not protected outsiders to the outsiders company is not liable but this doctrine of indoor management is entirely exceptional case here here you know what uh, house of lords you know what judge is telling you know what uh, house of lord you know in this case study of royal british bank versus turken so the judgment was came like this the judgment was given like this as an outsiders he can make presumption with respect to internal proceedings sir internal proceedings means what you know resolutions members approval board resolutions everything internal affairs internal affairs you know an outsider can make an assumption with respect to internal affairs they have been conducted according to moa and aoa only so now if any internal proceeding went wrong you know outsiders outsiders company's liability with respect to outsiders is not at all uh, prohibited company is strictly liable so that means outsiders are protected company was made liable so under doctrine of indoor management the line the, the objective of the doctrine of indoor management is an outsider dealing with company can make presumption with respect to internal matters but this doctrine is uh, available only if two conditions are satisfied condition number 1 he should have knowledge of moa and aoa condition number 2 he should not have knowledge of irregularities knowledge of moa aoa he should knowledge of internal irregularity he should not have so if these two conditions are satisfied then he can take advantage of indoor management accordingly he will be protected company is liable to that person but to this indoor management we had exceptions to this indoor management we had exceptions my dear students i didn't remember the attempt i think it is may 19 may 2019 they asked a question like this define doctrine of indoor management and uh, list down the circumstances where constructive notice is applicable state the circumstances where constructive notice is applicable so the constructive notice is applicable to the situation where indoor management is not applicable see either indoor management will apply if indoor management is not applicable that means constructive notice is applicable 
तो एक्सेप्शंस टू इंडोर मैनेजमेंट इज नथिंग बट सर्कमस्टेंसेस अंडर कंस्ट्रक्टिव नोटिस so here we had three exceptions that is if you had knowledge of irregularity indoor management is not available how can you make a presumption that internal proceedings happened correctly because you know irregularity once you know fact you can't make assumption next negligent you are negligent you didn't inquired company documents and forgery forgery is entirely nullity as per indian penal code the effect of forgery is null and void nullity so in forgery cases also indoor management is not applicable understood my dear students so three doctrines once again i am repeating Const ultra virus extension to ultra virus is constructive notice exception to constructive notice is indoor management exception to indoor management is nothing but constructive notice getting it next one question number 13 moa aoa cannot override the act in section 4 and section 5 I clearly told you memorandum articles we need to prepare according to the act only act means company said if there is any point which is you know uh, which is not allowed under company set which is not allowed under company set for example in OPC I wrote a point that company can invest surplus funds in another body corporate actually companies act is not allowing but you still wrote it you still added it added it and uh, you know uh, you somehow managed and you got certificate of incorporation now sir can i invest in other body corporate no you can't invest in other body corporates sir that means that means if there is any inconsistency between you know company act company act and moa aoa any board resolution any members resolution members resolution or you know any agreement executed by company agreement executed by company so if there is any inconsistency between companies act and these five things always companies act will prevail always companies act will prevail you know companies act is supreme supreme only companies act is applicable understood and to the extent of such inconsistency it becomes void suppose in moa i i had some sorry in moa i had 100 points only one point is conflicting in nature now only that one point is void all remaining 99 points are uh, valid only 99 points are valid only are you all getting my point students next one write about effect of moa and aoa so effect of moa and aoa the moment company gets incorporated you know this moa aoa becomes contractual documents between company and members it is irrelevant whether you signed moa whether you signed aoa it is irrelevant the moment you become member of the company the moment company gets incorporated this moa and aoa becomes contractual document between these two persons that means company is bound by these provisions to members members are bound by these provisions to company that means if company make calls on shares suppose company make calls on shares members should pay that amount or else company can forfeit the shares of member because member violated provisions of moa aoa members breached the provisions of moa aoa now company will take action similarly company should spend all these monies only on the object specified in object clause of moa only object specified in moa suppose if company is deviating company uses company diverts these funds to some other purpose now member can bring injunction order against company member can stop company from entering into those activities so that means you know company is also bound to the members company should spend money only with respect to objects specified in moa or else you know members can take action against company because members will stand in aggrieved position company stands in default position so because of moa AOA, company is bound to members members are bound to the company but you know company is not bound to outsiders outsiders are not bound to company because moa AOA, these are the two contractual documents between company and members 
Are you all getting my point, students? So company liable to members, members liable to company, and members not liable to each other. Directly they are not liable, but with the help of company they can make liable each other. Students, is it clear, ma? So with this, you know, basic provisions of MOA, AOA completed. Now the next topic is alteration of MOA and AOA. Alteration of MOA and AOA. So what is meant by alteration? Simply amendment. That means modification. You know something we are adding, something we are deleting, or something we are replacing it. So this is nothing but alteration. Now coming to alteration of MOA. Original MOA. If you observe original MOA, it was signed by the members of the company. Technically speaking, subscribers. So subscribers of the company, the signed original MOA. And yes, this original MOA was filed with ROC. Upon issue of certificate of incorporation, this MOA will act as a contractual document between members and company, right? Now, something if you want to modify a contract, any term, any term in the contract, it requires mutual consent of the parties, right? Mutual consent of parties is required for modifying the contract. Here also, MOA is a contractual document between members and company. For making alteration, members approval is required. What kind of approval, sir? It depends upon case to case. Suppose, you know, voluntary modification like change in name clause, change in object clause, change in uh, uh, liability clause or change in object registered office clause. So for this, member special resolution is required. Whereas change in capital clause and compulsory change of name simply you know rectification of name in those cases ordinary resolution is sufficient so depending upon the case members approval is required for making alteration to MOA then once you get approval you need to amend a MOA so alter MOA this altered MOA will get effect only if you file it with a ROC because when you read the definition of MOA MOA means original MOA as well as altered MOA, right? So altered MOA will get effect only when it is registered with the ROC. So that's it. The procedure of alteration of MOA is completed. But in detail, we'll discuss now. So first one, you know, MOA, the reasons for alteration of MOA, you can observe. So there may be change in name of the company. So name might be changed because of uh, two reasons. One is, you know, change in ownership or management of the company next one change in constitution of the company for example private company to public company conversion of private to public conversion of public to private there you need to add word private in one case you need to delete private in another case right so name gets altered next one there may be a reason of rectification of name rectification of name so when you uh, copy the name of other company, when your name is uh, similar to the name of existing company, now ROC may issue three months notice to you. Within three months, you need to change the name. So that is nothing but rectification of name. And second reason for alteration of MOA is alteration of object clause. Yes, I want to do new business or I want to change my existing business. Uh, I want to upgrade my uh, technology. So by purchasing latest uh, uh, tech, uh, latest missions. So if my object clause permits, then I'll do it. If my object clause restrict me, prohibit me, then I'll make amendment to the object clause. Next one, alteration to registered office clause, registered office clause. Next one, alteration to capital clause, alteration to capital clause. There is an alteration to liability clause also, but that is not in our syllabus. And then association clause, we can't alter unless there is an order from central government because association clause it shows the persons who subscribed MOA even after 100 years or even after 200 years that means still the liquidation of company the association clause is not going to get changed even the people may die but the persons who subscribed MOA originally you can see only those people names so let's start the discussion of alteration of uh, name clause ma so yes change in ownership or management this is a, one of the reason why they change uh, name of the company like Satyam computers if you take originally Satyam limited next you know it got changed to Mahindra Satyam later they eliminate they removed word Satyam and they kept it as Mahindra of course it got merged with Tech Mahindra now you can see only Tech Mahindra company fine 
so alteration of name clause what is the procedure sir what is the procedure central government approval is required prior approval of central government is required why because whether the proposed name is available or not you need to file an application with central government of course power delegated to roc so you need to file an application with roc if the name if the proposed name is available it will be reserved for a period of 60 days so within 60 days what we need to do sir simply call for general meeting you know extraordinary general meeting take members consent by way of special resolution now alter moa and file this altered moa along with special resolution with roc now roc will change the old name and he will issue fresh certificate of incorporation with a new name and he will modify the same in his registers also but whenever you know there is a change in constitution of the company like private limited to public limited public limited to private limited in those cases central government prior approval is not required because that name is already available that name is already available understood suppose you know reliance industry limited reliance industry is available if they want to convert into reliance industry private limited they can easily convert for that you know no need of central government approval is required of course you know for conversion of public to private company i'm not speaking about name change i'm speaking about constitution you know public to private cg approval is required whereas private to public cg approval is not at all required next one in case of rectification in case of rectification listen carefully rectification yes here cg will issue an order to change the name of course roc will issue an order to change the name because of two reasons one is infringement of trademark that means unauthorized copy of trademark the other reason is you know other cases simply others that means your name is similar to the name of existing company uh, previously we had no centralized software like mca.gov.in so maybe possibility that one roc without knowledge of uh, availability of uh, names without uh, knowledge of uh, name of existing companies he might have issued certificate of incorporation but later he came to know that this company was already uh, available with this name so the name is already uh, reserved by some other entity now roc will issue us notice to the company to change the name of the company of course you know while reading you will get central government central government but in rules it was already delegated to roc fine so in these two cases you know in trademark case particularly speaking about trademark case the owner of registered trademark repeat owner of registered trademark shall file an application with central government within three years of incorporation of uh, that company so owner of registered trademark has to file application within three years with central government that's stating that sir my trademark got infringed some people without my permission they are using my name now central government will issue notice to that company come on change your name so we are giving you time of three months we are giving you time of three months originally it was six months but in amendment you know it got reduced to three months now company has to change the name within three months or else you know they will issue an order for a removal of name from the register or they may order for winding up of the company so within three months you know company by passing ordinary resolution what kind of resolution ordinary resolution company has to change its name even in other cases also you know central government will issue order to company you know three months order three months what is meant by three months order within three months company has to change its name by passing what kind of resolution sir ordinary resolution is sufficient ordinary resolution is sufficient fine so in this name you know rectification of name will be done but the point is in voluntary change of name in voluntary change of name the company should be regular in filing its annual returns should be regular in filing financial statements with roc and then it should be uh in our it, it it should make payments to the debenture holders deposit holders on timely basis simply speaking you know any company which has committed default in payment of uh, principal as well as principal or interest to debenture holders or deposits and you know non-filing not filing the returns annual returns financial statements with roc then that company is prohibited from changing its name of course if company rectify its uh, 
डिफॉल्ट डिफेक्ट देन कंपनी देन वेरी नेक्स्ट मिनिट इट कैन चेंज दी नेम बाई पासिंग स्पेशल रेजोल्यूशन सो माई डियर स्टूडेंट्स हियर द नेम विल बी चेंज बिकॉज ऑफ टू रीजन वन इज वॉलेंटरी चेंज द अदर वन इज रेक्टिफिकेशन ऑफ नेम सो रेक्टिफिकेशन ऑफ नेम अपियर्स इन टू सिचुएशन वन इज इन्फ्रिंजमेंट ऑफ ट्रेडमार्क द अदर वन इज अदर केसेस Uh, remember, my dear students, in one attempt there was a question that owner of registered trademark filed an application with CG after five years of incorporation of the company. Five years of incorporation of the company. Now, is there any obligation on company to change its name? No. Why? Registered owner trademark. You know, registered trademark owner should file an application, should file a petition with central government within three years of. incorporation of the entity with the name with the same name so since 3 years completed now owner can't take action against the company which copied the name of trademark are you all getting my point students so here it is not 6 months ma it is 3 uh, months next in voluntary change of name you should remember the defects so if company is defaulted with respect to filing returns with roc and with respect to payment payment of amounts to the debenture holders or deposit holders then that company is prohibited from changing the name of course if defects got rectified if defects get rectified then company is allowed to change its uh, name and you know in case of delay so company fine 1000 rupees for every day and every officer who is in default fine uh, minimum 5000 and maximum 1 lakh rupees understood my dear students so let me remind you one more point in case of change of name you know the company should use old name wherever you know it print a new name in brackets you know the former name so old name should appear for next two years simply speaking last two years whenever company change the name so it should be displayed along with new name so old name should be displayed along with the new name so that is all about alteration of name clause next one alteration of registered office alteration of registered office so here a registered office alteration is possible because of uh, uh, i mean it is uh, possible in four ways one is change in change of registered office within city next one change in city change in city no change in roc no change in roc jurisdiction next one change in city change in roc jurisdiction but no change in state no change in state and finally last one change in state that means you know shifting within the same city shifting between two cities you know shifting from one city to another city but no change in roc shifting from one city to another city change in roc but no change in state and shifting from one state to another state understood so if for the time being if you take jubilee hills to banjara hills first case second one change in city no change in roc take an example uh, bangalore to mang uh, uh, wait wait a moment so change in city no change in roc for example you know hyderabad to warangal next one change in city change in roc but no change in state so this is possible only with respect to two states ma that is tamil nadu and maharashtra in case of tamil nadu uh, chennai to coimbatore and in case of maharashtra mumbai to pune as well as vice versa pune to mumbai coimbatore to chennai change in state you know uh, maharashtra to karnataka example maharashtra to karnataka so these are the cases now let's begin the discussion you know in case one board approval is sufficient so for shifting of register office from one place to another place within the same city within the same city board resolution is sufficient and with this along with that you need to intimate the same with roc so roc filing within 30 days 
इन फॉर्म नंबर आई एन सी ट्वेंटी टू सो केस वन कंप्लीटेड बोर्ड रेजोल्यूशन प्लस आर ओ सी फाइलिंग सो दट इट यू नो शिफ्टिंग फ्रॉम वन प्लेस टू अनदर प्लेस विद इन दिटी कंप्लीटेड नेक्स्ट वन चेंज इन सिटी बट नो चेंज इन आर ओ सी चेंज इन सिटी बट नो चेंज इन आर ओ सी सो इन दिस केस यू नीड टू टेक अप्रूवल फ्रॉम बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स नॉट फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ शिफ्टिंग बट टू कॉल फॉर जनरल मीटिंग In that general meeting, members should give a special resolution. That means you need to obtain special resolution from the members. Now you need to file the same with ROC. Here two forms you need to file it with ROC. One is INC twenty two with respect to change in registered office. The other one is MGT fourteen with respect to copy of special resolution. So same, these two forms should be filed within thirty days of the event. within 30 days of the event so what is the procedure for shifting register office from one city to another city so take approval from board of directors for calling general meeting in general meeting take members approval what kind of approval we need special resolution and then file all these forms with roc so case 1 and case 2 very simple now there comes case 3 that is shifting from one roc jurisdiction to another roc jurisdiction but there is no change in state so here you know before shifting we had one roc after shifting we had another roc so we had two rocs two registrar of companies are involved so now you know you need to take permission from an a higher authority a person you know behind a person above roc so none other than regional director so listen carefully my dear students listen carefully so with this you will get a clarity on case 3 and case 4 company can shift from one roc to another roc so old roc new roc old roc new roc it can shift from one roc to another roc only if it get approval from regional director for that company is required to file an application with the regional director regional director so application should be filed with regional director along with application some five documents company has to file so then that is you know copy of board resolution copy of special resolution and then uh, declarations declaration declaration is with respect to no change in jurisdiction with respect to pending prosecutions no change in jurisdiction so with respect to pending prosecutions whatever the cases were filed against the company so with respect to previous you know old old pending cases there will be no change in jurisdiction old roc jurisdiction is applicable so at the time of hearing we will attend and another declaration is with respect to no pending dues so with respect to workman with respect to workman we paid all the amounts there is no pending dues and one more certificate from you know chief secretary of the state chief secretary of the state acknowledgement so because of shifting from one roc to another roc there would be no impact on workman no impact on workman are you all getting my point students so no impact on workman so these five documents you know company has to file it with regional director of course you know this declaration should be signed by kmp the managerial person should sign this declaration or you know two directors two directors kmp or two directors should sign this declaration so regional director after receiving application within 30 days within 30 days of application regional director will dispose that application either approving the shifting or rejecting the reject the shifting either approve or reject now company has to file regional director order file regional director order with old roc within 60 days of a regional director order now the old roc will issue certificate will issue certificate within 30 days of filing so certificate within 30 days of filing regional director order now the company you know it will go to the new premises you know which was uh, located in new roc jurisdiction the moment it go to new roc jurisdiction it has to file inc 22 within 30 days of shifting within 30 days of shifting company has to file inc 22 inc 22 within 30 days of shifting with new roc this is all about 
case 3 shifting from one roc to another roc and there is no change in state very simple procedure now for this you know students use it to read for uh, one hour one and a half hour but the case is very very simple understood next one case 4 my dear students case 4 so here you know company is shifting from one state to another state right that means maybe out of regional director purview at present we had seven regional directors north east west south and then northeast so northwest like that we had seven regional directors seven regional directors so here you know company for shifting from one state to another state here the application will be filed with central government of course in rules that power got delegated to regional director but in act it is central government so company has to file application with central government along with the application the aforesaid five documents are common aforesaid five documents are common but in addition you can see some more documents you know company has to file additional documents with cg that is altered MOA. so why sir why in case one case two case three there is no alteration of MOA because MOA contains only only name of the state in which it got incorporated in case one case two case three there is no change in state therefore there is no matter of alteration to MOA but coming to case four there is change in state that means MOA will be altered so altered MOA plus minutes minutes where special resolution was passed you know minutes of the meeting where special resolution was passed along with that creditors details creditors details and then copy of advertisement advertisement with respect to shifting advertisement with respect to shifting copy of advertisement all these documents company has to file with central government once central government get these documents it will pass an order within 60 days 60 days of applications regional director will pass an order but subject to creditors consent whether creditors are adequately discharged or not if not discharged whether they were properly secured finally whether they are properly consented that means you know they gave 100 percent consent if they're not giving consent come on repay those debts repay those debts so creditors consent is very much important in case four once central government issues order no of, of course power delegated to regional director so once order was received by the company now company has to file the order with a old roc as well as new roc within 30 days within 30 days of cg or rd you know i'll write cg as per act it is cg as per rules power delegated to rd so within 30 days company has to file central government order with uh, roc registrar of companies and old roc will give certificate certificate within 30 days of filing within 30 days of filing and company once it go to new premises in the new state so it has to file inc 22 with a new roc same time limit within 30 days and you know roc new roc will issue fresh certificate of incorporation because there is a change in name of the state understood so very very simple procedure so here also you know special resolution is required board resolution is required central government approval required in addition creditors approval is also required understood so this is the simple simplest form for remembering case 3 and case 4 uh, once again i am reminding you this is not full length lecture this is just a revision so that's what i am focusing only on important points are you all getting my point students i'm just focusing on important points so finally case 1 in case 1 board resolution is sufficient and roc filing roc filing so this is within state within city and within same roc within same roc within city in case two along with director's approval you need to take members approval special resolution and roc filing in case three that means change in roc board resolution special resolution 
regional director approval regional director approval and then roc filing and in case for board resolution special resolution cg approval cg will give approval only subject to creditors consent creditors consent and finally roc filing so very very simple so with this alteration of registered office clause completed next moving on to alteration of object clause change in object clause so here also the picture remains same where you find object clause in MOA what is an MOA it is a contractual document between company and members so whenever you want to modify a contract uh, contractual document it requires mutual consent of the parties so here company want to change its object clause company will request members to give the approval what kind of approval special resolution once you get special resolution amend the object clause file the altered MOA with ROC within uh, 30 days ROC will issue a certificate within 30 days of filing now you can start new business now you can start new business but you know extra point extra point is dissenting shareholders sir who are these dissenting shareholders you know the shareholders who are opposing the alteration we don't want the alteration so in that case you know the promoters or controlling shareholders both are same you know controlling shareholders will come under the promoters if you remember the promoters definition if you remember the promoters definition promoter is a person who has control over affairs of the company right as a member shareholder or you know as a director or otherwise so okay promoters or controlling shareholders will give exit offer to the dissenting shareholders according to the SEBI norms according to the SEBI norms so once dissenting shareholders become zero now you can start new business but this point you know the second point this is with respect to prospectus if you want to change the object stated in the prospectus how you issued prospectus you know you you issued prospectus to the public at a large you advertise the prospectus similarly alteration of object also requires advertisement in two newspapers so this point you can find in prospectus topic so once again i'm telling you alteration is valid only if it get registered with roc so the effect of original of uh, moa you'll find same effect uh, in altered moa only when it is registered with roc are you all getting my point students next one ma any alteration to moa you know in case of company without share capital company without share capital and if you want to alter MOA so that profits of a company can be distributed among non-members such alteration is void so company without share capital if members are interested in changing MOA so that you know non-members will get share in the profit share in the divisible profits of the company so such alteration shall be treated as void and next one alteration noted in every copy see you got one schedule from ICI exam schedule it's it is uh, uh, so they want to commence exam from November 1st onwards November 1st onwards and within one hour you got one more schedule so exams will be from November 2nd November 2nd you know one schedule it is telling November 1st another schedule it is telling uh, November 2nd November 2nd now if you had names like you know revise the schedule now easily you can uh, identify the revised schedule you can study according to the revised schedule are you getting my point on the revised timetable or on the revised schedule if you find word revised then you'll get a clarity okay original ignore revised so we'll stick on to the revised but imagine the two schedules they didn't have any word like original as well as revised for example so you can't find the word revised on the revised schedule now there arises a dilemma which schedule we need to go is it uh, which one is the uh, original which one is revised actually we should follow revised schedule but we can't find the word revised on the revised on the schedule then which one we need to follow are you getting my point students so simply simply if you ignore the word altered 
altered MOA in a in an altered MOA if you don't give if you don't disclose this is altered MOA then there arises a confusion among readers of the memorandum of association they may think that uh, this is this might be the latest one or this might be the original one so that's the reason so whenever you alter MOA whenever you alter AOA you need to disclose that this is an altered MOA you need to disclose that this is an altered AOA without disclosure of word alteration if you circulate any MOA any AOA then there is a punishment you know penalty 1000 rupees for every copy of circulated so 1000 rupees of every circulated copy understood my dear students next one so simply alteration to be noted next one alteration of AOA again the story remains same AOA is a contractual document between whom and whom company and members now if you want to modify AOA definitely mutual consent mutual uh, consent of the parties is required so company is requesting members so the company requesting members means on behalf of company board of directors are requesting members members so we want to change AOA because of these reasons originally you know underwriting commission we kept it as one person but we want to pay two percent then only underwriters are very interested in our uh, issue or else underwriters are not taking any kind of initiation so we want to increase underwriting commission or we want to issue uh, sweat equity shares for that AOA approval is required but AOA is silent with respect to such matters so because of many reasons you know board of directors on behalf of company will request members so we want to alter AOA so members should give their consent in the form of special resolution in the form of special resolution so members can members should give consent in the form of special resolution once company gets special resolution within 15 days they need to file altered AOA with a ROC and ROC shall register the same and they will issue certificate understood ma so within 15 days of alteration of AOA company has to file altered AOA with ROC so that's what you know procedure of alteration of articles you need special resolution and you know alteration to include conversion of companies alteration of AOA includes conversion of companies what is this sir see ma in my uh, in the previous video or some one uh, one and a half hour back video i clearly told you that how can we differentiate a private company and a public company i told you clearly so simply is open articles of association in AOA, if you find the word restricts transfer of shares limits number of members to 200 prohibits uh, invitation to public to subscribe the securities of a company if you find these three words it is a private company sir these three words i can't find sir then it is a public company if, if not available then it is a public company understood ma so sir myself private company i want to convert into public company sir now simply eliminate these three words erase these three words so eliminate these three words is nothing but alteration alteration to AOA alteration to AOA requires consent of members you know special resolution so this is nothing but alteration to AOA sir myself public company I want to convert into private sir then add these three words restricts limits prohibits the moment you add these three words to your AOA you'll become private company so addition deletion comes under alteration alteration requires two things one is members approval second one is ROC registration understood ma so alteration shall be valid only if it get registered with the ROC next one alteration to be noted in every copy or else you know fine of 1000 rupees 1000 rupees per copy you circulated without disclosure of what altered next one coming to the distribution of MOA and AOA to the members so at present you know we had MCA website on payment of 100 rupees you can download these documents but you know previously no we didn't have that website so if members want any of these documents you know MOA AOA copy of board resolution copy of special resolution or agreement executed by the company agreement executed by company any of these documents if member want to study if member want to study then such member can file an application with company 
so he may request company in writing along with prescribed fees he need to pay fees also simply request is not sufficient he need to pay fees so once company receive request in writing and fees then company should provide these documents provide these documents within 7 days or else company is going to get punishment within 7 days of request plus payment of fees i'm i'm writing both the words you know fees also important suppose simply member requested for the documents you know company didn't receive any amount now there is no obligation on company to provide these documents to the requested members understood so if you make any default you know for the delay period the fine is 1000 rupees maximum 1 lakh rupees max 1 lakh rupee 1000 per day during the delay period it is subject to the maximum punishment of 1 lakh rupee understood so you know uh, resolutions required in section 117 that's what you know board resolution and special resolution i wrote don't worry so in general meetings you you'll get this point you know section 117 clear next one write about registered office of the company i told you so the importance of registered office is just three words ma communication communication inspection and jurisdiction all the matters all the legal departments or members or any person if they want to communicate with company they will write letters to the address you know which address registered office address if anyone want to inspect the company records statutory records or members records then they will come to registered office and they can carry inspection activities if anyone had a dispute with company they can file a petition on company in a jurisdiction where registered office is situated so this is the importance of registered office so the address which you file with roc in inc 22 i used to call it as registered office address so every company after getting incorporated within 30 days they should have registered office and within same 30 days company should file the same the address with roc and this condition is applicable even when you change your registered office also suppose you want to shift from one premises to another premises after shifting within 30 days you need to communicate same with the regional uh, sorry registrar of companies understood and labeling of company you can go through these points not that much important just go through it once again uh, once again i am reminding you this is a revision lecture you won't get 100% uh, explanation but you'll get only revision of important important points so this revision lecture is helpful only if the student had completed at least two times of uh, uh, study so if you had read this company law corporate law at least two times then this revision lecture would be 100% helpful so without reading any concept don't uh, drag to the revision you know if you if you if you are a first time listener and first time reader when you go through the revision many doubts will come so don't do that at least complete two times reading a concept and then watch the revision lecture you will feel comfortable next ma shifting of register office also completed so with this alteration completed and we are left with miscellaneous topics and practical questions so only miscellaneous topics i'm going to cover that is commencement of business first one commencement of business so this is applicable only to the companies which are registered with paid up share capital which are having a share capital and you know this section is applicable with effect from 2nd november 2018 so company which is getting registered from 2nd november 2018 plus plus having share capital having share capital so any company satisfying these two conditions can start business can exercise borrowing powers borrowing powers listen carefully ma a company can exercise borrowing powers a company can start business only subject to two conditions two filings what are those two filings sir you know two filings with roc one is with respect to inc 20a the other one is with respect to registered office that is inc 22 
this INC 20A should be filed by board of directors. You know, they should declare that the subscribers of uh, memorandum of association, the subscribers of memorandum of association have deposited the promised amount. So at the time of incorporation, at the time of subscribing MOA, they promised that they will, they are going to take these many shares and they are going to pay this much amount for these many shares. So the promised amount was deposited and the proof is bank statement. You need to attach bank statement and you need to file INC 20A with ROC. The time limit is 180 days from incorporation. 180 days from incorporation. Within 180 days, you need to file these documents or else or else ROC may conduct physical inspection, physical inquiry. Upon physical inspection, if they come to know that company is not doing business, then they will remove the name from register. Or if company is doing business, now ROC will ask them to file the returns. If they file returns, you know, delayed for the delay period, they need to pay fine. How much, you know, company 50,000 rupees and company, you know, 50,000 rupees officer in default 1000 per day, maximum 1 lakh rupee. And this INC 20A should be certified by, you know, should be signed by two people. One is, you know, director on behalf of board. The other one is professional, practicing professional, CA or CMA or CS. So once again, I'm telling you the crux of this concept lies here only. The crux of the concept you can see here only. Company, if it is incorporated with effect from, you know, if it is incorporated on or after 2nd November 2018, with the share capital so that means you know old companies no need to follow this step and you know company without share capital no need to follow this step they can start business they can exercise borrowing powers only only when inc 20a and inc 22 got filed with the roc so what is the time limit for inc 22 as you all know within 30 days of incorporation they need to file INC 22 verification of registered office. Next one, ma, you know, in case of special entities, the company engaged in insurance, uh, stock exchange, banking sector, then they need to produce NOs, you know, objection certificate from the regulatory sectors, IRDA in case of insurance, SEBI in case of stock exchange, and then uh, uh, RBA, uh, sorry, banks in case of Banking Regulation Act, according to the Banking Regulation Act, they need to produce the NOC from Reserve Bank of India. Understood. Next conversion of companies already registered. Just now we had discussion. We, we had we discussed this point. So private to public, public to private, private to public, public to private. The procedure is same. You know, alteration of AOA. It begins with alteration of AOA for this special resolution is required. And you need to file these documents with ROC. The procedure is same. But when you are converting public company to private company, additional approval, you know, central government approval is required. You need to file central government approval with the ROC. That is the only extra step. The rest of the procedure is same. So board resolution for calling general meeting. General meeting, you know, members need to give approval by special resolution. Then alter AOA, file all these documents with ROC. ROC upon verification, it will issue fresh certificate of incorporation. So the moment you get certificate of incorporation, your name gets, sorry, your constitution gets changed. But remember, my dear students, because of change in constitution, there is no change in existing obligations. So before conversion, whatever debts you had, whatever obligations you had, the same debts, same obligations will be carried next also, you know, after cons after change in constitution also, the same obligations, the same liabilities will hmm, applicable. Same obligations continued. Next one, subsidiary companies prohibited to hold shares in holding company. Yes. The moment you know one company becomes subsidiary to another company, the moment one company becomes subsidiary to another company, it is prohibited from acquiring shares of holding company. So simply speaking, subsidiary cannot become member of holding company. Any allotment of shares to subsidiary companies void ab initio. 
void ab initio any allotment of shares to the subsidiary company no by holding companies void ab initio so s limited should not acquire any shares of h limited and h limited should not allot shares to s limited but we had three exceptions you need to remember these three exceptions in past you know two to three times questions were asked from this concept questions came on this concept s limited can hold the shares of h limited in three cases one is as a legal representative as a legal representative the other one is as a trustee and third one subsidiary company acquired shares before becoming subsidiary you know before becoming subsidiary so carefully listen carefully listen so subsidiary cannot acquire shares of holding company and holding company should not allot shares in the name of subsidiary company but subsidiary company can continue to hold these shares if it is holding shares as a legal representative on behalf of you know deceased person or as a trustee or suppose you know before becoming subsidiary before becoming subsidiary subsidiary acquired shares of holding company for example subsidiary took 10% of h limited shares on 1st january 2022 later h limited acquired 65% of share capital of h limited this happened on 31st march 2022 that means holding subsidiary relation came into the picture you know after h yes limited got shares of h limited in that case in that case it can continue to hold such shares there is no problem but the only point is with respect to this third point they had no voting power with respect to one and two cases subsidiaries continue to vote in the holding company general meetings understood and in recent exams there is a question that can uh, yes limited acquire 10% of share capital of h limited before it becomes subsidiary after one year h limited got 65% share capital of s limited and s limited became subsidiary to h limited is there any obligation on s limited to surrender 10% shares to the company no there is no obligation it can continue to hold such shares and h limited allotted bonus shares h limited allotted bonus shares to all its members as a result s limited also got some extra shares is that issue of bonus shares valid or not valid the answer is valid because because of bonus issue there is no change in percentage of holding additional share is given at free of cost based on your previous holdings right so because of getting bonus shares there is no change in percentage of holding by s limited in h limited you are getting my point students you can go through that uh, that question you know it was somewhere uh, it was asked in 2020 uh 2020 if i'm not wrong the same question came in the exam in 2020 exam uh, 2020 only so go through that paper you will get a clarity so only three points you need to remember general rule subsidiary should not hold shares of holding company exception in three cases it can continue to hold the shares as a legal representative as a trustee and acquired shares before becoming subsidiary out of three cases you know in first two cases voting is allowed last case voting is not allowed and you know allotment of bonus shares in the name of a subsidiary company is not prohibited so that's it ma and then you know serving of documents you can go through it the, the if company want to serve documents to the members or if anyone want to write a, a letter to the company then you know preferable modes registered post speed post courier and then leaving it at a registered office or electronic mode you just go through the question not that much important next one authentication of documents authentication of documents as you all know company an artificial person how it can sign the contractual deeds how it can sign contractual documents it is not possible so on behalf of company either kmp key managerial personnel or officer or employee authorized by board authorized by board will sign so that you know company stands in the stands as a party in the contract so 
listen carefully there is a contract between company and supplier now supplier will sign the document supplier will sign the document now you know on behalf of company who can sign this document sir kmp or you know any officer or employee of the company but he should be authorized by board sir how such authorization will come sir you know that thing you can read in question number 24 but who comes under KMP sir, you know CEO, managing director, manager, company secretary, whole time director, CFO and any officer, remember carefully, any officer below the board of directors and level below the board of directors immediately next level and he should be in full time employment, full time employment, full time employee. These two conditions are satisfied. Now board may designate, no board may uh, give KMP designation to such officer, to such officer, immediate level next to the directors and he should be in full time employment and such other officer as may be prescribed. But you know, an employee or officer of the company, he will get authority only through a paper signed under common seal. If company is having common seal, you know, yes, that authority, power of attorney document should have common seal and it should be signed by the persons, you know, in whose presence the common seal was affixed, the people will sign it. If there is no common seal, then two people should sign the authority letter. One is, you know, director, two directors. If company is having a secretary, then one director and one secretary should sign the letter of, other, I mean, authorization letter or power of attorney document, whatever you may call whatever you may call it. but the point is you know company can give power to a single officer or employee to execute documents to execute negotiable instruments only if such officer or employee gets that power through a power of attorney document it should have common seal if common seal is there if there is no common seal then two directors should sign this letter if company is having secretary then one director plus one secretary signing this letter is sufficient now this employee or officer will get power to execute any document on behalf of company accordingly company is liable to the other party so with this ma total incorporation of company and matters incidental there too chapter we completed revision understood So one more pending topic that is dividends. So with respect to dividends, many students will have so many doubts. So I'm going to clarify with, I mean, I'm going to explain this topic in such a way that you will never get any further doubt with respect to the topic dividend. First, we'll discuss the notes which I am using here and then we will do a line by line reading in the material, ICA study material related to dividends topic. So first of all, the provisions that are dealing with dividend under company law are from 123 to 127. 123 section talks about declaration of final and interim dividend. It has totally six subsections, not six, seven subsections including penalty provisions, seven subsections. Then 124 unpaid dividend account concept 125 investor education protection fund concept 126 share transfer not registered like transfer of instrument of transfer of share is received by the company okay but company have not registered in such a case what such dividend what dividend on such shares the company has to do so that one 127 what if the company declared dividend but failed to repay i mean failed to pay within 30 days fine all that we are going to discuss before that by the way one more thing for this particular topic until we finish this video please if possible try to maintain running notes please try to maintain running notes whatever the point I'm going to explain please maintain running notes if possible of course we are going to discuss it from the study material Typically speaking, you need not have a running notes, but have it because no, I'm using notes. I'm going to explain you directly from the notes first in this lecture. In the next lecture, I'm going to do from the study material. I see a study material. Fine. So there are some key points which 
which we need to understand as an overall outline relating to dividend. Some outlines that we need to understand. I'm not I'm not discussing 123, 124, 125, like sections have not yet started. I'm just talking about few certain outlines. So what is the first outline? Dividend declared, dividend declared shall be paid within 30 days of declaration. Once a company declared dividend, within next 30 days, the company shall pay the dividend to the shareholder. Shall pay it. Otherwise, 18% per annum interest shall be paid by the company to the shareholder. 18% simple interest shall be paid per annum. Like suppose within 30 days the company has to pay, right? From 31st day onwards, interest we have to add. Suppose if the company paid dividend on 60th day to the shareholder from date of declaration, for 30 days, 18% per annum interest, nothing but 1.5% per month on the dividend amount the company has to pay. Suppose, sir, within 30 days, the company did not pay, sir. The company did not pay within 30 days. 31st day onwards, 18% per annum interest will apply. Yes, I agree. In addition to that, since the company declared dividend and within 30 days it is not paid, within 7 days from 30th day after, within 7 days from the end of 30th day, whatever dividend which the company did not pay, that is called as unpaid dividend, unpaid dividend. It shall be transferred within 7 days from expiry of 30 days. The company, whatever unpaid dividend is there, within 7 days from the end of 30 days time limit. Okay, the unpaid dividend if at all there, as on 31st, 31st day, if any unpaid dividend is there, within 37th day, 37th day or nothing but 7 days from the end of 30 days, the company shall transfer that unpaid dividend to another bank account to another bank account that bank account shall be called as so and so company unpaid dividend account company abc private limited unpaid dividend account bcd private limited unpaid dividend account like, like that there will be a bank account will be opened with a scheduled bank okay so unpaid dividend account so in that account the company shall deposit unpaid dividend first of all the company will declare a dividend right company where the dividend amount will be with the company once dividend is declared, once dividend is declared, please transfer that entire amount of dividend declared to a separate bank account, declared dividend account. Generally, it is called as declared dividend account, declared dividend account or dividend bank account within five days. Within five days. Now, you see here, you see here, suppose let us assume 1st uh, September 2021 company declared a dividend of let us assume 50,000 rupees 50,000 rupees what is the due date 30th September 2021 the company shall pay suppose as on 1st October 2021 the company still has 30,000 rupees which is not paid by 7th October 2021, this 30,000 rupees shall be paid to unpaid dividend account. It shall be transferred to unpaid dividend account. Before all this, by 5th September 2021 itself, whatever 50,000 rupees dividend declared, it should be kept in separate bank account. By 30th September, from that bank account, transfer it to shareholder bank account. Okay, if at all you couldn't transfer, as on 1st October, how much is unpaid? 30,000. Transfer it to unpaid dividend account within 7 days. Sir, what will happen if I did not transfer within 7 days? Within 7 days, I did not transfer to unpaid dividend account also. In such a case, from 8th October onwards, on 30,000 rupees, what is the unpaid dividend? 30,000. On 30,000 rupees, 12% per annum interest will be there. Sir, just now you said 18%. Remember, here, see, there are two interest. One is 18% interest is there. Another one is 12% interest is there. A company, once dividend is declared, within 30 days, company shall pay to shareholder. Right? Yes. Suppose if the company did not pay within 30 days, 
company later somewhere 70th day 90th day 100th day they are paying to the shareholder what is the amount of dividend declared plus 18 percent on the in on the amount from 31st day you have to calculate okay till the date of actual payment to the shareholder 18 percent per annum rate rate of interest you have to, and pay that entire amount to the shareholder at the time of payment here 12 percent interest i am talking about late delay in transferring to unpaid dividend see there is a delay in payment to the shareholder to delay in transferring unpaid dividend to unpaid dividend account so 12 percent per annum is the rate of interest applicable for delay of unpaid dividend to be transferred to unpaid dividend account a separate bank account in a scheduled bank so 12 percent is rate of interest so let us assume so 30,000 company have not paid no this has to be transferred to unpaid dividend account by 7th October but company did not transfer originally company declared 50,000 no it is kept in one bank account rate right within five days in the same bank account 30,000 still lying after 7th October also it is still lying later after 10 15 days company realized are, are, we forgot to transfer to unpaid account now the company is paying to unpaid dividend 10 days there is a delay for that 10 days 12 percent per annum interest please calculate that amount that amount plus unpaid dividend together transfer to unpaid dividend account sir okay sir this 12 percent for 10 days let us assume some thousand rupees came sir unpaid dividend interest on interest on delayed transfer to unpaid dividend account that interest what the company has to do sir should it be paid to register of companies as a penalty no that interest also that 12 percent interest also shall be paid to shareholders only shall be paid to shareholders only which means a shareholder is receiving two types of interest let us assume whatever dividend declared 30,000 rupees whatever dividend declared is one interest 30,000 I will I will show you a calculation a simple calculation I will show you 30,000 rupees 30,000 rupees so it has to be paid by 30th September 2021 but let us assume company paid to shareholder on 2021 30th November ultimately so 30,000 is principal amount of dividend rest or no what is the interest under section 127 for late payment 18% per annum for two months 18% per annum for two months let us assume 1500 rupees 1500 rupees per month let us assume for the sake of convenience let us assume 1500 1500 one month 1500 another one 1500 total 33,000 until now now actually as on 30th September it has to be paid but company did not pay 7th October or before the company shall transfer to unpaid dividend account that is also not done on this 30,000 let us assume company transferred to unpaid dividend account on 30th October 2021 almost some 24 days delay for these 24 days 12 percent per annum interest is calculated let us assume some 700 rupees came so company has to transfer 30,000 rupees plus 700 totally 30,700 rupees to unpaid dividend account okay the company 700 rupees interest incurred which is calculated at 12 percent okay for late late transfer to unpaid dividend bank account for late transfer total 30,700 uh, in, in addition to 37 30,700 interest on late payment some 3,300 total shareholder will get sorry 3000 total shareholder will get 33700 finally finally the shareholder will get how much 33700 sir original shareholder is liable to receive only 30000 no yes correct for late received for late receiving 3000 interest which is calculated at 18% further company did a small delay for transferring to unpaid dividend account for that delay also company is liable to add interest at 12 percent 700 total amount company shall distribute to shareholder for whom the dividend is not paid so that's how it is calculated 18 percent and 12 percent both sir it is duplication no of course let it be 
12% is for late transfer to unpaid dividend account. 18% is for late settlement to the shareholder. That's it. Please be clear. For late payment to shareholder, 18%. For late transfer, a smaller offense, just a transfer. My bank account only. That is my bank account. This is my bank account. Just for late transfer, 12% rate of interest. Further, further, Just a minute. Further, <clears throat> so delay in transfer to unpaid dividend account. What is the rate of interest? 12%. Don't worry. I will connect it. I will connect each and everything when I'm once again when I'm explaining the provision. Further, sir, I transfer to unpaid dividend account, sir. Finally, the amount is lying in unpaid dividend account, sir. You know, seven years over. It has transferred in 2021, sir. Somewhere in the 15th October, we transferred. October 2028 also crossed. October 2028, seven consecutive years, that amount is still lying there only. Shareholder did not came back and asked me within these seven years what the company has to do. Please transfer that amount, whatever amount lying in unpaid dividend account. The so much of amount, so much of amount lying for past seven years shall be transferred to a special account called Investor Education Protection Fund, which is constituted by SEBI. So that, that money, so that money, whatever is there in Investor Education Protection Fund, no, what SEBI will do, you know. If shareholder comes after seven years to SEBI and put an application, dear SEBI, I want money, no, I forgot to claim all these years, I was in coma, SEBI will refund. Or SEBI will use it for investor awareness, advertisement, campaigns, all that. Further, unpaid dividend, whatever unpaid dividend is there, no, which is transferred to unpaid dividend account, no, within seven days. Or after seven days, along with 12% interest. Whatever is there in unpaid dividend, no. Within 90 days from the date of transfer to unpaid dividend account, within 90 days from the date of transfer to unpaid dividend account, shareholder wise, what is the amount of dividend? How much amount is liable? Okay, shareholder name, his address. Okay, it shall be published on the website of the company or such other website which MCA prescribes. These are the broad overview, broad overview about each and every point, whatever we covered in this, I will once again cover in depth in the provisions. Okay, so first, I hope right now you understood as a whole, what, what is that you understood? Once company declared dividend within five days, first keep the dividend in separate bank account. Okay. From that bank account, within 30 days from original declaration date, pay to the shareholder. Happy over. Suppose if it is not paid, 31st day onwards, shareholder will have an interest. Shareholder will get a right to receive interest. 18% per annum until he actually received. Okay. Company within 30 days not paid. Now it is called as unpaid dividend. As on 31st day, it is called as unpaid dividend. On unpaid dividend, shareholder will get 18% interest. That's okay, fine. What company has to do this unpaid dividend? Transfer it to separate bank account called unpaid dividend bank account. Unpaid dividend account. Okay. Within what time? 7 days only. Within 7 days after 30 days, you have to transfer to unpaid dividend. What if I didn't transfer? Again, you have to pay interest at 12% per annum on the amount which is not transferred on the amount which is not transferred to unpaid dividend. And whatever the interest that is being added at 12%, that is also to be credited to unpaid dividend account, which will give, which will be given to shareholder proportionately. Okay, it is there in unpaid dividend account. It is there for seven years like that. Shareholder did not come and ask the money. We are also unable to trace his bank details, all that. It is there like that seven years. Transfer it to Investor Education Protection Fund. First, you transfer to unpaid dividend. Right? Do one thing. Within 90 days, publish all the details in the company website and such other website. First, publish all the shareholders' details within 90 days. Okay, published. Wait for 7 years. Okay, waited. Still nobody came. Nobody came. Transfer to IEPF. That's the overall outline of days, dates, interest, all that. And now, we'll discuss the provisions related to sorry, a dividend. Provisions related to dividend. The main provision is section 123, declaration of dividend. The main provision is section 123. Just a minute. 
123 okay it has only uh, six uh, subsections so what are they first one sources for dividend see there are two types of dividend first of all understand subsection one talks about talks about final dividend just a minute subsection one talks about final dividend subsection three talks about interim dividend whereas subsection one talks about final dividend there are two dividends one is final dividend another one is interim dividend whether it is interim dividend or final dividend it is who will decide this dividend amount board of directors if board of directors declared a dividend it will be approved by shareholders in the company uh, sorry AGM so once it is approved in the AGM or if any dividend is specifically declared in AGM if any dividend board recommends the dividend and shareholders will declare the dividend in AGM approve it in the AGM generally dividend is declared in AGM only board will approve it board will recommend it generally it is declared in AGM generally by default every dividend is a final dividend suppose if the board of directors only declared a dividend before AGM the AGM has not yet come before AGM during the financial year board of directors only declared the dividend okay it is subject to approval from shareholders in the general meeting later ratification will be there board of directors not on the AGM they only recommended they only declared then the dividend is called as interim dividend very simple most most simple definition for interim dividend is any dividend declared by the board of directors between two AGM dates it's an interim dividend very simple fine so so how what are the provisions relating to declaration of dividend if at all a company want to declare dividend first of all it should have money for declaration right so what is the sources for dividend there are two sources one is profits of the company calculated after providing depreciation profits of the company after providing depreciation which profits is sir is it current year profit or previous years profit previous years profit is called as accumulated profits a previous years profit is called as accumulated profits a company can declare dividend out of current year profits happily sir i don't have current year profits don't worry you have accumulated profits declare it or that is one source don't worry still we have so much discussion on profits of the company or second source any funds provided by central government or state government in pursuance of due to a guarantee given by them this company was given a guarantee by central government state government the shareholders were given guarantee by the central and state government uh, so because of the guarantee government now released funds with to the company now the company can pay dividend out of these funds given by central and state which is a very exceptional scenario so there is no much discussion about funds given by central now the discussion is all about profits of the company this is most important discussion now by the way company can declare dividend out of profits of the financial year or the previous years or funds given by central government or state government okay government simply sir company want to declare dividend out of profits of the company Pro provision one there is a provision to 123 subsection one what it says unrealized profits revaluation reserves any other type of reserves except free reserve shall be ignored only free reserve is considered accumulated profits means only free reserves not every reserves and surplus only free reserves free reserves are that reserves which is available for distribution of dividend capital reserve revaluation reserve statutory reserve these are all not available for declaration of dividend securities premium account these are all not these cannot be considered as an amount available for dividend this shall not be considered only free reserves current year profit you have okay declare from that you don't have current year profit previous year profit you have okay declare from that provided please any depreciation if it is there calculate depreciation as per schedule 2 calculate depreciation as per schedule 2 rates eliminate that reduce that from the profits reduce even tax also profit after tax okay profit before depreciation 
minus depreciation, profit before tax, minus tax, then you will find a picture no number called profit after tax. If that is positive, declare from that. Sir, I don't have profit after tax, sir. Current year is losses. Can I declare it from previous year accumulated losses? Yes, you can declare accumulated losses. Yes, you can declare out of accumulated losses. Provided, provided, one provision says, dividend shall be declared only after set off of previous year losses and depreciation. Dividend. What it says is simply, what it says is simply, calculate current year profit. Suppose if it is negative. Okay. What is the previous year profit? Suppose if it is positive. Total it. Then you will get some picture. If it is positive, if it is positive, you can declare. If it is positive, you can declare. Sir, accumulated profits also not their negative. Sir, do you have any free reserves additionally? Yes, sir, I have a free reserve positive. Yes, sir, I have a free reserve positive. Okay, if the ultimate figure is positive after adjusting with the free reserve, then declare. Sir, I don't have accumulated profit. I don't have current year profit. No current year profit, no accumulated profit. Zero, reserves are zero. Reserves are negative in fact. Can I pay dividend? Impossible. You can't pay dividend. You cannot pay the dividend. If you have a negative reserves and surplus, ultimately you cannot pay dividend. If I don't have current year profit, okay, I can pay out of last year profit. Last year also I don't have profit losses. Okay, see balance sheet free reserves. Do you have any other free reserve? No, I don't have. Ultimately, negative picture, you can't declare dividend. Logically speaking, you can't declare a dividend. Further, why I said you can't declare dividend, I'll come to that. Proviso 2, Proviso 2, this is the most important thing. Proviso 2, dividend in case of insufficient profits in current year. What is the, what is the procedure to be followed? What is the procedure to be followed? If, if at all, in the current year, the profits are insufficient. Just a minute. Yes. Provision 2, 123, subsection 1. What this provision says, you know? What this provision says, you know? In case of inadequate profit or no profits at all, the company want to declare some amount, some 10 lakhs, but the profits are less than 10 lakhs or there are no profits, losses. Then dividend can be declared out of accumulated profits, nothing but previous year profits and any free reserve if available, general reserve like that. Four conditions the company has to satisfy. The company has to satisfy four conditions. What are they? Suppose if the company do not have profits. See, if the company has a previous year profits are there, current year also profits, excellent. Whatever the profits are there, declare that much. There is no limit on rate of dividend. You can declare whatever you want. Suppose I don't have profits, inadequate profits. I want to declare dividend, but my profits are not sufficient. Suppose my current year profit is 10 lakh, but in current year, I want to declare dividend of 20 lakhs. This is profit after tax. I want to declare dividend, but my profits are not adequate. In such a case, you can declare the additional amount of 10 lakhs, additional amount of 10 lakhs out of last year profits plus free reserves. You can use last year profits and free reserves subject to two, four conditions. Subject to two, four conditions. If you do not have current year profits or your profits are not enough to pay dividend. See, suppose you are having 5 lakhs profit. You want to pay 5 lakhs dividend. No problem. You have 5 lakhs profit, but you want to pay dividend more than 5 lakhs. Then this provision will apply. Then this provision will apply. Then these four conditions will apply. Condition number one. You want to declare rate of dividend. You want to declare some at, at some rate, some percentage, you know, as a percentage of face value, some amount. See, 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs, whatever the amount of dividend, it is arrived by calculating rate of dividend on the face value. That rate of dividend shall not exceed, shall be less than or equal to 3 years average rate of dividend declared. 3 years average rate of dividend declared preceding previous years. Preceding financial years, okay? ignore current year. Last three years, sir, the last three, third year, fourth, uh, I mean, 
third year second year first year last year just last year i declared just last year i declared 12 percent sir that before year i declared 14 percent sir that before i declared 16 percent sir what is the average rate 30 plus 42 16 plus 14 30 plus 42 42 by 3 14 percent is the average now in current year you can't declare beyond 14 percent why in current year you don't have profits or you're having profit but you want to declare more than that in such a case take last three years rate of dividend by three average it that much only maximum you can declare that is one condition condition number two calculate the amount of dividend calculate the amount of dividend accumulated profits were there no you are drawing no from the accumulated profits calculate the amount of dividend drawing from accumulated profits how much amount of dividend ah car total 20 lakhs dividends sir current year is 10 lakhs sir. so additional 10 lakhs i should draw from last year accumulated profits and reserves sir how much is the original amount 10 lakhs sir. that 10 lakhs amount to no, know should be less than or equal to one tenth of the paid up capital plus free reserves sir. that additional 10 lakhs shall be less than one tenth of the paid up capital plus free reserves sir. and whatever amount you drawn from the accumulated profits and how much 10 lakhs sir. first utilize for set off of losses and then declare dividend on equity shares 10 lakhs I drawn. If I have any accumulated losses, first I should set off. If I have current year loss, I should set off. If I have previous year pending losses, I should set off. Okay. Logically speaking, this, this condition 3 is not a big deal. Big deal. Because accumulated profits means where is the question of losses? Next. Balance of reserves. I withdrawn from reserves and accumulated profits at 10 lakhs, right? Current year profit 10 lakhs. I declare 20 lakhs dividend. 10 lakhs set off against current year. 10 lakhs I drawn from last year profits. No, I drawn from accumulated profits. After drawing the 10 lakhs, still I have some reserves, no free reserves and accumulated profits. That shall not, that shall not fall below 15% of the paid up capital. It shall not fall below 15% of the paid up capital. Four conditions. Very look very simple. Current year, I have a profit after tax 10 lakhs. I want to declare a dividend of 20 uh, lakhs. Amount is 20 lakhs. Rate is 15%, 20%, 30%, some rate I decided. But amount I want to declare is 20 lakhs. I want to declare 20 lakhs, but my current year profits are 10, 10 lakhs. I inadequate profit. Now what should I do? Previous year, accumulated profits are approximately 1 crore I have. Due to Corona, this time the profit was low. But last year I have accumulated free reserves 1 crore. Now, out of 20, 10 lakhs I will use current year profit. Additional 10 lakh I will pay out of last year my 1 crore. Okay, pay. 4 conditions. Condition 1. How you calculated 20 lakhs profit, 20 lakhs dividend by using 18% rate? By using 18% rate of dividend. Oh, you, oh, uh, let us say, so by using 20% rate of dividend, I calculated 20 lakhs as a dividend. First, let's do one thing. What is the last three years average rate? 14%. Hey, you are thinking of 20%. You can't, you can't declare more than 14%. Okay, which means now I can declare maximum 14% only. Earlier, I thought what originally 20 lakhs I want to declare, but I can't declare 20, 20 lakhs because I can only declare 14%. 14 lakhs only I can declare. Out of which 10 lakhs I set off, 4 lakhs now. That 4 lakhs I will set off because of the condition 1, my dividend board of directors originally thought 20 lakhs dividend now that is reduced to 14 lakhs because 14 lakhs is 14 percent average rate 20 lakhs originally board thought 20 percent but because of the condition one inadequate profits in the current year i can only declare maximum 14 percent so my my imaginary dividend or my my dividend my thought my expectation 20 to 14 reduced fine condition two now, what is the total amount of dividend drawing from accumulated profits? Totally 14. Current year profits 10 lakhs, etc. So, 4 lakhs only I am drawing from accumulated profits. How much is this 4 lakhs? It should be, what is 4 lakhs? It should be less than or equal to one tenth of the paid up capital. Suppose paid up capital is 20 lakhs and uh, uh, 25 lakhs, 25 lakhs free reserves. Free reserves or let us assume 20 lakhs I have. 25 lakhs, one tenth means 2.5 lakhs. Plus the free reserves 20 lakhs. One tenth of the paid up capital and free reserves. So 2.5 plus 2. Total 4.5. Ah, 4 is less than 4.5. That's fine. Amount to draw on. First time must to utilize it for any losses. Any set off of losses pending. If any losses pending. Generally that loss picture won't be there. 
otherwise where, where will be the free reserve already losses would have been set off against free reserves balance reserves shall not fall below 15 percent 20 lakhs no out of which 4 lakhs i have drawn 16 lakhs balance reserve 16 lakhs shall not be less than 15 percent of the paid up capital paid up capital 25 lakhs 15 percent means some 3.7 yeah it is there all four conditions satisfied now you can declare that additional 4 lakhs totally 14 lakhs you can declare see how much process is there originally board of directors were thinking 20 lakhs to declare but they understood 14 lakhs only possible whether that 14 lakhs is possible or not condition 2 3 4 also need to be checked totally four conditions condition one in case of inadequate profits in the current year or no profits in the current year dividend can be declared out of accumulated profits and free reserves also condition one the rate of dividend shall not exceed three years average rate of dividend in the preceding three financial years condition two amount drawn from accumulated profits shall not exceed one tenth of the paid up capital and free reserves condition three any losses pending shall be first set off against amount drawn then condition four after withdrawing from the accumulated profits the balance reserves and accumulated profits shall not be less than shall not be less than okay uh, 15 percent of the paid up capital only that's it these are the four conditions when there are inadequate profits or no profits in the current year suppose you're having current year 10 lakhs profit i want to pay dividend up to 10 lakhs no problem no need to check all this you can happily pay this is what practically happens companies generally don't declare dividend out of accumulated profits they don't they generally stick to current year otherwise you know see hell of conditions now so that's about the provision 2 this is actually provision 2 provision 2 to section 123 subsection 1 fine so like what i understood finally is uh, a company can declare out of current year profits happily or accumulated profits if accumulated profits have to be used because of inadequate profits or no profits in the current year provision 2 has to be satisfied okay fine further provision 3 says dividend shall be declared only after set off of previous year losses and depreciation before you declare dividend you are having current year profit last year losses are there first set off depreciation set off still you are having profit from that profit only declare from that profit only you declare that's it further sir dividend can be declared only out of profits after providing depreciation right yes how that at what rate depreciation shall be calculated schedule 2 is there rates of depreciation useful life all that residual values all that so as per schedule 2 calculate depreciation eliminate it from the profit eliminate previous year accumulated losses all that find out the balance the current year profit then declare sir interim dividend can a company declare interim dividend yes happily interim dividend provisions are different from direct dividend final dividend 120 123 subsection 3 is the only section talks about interim dividend so as per uh, so a company board of directors can declare and pay interim dividend within 30 days only time limit as usual unpaid dividend concept unpaid dividend account everything is applicable for interim dividend all provisions of dividend applicable to interim and there is a provision 123 subsection 3 has a separate provision what it says suppose in case of losses sir in current year i i want to declare dividend let us assume i want to declare dividend somewhere on 25th october 2021 this is financial year 21 22 preceding this there are two quarters quarter one quarter two both together is it profit or not check quarter one plus quarter two result together is loss cumulatively loss in case of loss directors can declare interim dividend maximum rate of interim dividend is how much three years average profits not average profits three years average dividend three years average dividend the last three years average dividend same only like final dividend what three years average no same concept only applicable same concept only applicable further further once dividend is declared 123 subsection 4 says within five days please deposit the dividend declared in a separate bank account 123 subsection 5 says 
dividend shall be paid only to the registered shareholder which means if any shares are on dispute you need not pay the dividend to them what you have to do 126 section speaks about that I will discuss there and it shall be paid on cash basis means dividend cannot be paid on credit dividend cannot be paid other than money only in monetary form you have to pay either by check or by dividend warrant or by electronic mode warrant is a very old concept now it is not there either by check private companies generally pay by check and listed companies generally pay by electronic mode and further further 123 subsection 6 talks about prohibition when a company is prohibited to declare a dividend sir if the company defaulted with respect to repayment of deposits under section 73 and 74 73 74 provisions are relating to deposits if there is a default and the default is not yet rectified still continuing today also the default we are still suffering in such a case prohibited to declare dividend on equity shares only on equity shares you are prohibited sir what about preference dividend ah that you can pay equity shares dividend i am prohibited that is 123 so first i spoke about overview so sources of dividend current year profit or previous year profits or funds provided by central or state government proviso 1 notional profits unrealized profits revaluation reserves all sorts of reserves please exclude proviso 2 in case in current year i don't have sufficient profit or i am having losses what to do four conditions okay that we have covered proviso 3 and whatever profit i have in current year Previous year losses, depreciation, current year depreciation, if any, first remove that. Still if you have profit, then only declare out of that profit. So that is provision 3. And depreciation at what rate you have to calculate as per schedule 2 rate. Interim dividend understood. Amount of dividend shall be deposited within 5 days. Only to registered shareholders you have to pay. Prohibited to declare if there is a non-compliances with 73 and 74 sections. Then coming to 124 section, unpaid dividend account what is this unpaid dividend account is about suppose you declare dividend but you did not pay it it is not paid dividend not paid or dividend not claimed by the shareholder also within 30 days from date of declaration within 30 days company did not either pay, pay to the shareholder see originally once declared within five days transfer to bank account so from transferring to bank account within 25 days Company has to be totally within 30 days. Shareholder account should be credited, but not credited in such a case. Within next seven days, that is from 31st day to 37th day, transfer that amount from that bank account to unpaid dividend bank account, which is opened with a scheduled bank in the name of this company. And please, whatever amount to transfer to unpaid dividend, no, whatever the details, name, address amount of unpaid dividend within 90 days from the date of transport unpaid dividend publish on the website of the company further sir company defaulted with 124 subsection 1 sir what is 124 1 within seven days you have to transfer to unpaid dividend account rate you didn't in such a case 12 percent interest shall be charged uh, from the date of default from the date of default that is after 7th day, 8th day onwards, 12% interest is charged until you actually transfer and that interest shall accrue to the shareholder only. Now, once the amount is lying in unpaid dividend account, what? The claimant, the shareholder can apply for the company, whatever the amount, the company will have to pay that amount, 18% interest and 12%, any delay related to unpaid dividend account, that interest, everything shall be paid to the shareholder. Suppose, 7 years from the date of transfer to unpaid dividend account from the date of transfer to unpaid dividend account seven years it is still in the amount only no shareholder claimed it, it is remained unpaid then company shall transfer to investor education protection fund not only the dividend shares shall also be transferred shares in respect of which dividend is transferred to investor education protection fund i transfer dividend to investor education protection fund why that dividend is lying in unpaid dividend account for seven years in respect of one shareholder so that dividend i transferred are a dividend itself it didn't claim obviously shares also he is not claiming he is having ownership but no one is claiming that shares also shall be transferred to IEPF. So the dividend provision itself says 
dividend which is unpaid for seven years transfer to IEPF not only dividend shares on that dividend shall also be transferred to IEPF sir I failed to comply with this provision this is a new amendment applicable from December 2021 exams onwards applicable from December exams onwards what is the penalty for contravention company if at all failure to comply with unpaid dividend rules sections all this 90 days website details all this one lakh rupee penalty plus 500 rupees per day additional penalty maximum penalty can be 10 lakhs every officer who is in default he, he is also liable to pay 25,000 penalty plus 100 rupees per day for continuing penalty maximum 2 lakhs this is the latest amendment but generally what I recommend to students is don't try to remember penalty provisions that doesn't mean no question will come question will come Penalty questions can be asked, but instead of you memorizing that penalty questions, put your time on the actual concept, you can fetch more marks. Penalty questions in entire examination, worst scenario, 4 to 6 marks only will come from penalty provisions on entire subject. So, for that 4 to 6 marks, I don't want you to stress so much and remember. Even in spite of you try put so much efforts, you don't remember at the end of the day. By the way, I hope 124 section also you understood. 123 over, 124 over. Then coming to 125. What is Investor Education Protection Fund? We will directly cover this from study material. Then 126. Sir, the company was received an instrument for transfer of shares. One shareholder transferred shares to another shareholder. Okay, sold. For now shares have to be registered to another shareholder, right? So, for which the transferor send an instrument of transfer to the company. Now, the company, what happened? No, company did not register because of some pending details or because of some issues, unpaid capital like that. In such case, whatever dividend on those shares where registration is kept pending, that shall also be transferred to unpaid dividend account. Whatever dividend declared on the shares where registration, transfer deed is pending, transfer is pending, that shall also be transferred to unpaid dividend account unless the company is authorized to pay dividend to the transferee. Suppose no, the seller told the company, hey, please pay dividend to the transferee directly. If at all he told me, I'll pay to him directly. As on 30, as on the date of declaration of dividend, as on 30th day from the date of declaration of dividend, as on 30th day from the date of declaration of dividend, transfer deed I received, registration is still pending, company will keep the dividend amount in unpaid dividend account. From there, it will pay to the transfer later once transfer instrument is done. Suppose if the transferor gave an instruction to the company, irrespective of registration, pay dividend to him, then I will pay. Generally, this point will come in private companies, not in listed companies. And, and further, since the registration is pending, keep in abeyance right shares, bonus shares. On those shares where registration is still pending, don't declare, don't distribute or allot right shares, don't allot bonus shares. Dividend, don't pay. Transfer to unpaid dividend account. Right shares, bonus shares, don't pay. Keep abeyed. That's it. That's about 126 section. Very simple, not that relevant. 127. It talks about original 30 days time limit. Once dividend is declared, the company has to pay to the shareholder within 30 days. Okay. Suppose if the company fails to distribute dividend within 30 days, dividend declared but not paid to shareholder within 30 days, every director, whoever is a party to default, he is liable for imprisonment and you see it is compulsory and 1000 rupees fine per day and the company shall pay the dividend along with 18% interest for the defaulted period. That's it. Provision 2 to 123 subsection we already understood. With this dividend provisions we understood. More clearly all this overview I already gave here. Once a dividend declared pay within 30 days. Otherwise 18% per annum interest a company has to pay because of section 127. Suppose if the dividend is not paid within 30 days, within next 7 days transfer to unpaid dividend account after expiry of 30 days from date of declaration. And uh, once dividend is declared, transfer to separate bank account within 5 days, within next 25 days pay to the shareholder, not paid, within next 7 days transfer to unpaid dividend account, not transfer 12% interest. Delay in transfer to unpaid 12% interest. In unpaid dividend account amount is lying for 7 years, transfer to IEPF. Unpaid dividend details, shareholder wise, within 90 days from the date of transfer into unpaid dividend shall be published on the company website. That's it. 
I hope you understood the dividend provision thoroughly as a whole, as a whole you understood. I hope. Uh, that's it. That's it. So now after this lecture, what we will do is we will do read from the material directly. So you'll get a better idea. In material, this much in depth also not discussed. Even in the study material, this much in depth also it was not discussed. You will feel very easy now when we are discussing from the study material. Okay. So almost I hope you have gone through the past one hour, one minute approximately the video. One or two minutes. I hope you didn't skip any of the content. So let's continue from the material. Whatever we understood in the overview session, whatever we understood in the previous one, one or two minutes, whatever we understood in the past one hour. Okay, let's give, uh, uh, let's do a brief reading of what are all covered within the dividends chapter material. Fine. So first question. So we splitted all the concepts, whatever we discussed in the you know, previous past one hour, we split them into multiple questions here. There we spoke as sections. Now we are discussing as multiple questions. So write about definition, meaning and concept of dividend under companies. So first of all, the most important definition is the term dividend includes interim dividend as well. Section 2, clause 35, it, it says that dividend includes interim dividend as well. So what is interim dividend? What is final dividend? I already told you previously, once again I'm repeating, if the dividend is declared in the annual general meeting, that's a final dividend. If the dividend is declared by board of directors on any occasion other than annual general meeting between AGMs, before AGM, whatever board of directors are declaring, see, there is a difference between recommendation of dividend and declaration of dividend. With respect to final dividend, board of directors will recommend in the annual general meeting, once the shareholders approved, dividend will be declared. Whereas, interim dividend, board of directors only declare it. Later, shareholders at annual general meeting ratify that. So, there is a basic difference between a final dividend and interim dividend. So, and the term dividend includes interim dividend whatever provisions that are applicable for final dividend with respect to payment process like you remember once a dividend is declared we have to transfer it to a separate bank account within five working days and it must be paid to the concerned shareholder within 30 days from the date of declaration that logic is applicable even for interim dividend as well fine so <clears throat> one important point dividend is not a liability for the company unless declared by the shareholders at a validly constituted general meeting by passing an ordinary resolution for declaring dividend uh, which resolution is an enough ordinary resolution simple majority number of votes cast in favor should be more than number of votes cast against okay 51 percent majority we call it as so at the rates recommended by board or such lower rates as may be decided whatever the rate at which board of directors decided at that rate suppose i told you when there is an inadequacy of profit or if there is a loss during the year and you want to declare interim dividend it shall not exceed past three years average rate of dividend so in such case that lower rate concept applicable otherwise whatever rate of dividend board of directors decided that rate will be applicable so dividend is recommended by board and will be approved by shareholders at agm and the company in general meeting may declare dividend but no dividend shall exceed recommendation by the board whatever board recommended only that shareholders can approve shareholders cannot increase the dividend suppose board of directors recommended 10 percent dividend shareholders cannot increase it to 20 percent sir by the way dividend 10 percent 20 percent 300 percent 200 percent how this dividend is calculated dividend is Dividend is calculated as a proportion to nominal value, which is also called as face value. Suppose if a company declared 10% dividends, if the company said dividend rate is 10%, 10% means, suppose face value is 10 rupees, 10% means 1 rupee. So we have even given examples here. So I hope you are using this material. If at all you are using this material, I am telling you, you understand very easily the concepts. Okay. So we have even given the examples here. Next. So then write about the concept of interim dividend and final dividend. Nothing but here the dividend provision we are going to discuss. What is an interim dividend? It's a dividend declared by board of directors at any time during the period from the closure of the financial year till the AGM. Simply speaking, 
not on the AGM you are declaring. You are not declaring dividend on the date of AGM. You are declaring at some other date. Interim dividend, interim dividend can be declared from the following sources. You, you may declare it from surplus in profit and loss account or you may declare it from the profit of the current financial year in which dividend sought to be declared. Profit of that financial year means current year. Profit generated in the financial year till the quarter preceding the date of declaration of interim dividend. All these three are talking about mostly same. First point, surplus in P&L. It is something like accumulated profits. It is something like accumulated profits. If a company is having accumulated profits, you can declare interim dividend from that. You can declare interim dividend from the profit of this financial year. You can declare interim dividend in the profits of the previous quarter. Suppose, uh, suppose we are somewhere in the November 2021. Let us assume. November 2021 is a quarter 3. So, you can declare dividend from quarter 1 plus quarter 2 profits. So, profits generated in the financial year till the quarter preceding the date of declaration of dividend. Now, once interim dividend is declared, it shall be ratified by members at AGM. Now, you may get it out. Sir, if, what, if members, <coughs> what if members don't ratify? Obviously, they will ratify. Man, why? <coughs> Already received by members. So, this is very important. <coughs> declaration of dividend when there are losses to the company. Suppose, if the company incurred loss, during the current financial year up to end of the quarter immediately preceding the date of declaration of dividend. So, what do you mean by loss? Tell me, you know, generally I am talking about listed companies. Listed companies give financial statements on quarterly basis. Listed companies give financial statements on quarterly basis. So, there are four quarters in a year. For every quarter, listed companies will file with SEBI quarterly financial statements sir what is quarterly financial statements don't worry not required for you you know what relating to this a new section has been added called 129a 129a there is a new section added which is applicable for the first time for may attempt to student 129a we are going to discuss it from accounts of the company's chapter we will be discussing this in the accounts of the company's chapter periodical filing of periodical results when periodical financial results so, that is nothing but quarterly financial statements being filed by listed companies similar to. Now, you see, quarter 1, company has made a loss of 20 crore. Quarter 2, company made a profit of 40 crore. Quarter 3, company made a loss of 10 crore. Okay. Quarter 4, not yet come. But what happened is, in quarter 4, company want to declare some dividend. Not in the, not on the AGM. That is not about AGM dividend. It is about quarter 4 dividend. They want to pay dividend in quarter 4. What is it called as interim dividend? Now, look at this particular sentence once again. If the company incurred loss during the financial year up to the end of the quarter. Now, you see, here we are declaring in quarter 4, right? As on quarter 4, cumulatively, what is the profit or loss? That we need to see. You cannot say, sir, first quarter we have a loss. Sir, third quarter also we have a loss. So, uh, loss provision is applicable. No, don't calculate like that. Cumulatively, how much? First quarter, 20 crore loss. Second quarter, 40 crore profit. Third quarter, 10 crore loss. Put together, net amount is how much till now? 10 crore surplus only is there. How much is there? 10 crore. How much already is there? 10 crore. So, in case of losses, that provision do not apply. When the concept of in case of losses will come into picture. Today I want to declare interim dividend. I will see from 1st April to today. This financial year. Totally what is the profit or loss? Ah, it is profit only. This provision do not apply. Totally you have to see. Not quarter wise. Getting it? Totally. Suppose cumulatively if maybe quarter 1 profit. Quarter 2 loss. Quarter 3 loss. Totally if you combine it. All are losses only. Totally as a whole. On the date when I am declaring interim dividend, if I look at my current financial year profit or loss, it's actually loss. In that case, this provision will apply. Okay, sir. What is the what is this point says? Interim dividend generally can be declared at any rate by board of directors. However, if there is a loss during the current financial year up to the quarter preceding the declaration of interim dividend before I declare the dividend by board of directors if there is a loss in the current year cumulatively then interim dividend shall not be declared interim dividend shall not be declared at a rate higher than average of dividend declared by the company during the immediately three preceding financial years okay suppose suppose I am right now in let us assume 21 22 
until quarter 3. I am declaring dividend in quarter 4. So, what I need to check quarter 1, quarter 2, quarter 3 put together. What is the profit or loss I need to see? I need to see profit or loss. Simply speaking, before I declare dividend, what is the cumulative profit or loss as per our books of accounts? Because today it is electronic books of accounts. You can see profit on any day. You can check for profit on any day. So, cumulatively, if there is a profit, this provision do not apply. Straight away you go with. If it is a loss, what is applicable? If it is a loss, you have to uh, check. Okay, so previous three years means what? 2021, 20, 19, 20, 18, 19. So, three years, 10%, 12%, 14%. Uh, plus, plus, plus by three. Average amount only you have to declare. So, what is the average dividend? 12% in this example. That's it. If a company declared dividend at a rate of 16% during the immediate preceding three years, in all the three years, 16 only they declared, then in that case, if the company incurred loss in the current year, it is permitted to declare interim dividend at a rate which is not higher than 16%. That's it. Further, the amount of dividend once declared shall be deposited in a separate account within five days. I spoke about this in the overview, overview, you know, part. That's it. Whatever provisions that are applicable with respect to payment of dividend, they, they shall apply even for interim dividend. So, whatever, like we have seen, no, unpaid dividend account, invested education protection fund, seven years concept, all this in the overview, they all applicable for interim dividend as well. 90 days, uh, whoever have not claimed the dividend, within 90 days, company has to show in the website, everything is applicable here. So, what is the difference between interim dividend and final dividend? So, we have given a diagram here. So, you can have a look at this diagram. Maybe at this kind of question also can come. They may ask you for four marks question. What is the difference between interim and final? Interim dividend is declared and paid during this accounting year before finalization of the generally before finalization of accounts. Whereas final dividend is recommended by board and approved by shareholders at general meeting. Announcement board of directors. Whereas your recommendation is by board but announcement and approval is by shareholder. Before preparation of financials. It is after preparation of financials. It can be revoked with the consent of all the shareholders. A yeah, very important point. Interim dividend can be revoked. Whereas final dividend cannot be revoked. Interim dividend declared can be revoked with the consent of all the shareholders. Whereas final dividend once declared, it's a liability for the company. Accrued liability cannot be revoked. And interim dividend can be declared only when articles are specifically permit. Articles shall have interim dividend clause. Only then it can be declared. You know, uh, by default, by default, when a company we newly incorporate, the modal articles we copy paste. At the time of incorporation, we copy paste modal articles. By default, by default, uh, interim dividend concept will be there as part of articles of association unless company delete that. Okay. Whereas for final dividend, it does not require provision in articles, but still, in all the cases, in all the companies that you see in the market, articles of association contains provisions for both final dividend and interim dividend both. Now, write about classification of shares based on manner of payment of dividend. You know, you might have learned this in foundation or intermediate itself. Foundation probably, cumulative preference shares, non-cumulative preference shares, that concept. So, this is very easy. So, I'm not, I'm not giving an idea about it. See, if it is a regular course, if you are my subscription student or my law class student, I'll be giving detailed explanation. In fact, this chapter will be explained for 7 hours approximately. Whereas in marathon, I hardly can cover it for 1 and a half hour maximum. So, what are the provisions regarding declaration and payment of dividend? Yes. So, what are the provisions regarding declaration and payment of dividend? First of all, we must understand from which sources we can declare. In the overview, I clearly explained. Dividend can be declared out of profits of the current year. In the current year, you are having profits, happily you declare. If you do not have profits in the current year, you can declare out of profits of any financial year or years. Which means, this is what I call it as accumulated profits. Which is what we call it as accumulated. Or, out of both above A and B, you can declare dividend partly from current year profits and partly from previous year profits. Suppose, current year, your total net profit is 10 lakhs. Suppose, you want to declare a dividend of 20 lakhs. You see, accumulated profits, you are having some 40 lakhs. So, out of 20, 10 lakhs you declare from current year. Remaining 10, you declare from accumulated profits. Okay. And remember, accumulated profits means what? Only free reserves, only free reserves and no other reserve shall be used for declaration of dividend. Revaluation reserve cannot be used. 
any write back of depreciation or impairment loss cannot be used only realistic profits only real profit realized profit that too we call it as free reserves security premium cannot be used section 52 security premium can be used only for few purposes okay so a dividend can be declared only out of free reserves which are absolutely available for distribution suppose you don't have uh, current year profits you don't have past year profits and you know while incorporating your company for all the shareholders government has given a guarantee they are shareholders don't worry you buy shares of this company we will give guarantee if the company do not have profits we will pay dividend in that case money provided by central government or state government for payment of dividend by the company because of a guarantee given by the government if at all government gave a guarantee government stood as a guarantee for all the shareholders okay if the company do not give dividend in that case government will give money to the company company will declare it as a dividend very rare scenario very rare scenario if you look at the act you know it only has two clauses sources means only two clauses 123 subsection will have only two clauses a and b one is profits of the year or previous years another one is amount given by the government out of a guarantee that's it but we split it into four parts now <coughs> And there is a very, very important note as per the fourth provision of 123. Before you declare any dividend, whatever previous losses, whatever depreciation that is not provided shall be set off against profit of the company for the current year. Remember, here unnecessarily students will do lots of interpretation to declare dividend. First depreciation shall be provided. Whether you declare dividend or not doesn't matter. Today, not just today. The moment accounting standards evolved, the moment gap has evolved for all the companies, they mandatorily provide depreciation as per accounting standards for sure. They mandatorily provide. No doubt about it. It's because dividend calculation is an accounting standard requirement. And every company shall prepare books of accounts and financial statements as per accounting standards. It may be normal accounting standard or in the A's. So, providing depreciation is no doubt it is there. Only first I provide depreciation, then I will declare. No need to have a specific discussion like that. Without providing depreciation, you cannot, you know, see if you don't provide depreciation, what happens? Auditors will qualify. Auditors will give adverse opinion. Getting it? So, without depreciation, it is not uh, possible to prepare financial statements itself, first of all. It's a violation of fundamental principles of accounting general principles of accounting so if like of course since it is covered in the provision we are discussing so without without calculating depreciation without providing correct depreciation in the books of accounts you don't declare dividend that's a precautionary measure in the provision but in reality we always provide depreciation whether we declare or not about the dividend so before you declare dividend maybe from the current year profits or from the accumulated profits whatever first see all the accumulated losses has been set off indirectly what are they trying to tell you you know <coughs> see you have three sources right one is current year profit or accumulated profit or amount given by government let us keep this aside amount given by government keep this aside i'm not talking about that issue suppose these two together nothing but current year profit and loss account and accumulator profits i'm combining if i have a negative figure if i still have a negative figure how can i declare only if i have a positive figure i can declare only then it's a source if it is a negative figure how can i declare i cannot declare dividend now you will get it out sir can i declare dividend out of capital profit or can i can i declare dividend out of share capital can I declare dividend from the capital? I withdraw some amount of share capital and then give it as a dividend? Prohibited. Capital profits are not same as distributable profits. They are not earned in the normal course of business and therefore not available for dividend distribution. Dividend cannot be declared out of capital. It is not possible, not permitted. Dividend sources is very clear. Profits of the current year, profits of the previous years. Before you declare any accumulated losses were there previously, depreciation if at all not provided, that also reduce it. Still you have a positive figure, then declare the dividend. So that's what they're saying here. That's what they're indirectly telling you. 
So what do you mean by free reserves? Means that reserves which as per latest audited balance sheet of the company available for distribution of dividend. Free reserves excludes revaluation reserve, any fair value adjustments. Fair value adjustments are as per NDAs, okay? That is not required at CA inter. Then there is another question. What is the need of providing depreciation out of the profits before providing dividend? So that is not relevant from, from exam point of view. Not that important. Give a single reading to this question. Not that important. Now, sir, before declaring dividend, a company must transfer a certain percentage of profit to reserves. Is it true? Once upon a time, it is true. In World Companies Act 1956, there is a compulsory provision for transfer to reserves before declaration of dividend. But now that provision has been eliminated. Whether you are having profits, whether you are having losses, whether you are declaring dividend from current year profit or whether you are declaring dividend from accumulated profits, now there is no restriction, there is no provision which says percentage of profits has to be transferred to a reserve so no the transfer of profits to reserve for any financial year it is completely left to the discretion of the company therefore a company is free to transfer any portion of profits to any reserve whatever they want to create it for as it may deem fit it may also decide not to transfer they may decide not to transfer also nothing wrong because this provision itself is not there we have seen in the overview class is there any such provision like this So examples we have given, just give single reading of these examples more. <coughs> now finally, what are the conditions for declaration of dividend in case of inadequacy or absence of profit? So what is the condition if you want to declare dividend? In spite you do not have adequate, inadequate profit or absence means you do not have profit at all, you are having losses. You are running in losses or you don't have enough profit. Maybe your profit is hardly 10 lakhs in the current year. But you want to declare 20 lakhs dividend. So inadequate. Maybe in current year you are having 20 lakhs loss totally. Still you want to declare some 20 lakhs dividend. How can you? You can declare it from accumulated profits. Nothing but you can declare it from free reserves. If at all you are having accumulated profits, you can declare. Provided there are three conditions. You remember the overview session. Three conditions I told. So what are the three conditions? Condition one. First one. In the current you are having loss. Yes. You want to declare the dividend from accumulated profits. Yes. First to do one thing. Check what is the at what rate you want to give the dividend. The rate of dividend shall not exceed average of rates of dividend declared by the company in the immediate three years. In the last three years when you are having profit you are declaring 15%, 16% like that. Today, this year, you are having loss. How can you declare more than that? In a situation of profit, you declared 15% dividend example. Today, you want to declare 20%. That too, you are having losses in current year. See, if you have profits in current year, I don't have any problem. But you are having losses in current year. In that case, how can you declare higher amount of dividend when in the last three years, though you are having profit, you declared a lower rate. On that logic, this condition has been added. Very simple. Last three years, you are having profits. Example. In those years, you declared some 15, 16, 20 like that. This year, you are having loss. And you want to declare 25%. How fair it is. So, when you are having a loss, take look at the last three years. Take average rate. Declare maximum that much only. The maximum rate of dividend in the year in which loss is there. In the current year, you want to declare dividend. Okay, it may be interim or final, whatever. You want to declare some dividend in the current year. And you are in the current year, there is a loss figure. What is the maximum rate at which you can give dividend? Average of last three financial years rate of dividend. That's it. However, this condition shall not apply if the company did not declare dividend in the last three. So obviously, if at all there is no dividend for the first time, I am declaring choice is yours. Okay. So, for new companies, this condition one do not apply. Or for a company which is declaring dividend for the first time, this concept do not apply. Then condition two. Okay. So, in current you are having loss, right? From where you will draw money and then give dividend? Hey, 123 subsection one says I can draw from previous year profits, accumulated profits. Okay, very good. How much accumulated profits you are having? I am having 45 lakhs accumulated profits. Can you declare entire that accumulated profits? No. Look at the total amount to be drawn 
from accumulated profit shall not exceed 10% of the paid up share capital and free reserves as appearing in the latest audited balance sheet. Indirectly, what are they saying, you know? Dear mister, you are having current year loss, no? Don't do over action. Okay? Don't give build up. Give dividend as a give dividend in such a way it is less than it is less than or equal to 10% of your paid up capital plus free reserves. Sir, 10% of paid up capital and free reserves comes to 20 lakhs, sir. Because my paid up capital is 1 crore, my free reserves is 1 crore, totally 2 crore. 10% is 20 lakh. Sir, you know, I'm having accumulated profits of 60 lakhs. I want to declare 40 lakhs dividend. Hey, shut up. This year you're already having loss. How do we, when will you set off this loss? You need to first set up the loss, no? You have accumulated profit 60 lakhs, but this year 30 lakhs loss is there. First set off. See, what is the amount available? Very less. So, don't do build up. Getting it? So, don't give dividend. If at all you are withdrawing, if at all you are having a thought to declare dividend out of accumulated profits, don't declare more than 10% of paid up capital and reserves. At the same time, condition 1, don't declare more than average rate declared in the last 3 years. So, I hope you are able to understand the logic behind these provisions. So, total amount that can be drawn from accumulated profits shall be less than or equal to 10%. And you know, first it must be utilized to set off of the financial year. Only balance amount available can be used for dividend. Correct? No? Suppose, current year I have, I have 10 lakhs loss. But I am having accumulated profits of 60 lakhs. My paid up capital and reserves is 2 crores. In this 10% is 20 lakhs. So, how much I can we declare? Can I declare entire 20? There is a condition. Fourth provision. What it says before declaring any losses of the current year or any accumulated losses, first set off. Okay. 20 lakhs minus 10 lakhs. So, maximum I can declare only 10 lakhs money as a dividend. What is the rate? Calculate. Then you give, you declare at that rate. Provided that rate shall not exceed average last year, three years. Then condition three. Now you are withdrawing money you know, from accumulated profits. Ensure that. After withdrawing, it shall not fall below 15% of the paid up share capital only. It shall not be less than 15% of the paid up share capital. Ensure that after you withdraw whatever money you want to declare ultimately, after you withdraw, check what is your reserves balance available and see that it is at least 15% of the paid up capital of the company. It is not less than 15% of the paid up capital. Sir, how to, you know, can you give a very clear example of this? Yes. By the way, uh, if, the, if, if it is a 100% government owned company, remember, I am not saying simply a government company. I am saying 100% owned government company. What is 100% owned government company? Suppose, Telangana State Power Distribution Corporation Limited. Telangana State Power Distribution and Corporation Limited. In this, 100% of the share capital is held by State Government of Telangana. It's a 100% government owned company. Suppose, State Bank of India Limited. In State Bank of India Limited, 55% is only held by Government of India. Remaining 45% is held by others private entities. So, State Bank of India is not a 100% owned government company. State Bank of India is only a simple government company because majority, more than 51% of the voting power is held by central government. Only by satisfying government company definition, it became a government. But it is not 100% government company. So, what Rule 3 says? The conditions prescribed in Rule 3, three conditions, condition 1, condition 2, condition 3. What is condition 1? The rate of dividend shall not exceed average of last 3 years rate. Condition 2. Maximum dividend that will be drawn from accumulated profits. Maximum amount that can be drawn shall not exceed 10% of the paid up capital and free reserves. After withdrawing, okay, the, the balance reserves available shall not be less than 15% of the paid up capital. So that condition will not apply for a government company which is 100% government company owned by central or state or combination of central and state. So, we have given an example. Capricorn Industries Limited has a paid up capital of 200 lakhs and reserves of 240. So, paid up capital plus reserves are how much? 440 lakhs. 10% is how much? 44 lakhs. Just keep it aside. Calculation. Loss for the year ended 31st March 2020 is 30 lakhs. So, I think this might be current year. Current year loss is how much? 30 lakhs. Okay. Dividend declared in the last 3 years is as below 9, 10, 12. 10 plus 10, 22 plus 9, uh, 31. 31 by 3, 10.3 percentage. What is it? 
10.3 percentage first condition as per condition one you cannot declare beyond 31 percent of uh, sorry 10.3 percent of the rate uh, once uh, <coughs> ah, sorry <coughs> so what is the maximum rate as per condition one 10.3 condition two condition two how much you can draw for the purpose of declaring dividend how much you can draw by the way first let us calculate amount 10.3 of uh, how much paid up capital 200 lakhs means face value means paid up capital 200 lakhs only no so paid up capital 200 lakhs multiplied by 10.3 percentage how much approximately some 21 lakh rupees will come how much dividend you can declare maximum sum 21 lakh 21 lakh you can declare because 200 lakhs into 10.3 percentage or 23 lakh probably not 23 point 3 means 1 percent means 2 lakhs point 3 means 60 some okay 21 lakh round off okay point 3 ignore so 21 lakh you can uh, declare approximately 21 or 22 lakh you can declare so 10.3 percent means okay fine condition 2 how much you can draw from the accumulated profits first of all for the purpose of declaring dividend i have accumulated profits of 240 lakhs accumulated reserves from that 10 percent paid up capital is how much 200 lakhs so how much i can draw from accumulated profits you can draw from accumulated profits an amount equal to maximum 10 percent of puc plus accumulated profits that is 44 lakhs i withdraw okay first i draw can i declare enter 44 no what condition before you declare your accumulated profits should be set off no 30 lakhs so how much is available as per accumulated condition to how much amount amount is available only 14 lakhs is available oh my god as per condition one average raise concept you can declare more than 20 lakhs but as per condition two you can declare only 14 let us see condition 3 is it satisfied or not condition 3 okay you know how much is the uh, accumulated profits 240 out of that how much you are withdrawing for dividend 40 how much is balance available 226 how much is balance available 226 so is it is it less than 15 percent of paid up capital no obviously more so condition 3 satisfied okay condition 3 satisfied as per condition 2 you can declare only 14 lakhs as per condition 1 you can declare 10 percent approximately which is equal to 20 lakhs all the three conditions shall be satisfied so maximum how much dividend i can declare 14 lakhs 14 lakhs means 14 by 200 lakhs paid up capital what is the rate approximately 7 percent is the rate at which you can declare so you see the computation has been given below the computation has been given below so maximum rate at the company can declare is 14 lakhs that's it next so we have given even another example also so how to write the answer that is also explained clearly so another example is given for your practice please please solve this whether you are a student or other student please you know this entire material whatever i'm giving you remember this is very beautiful material please read this thoroughly after listening to this marathon read this material thoroughly then finally okay sir in the overview class i clearly told once dividend is declared what we need to do company shall transfer it to another bank account dividend declared bank account within five days from the date of declaration however if it is a hundred percent government company this condition do not apply five days transfer this condition do not apply if it is a hundred percent government company not normal government company then once you transfer to a separate bank account you need to pay to the shareholder yes or no so dividend shall be payable only to a registered shareholder suppose if a person is a shareholder but not a member because the shares transfer just happened not yet members membership records were not yet updated in that case okay in that case we need to wait we need to wait okay a purchaser of shares whose name is not entered cannot claim payment of dividend though he might have made full payment for seller of the shares so in this case dividend will be kept in pending abeyance until registration of transfer unless the shareholder original authorizes the company to pay the dividend to the purchaser so example also given here so please read these examples very simple sir can we declare dividend on partly paid shares yes in proportion to the partly paid up amount suppose uh, you are declaring face value 10 rupee you are declaring 20 percent dividend generally 2 rupees suppose paid up pay, paid up capital is only 5 rupees means only 50 percent is paid up out of 20 percent 50 percent 5 rupees only you can sorry 1 rupee only you can pay dividend sir can i pay dividend in kind non-monetarily no dividend must be payable only in cash you see in dividends that are payable to shareholders may be paid by check or electronic transfer whatever as per 127 
127 section specifically talks about payment of dividend. So it says any dividend declared must be paid to shareholder within 30 days from the date of declaration. Originally within 5 days transfer to separate bank from that bank transfer to all the shareholders bank account. Suppose if the company issued dividend warrant. Now dividend warrant concept is not there. It is deleted. So I am not reading. I am not reading warrant concept. Once upon a time dividend warrants will be there. Okay, such warrant must be posted to the registered address within the prescribed time. Once posted, it is immaterial whether shareholder was paid within 30 days or not all that. So, but this warrant concept is not relevant at all from exam point of view. So, exception also not required. See, 127, we have a separate question. Payment of dividend, we have a separate question later. So, there we will be discussing. Next. In case of Nidhi companies, should I pay within 30 days to the member directly? No need. You can just credit to his outstanding. In Nidhi company, you know, what is a Nidhi company? You know, you all members joined with my company as a shareholder and also a member. What Nidhi company will do is, it collects funds from all the members and gives it as loan to that member who needs it. Getting it? So, once I collect a fund from you, in, in my books of accounts, in company books of accounts, you know, your account is a liability to me. So, I am already owing to you so much of money. And if I declare any dividend, if I credit to your account, that is also enough. You know, this subsection shall apply to Nidhi, subject to modification that any dividend payable in cash may be paid by crediting the same to the account of the member, if at all he has not claimed within 30 days. If a Nidhi company member did not claim, did not receive the dividend, did not claim the dividend, first of all, forget about receiving it. He did not claim at all. Company can pay them by just crediting their account. Okay, that's it. But actually claiming and all is also not required. Today what is happening, you know, AGM or somewhere they'll declare, you get the money within the time limit mentioned in your bank account directly. Because today we are having shares in DMAT form. DMAT bank account is linked. That entire details are available with the company. Once company declare, you will get the money into your bank account. That's it. You Sir, you do, do I need to claim? I don't claim at all. I'm a shareholder in many companies. I receive directly without any procedure for claiming. That's it. So, when a company is prohibited for declaration of dividend, if a company defaulted with section 73 and 74 deposits provisions, if a company is defaulted with these provisions, it is prohibited. Further, section 8 companies prohibited to declare dividend because section 8 companies are formed for charitable purpose, not for the purpose of claiming dividend. And one of the conditions for getting section 8 license is what? It, it shall not declare a dividend. Then write about the concept of unpaid dividend account section 124. What is this unpaid dividend account? Within 5 days, first company shall transfer to dividend declaration account. From that account, company shall pay within 30 days from the date of original declaration to the shareholder. Shareholder, it is not paid within 30 days. Within 31st day, from 31st day, count to 7 days. Within 7 days, within 7 days, whatever dividend declared, not paid to shareholder within 30 days, from the expiry of 30 days, within 7 days, transfer to unpaid dividend account. So, where a dividend has been declared by the company, but not paid or claimed within 30 days, the company shall within 7 days from the expiry of the set period, transfer total amount of unpaid dividend or unclaimed dividend to a special account called unpaid dividend account. Suppose, if there is a default, here there are two types of default. I told you very clearly in the overview lecture also when I'm, when I'm explaining through diagram. Default in transfer to unpaid dividend. Default in payment of dividend. But default in payment of dividend to the shareholder 18% interest. Default delay in transfer of dividend from bank account to unpaid dividend account. For that delay, more than 7 days delay, 12% interest. Both shall be paid to ultimately shareholder in the proportion to dividend. And further, company shall prepare statement of unpaid or unclaimed dividend and shall publish within 90 days on the website of the company. These are the shareholders who didn't receive dividend, who didn't claim the dividend. Then write about transfer of unpaid dividend to IEPF, Investor Education Protection Fund. Suppose if a dividend remains same, unpaid, unclaimed for 7 years from the date of transfer to the unpaid dividend account and whatever interest accrued on that, it shall be transferred to Investor Education Protection Fund. And not only dividend, even the, the shares value, company shall transfer to Investor Education Protection Fund. Within the seven years, if any shareholder claimed the dividend or shares, 
then that shall not be transferred to IEPF. Once you transferred, inform Investor Education Protection Fund by filing a statement. Now, you know, the original owner of the shares, after 7 years, he opened ISA. Okay, so he can go to Investor Education Protection Fund and then reclaim a transfer shares along with a dividend. So, punishment for contravention, punishment for contravention is given. <coughs> Penalty has been modified, not required from exam point of view. So, write about Investor Education Protection Fund. For what purpose Investor Education Protection Fund can be used? That is important. How Investor Education Protection Fund can be utilized? It can be utilized for repayment of, repayment of unclaimed dividend, repayment of mature deposit, repayment of mature debentures, repayment of application money due for refund. These are all originally transferred to Investor Education Protection Fund because of seven years they were not claimed. After 7 years, shareholder or his illegal heir came to the IEPF and asked, Sir, my parents' money or my money, hard earned money, I forgot, I was in coma, please give me back the money. Investor Education Protection Fund shall refund that money. And Investor Education Protection Fund can be utilized for promotion of investor education awareness. A distribution of any disgorged amount, disgorged amount, disgorged amount means cheated money. So, somebody has cheated and got some money. And uh, you know, the uh, some enforcement directorate or whatever, they caught them, recovered that money and that recovered money will be given back to Investor Education Protection Fund and that recovered money is called as a disgorged amount. So that disgorged amount can be given uh, for those persons who suffered losses. And not only for that, reimbursement of legal expenses because of any class action suit. Class action suit. I think you might have learned this in Prospectus Chapter. So, so what is the process? The person who is claiming unpaid dividend, the person who is claiming the shares, whatever, he has to make an applic application to Investor Education Protection Fund. And other provisions are there that is not required from exam point of view. Look, don't think that I'm covering, I'm, 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 you know, explaining at a faster speed. This is a marathon class. Almost only on dividend chapter, we are spending close to two hours, close to one and a half to two hours. And question number 13 is regarding section 126. What, what this says? If the ownership is in dispute, don't declare dividend. I mean, declare dividend but don't pay to him. Simple. And what is the punishment for failure to distribute dividend? This is also an important question. Punishment for failure to distribute the dividend. A dividend declared shall be paid within 30 days from the date of declaration. If at all it is not paid within 30 days, first up, Company shall pay interest at 18% per annum during the period until it is paid back to the shareholder and every director of the company shall be punishable for an imprisonment up to 2 years if he is a knowingly a party to the default and he is liable to pay a fine of 1000 rupees every day during the default continues. From 31st day, every director of the company shall pay 1000 rupees penalty plus they are liable for 2 years imprisonment if at all it is intentionally done. Knowingly a party for the default. He knows that dividend declared but not paid. If you don't declare dividend, that is not a problem. But you declared, you must pay within 30 days. If you don't pay, 2 years imprisonment. And company, what is the punishment for the company? They have to pay 18% interest to the shareholder. So who are exempted from punishment? What are the cases exempted? This itself can be asked as a 4 marks question. A company declared dividend but could not pay within 30 days. Defaulted. But there are certain cases where company is not liable for section 127 punishment. What are the cases? Because of operation of law. The company declared dividend immediately lockdown was announced. Example. So, uh, entire banking operations, everything were halted. In that case, permitted, exempted. Punishment will not be there. Specific direction could not be complied. Where a shareholder has given direction to the company regarding payment of dividend and those directions cannot be complied and the same has been communicated. Shareholder told, hey, my bank account is this, but my bank account is not working. Transfer to this bank account. So, shareholder told to the company. But company has some doubts. So, they replied to the shareholder. Somehow, shareholder has not replied. They communicated finally, shareholder, your bank account is not authorized, so we can't transfer. Sorry. Communicated by the company. Shareholder requested. Still, it was kept pending. In that case also, it is okay. Or ownership is in dispute. Who is the right shareholder, right member? It is in dispute. Or suppose the shareholder has to pay call money. It can be adjusted against due. I declare dividend. He has to pay some call money. Calls in areas. I will adjust. Or default in process. Maybe banking channel has there is a default. With the depository, some account details were not updated or shareholder account was blocked. So because of that, you know, 
though we declared it could not be paid because of technical issues out of the control of the company not mistake of the company or the directors in that case also you know there is no punishment so this this ex these exceptions are who are all exempted from punishment what are the circumstances exempted from punishment which is important question under section 127 that can be asked for four marks that's it with this dividend declaration concept has been completely discussed and for nidhi companies no for nidhi companies no 127 says if the amount declared dividend is 100 rupees or less than that for a particular member if it is less than 100 or 100 no need to pay it is enough if you just advertise who are all uh, you know eligible for dividend for less than 100 rupees if you just give an advertisement circulation that's enough you just uh, uh, you know give a circulation that the declaration is i mean dividend is declared and displayed in the not uh, notice of the nidhi company for three days notice board website if you have a website display that's enough if it is 100 rupees or less than 100 no need to pay simply speaking this entire provision meaning is if a nidhi company declared dividend and a member is eligible to receive 100 rupees or less than 100 rupees the nidhi company need not transfer if the nidhi company just give the declaration and put it on the website that's enough Hapa, with this dividend concept has been completely discussed almost one and a half hour we discussed see this is not my uh, regular cars in, in, in a regular class I'm, I'm, i will be explaining in a very much detail in fact i will be showing agm notices how dividend received you know how all that voting happens the, all that i'll be discussing in the regular class but in a marathon that all that and all cannot be done and i hope it is not required also at last moment you should not learn something newly you should revise whatever you learned i hope with this dividend chapter i gave you some clarity have a nice time okay by the way uh, not yet complete accounts of the companies is going to start accounts of the companies will continue okay just take some five to ten minutes break and then come back and watch accounts of companies continuation to this video that's it so the continuation i hope you the previous part i hope you completed a dividend concept thoroughly before you proceed with this if possible try reading from this material the dividend topic whatever we covered okay now let's discuss about the next topic that is accounts of companies which is actually the lengthiest chapter in the entire company law this is the lengthiest chapter and the weightage is up to 10 marks i can say i can confidently say minimum 10 marks yeah, I can confidently say minimum 8 to 10 marks is for sure. Sometimes if luck favors 12 marks also may come. 12 to 14 marks also may come. Very important chapter. Accounts of company. Now this accounts of companies you know we have section 128 to 138. 128 and 129 they deal with books of accounts and financial statements. There are so many subsections and you know what very recently 129a a new section has been added which is very important it's an addition nothing but it's part of amendment every one of you please make a note 129 subsection a a new section has been added which is very important i'll talk about that then you have two sections called 130 131 both deal with reopening of accounts or revision of financial statements and board report nothing but you know revision of financial statements nothing but i'll come there and then discuss then 132 133 section it talks purely about national financial reporting authority nfra what are its functions what are its duties and uh, uh, when it is constituted what companies are covered within the purview of nfra all that then 134 talks about authentication of financial statements and board of directors report and uh, director's responsibility statement and then most important thing another topic in our uh, CA inter this chapter is CSR 135 such a big section and big topic in this entire chapter lengthiest topic is actually section 135 CSR corporate social responsibility and you know what how we are going to discuss the order first first we will be discussing 129 a then I'll be discussing 130 131 uh, then I'll be discussing 135 CSR then after uh, we'll discuss about uh, filing of the financials 129 and 128 uh, then I'll be discussing 132 133 NFRA all that depending upon the necessity but most importantly what are the sections that you must not skip 129A 130 131 135 these sections are very important even I can say 137 filing of the financial statements is also one of the important section then why late let's enter into 129 a periodical financial statements periodical financial results 
periodical financial results just a minute so in my material it is question number seven so explain the provisions relating to periodical financial results under 129a of the companies act so like first i need to give you a very background idea for this uh, see this is a revision class not a regular class just keep a note yeah you know listed companies they list in stock exchanges right and we know that every day stocks will be traded correct or not every day shares will be traded now tell me uh, generally whether a company is performing well or not how we know based on the financial statements agreed what is the periodicity of preparation of financial statements generally what is the duration one year yearly once we prepare that's what we know but last year company prepared financials almost 11 to 12 months it's been i am trading in trading in that share whether the company has performed well in the last 11 or 12 months i don't know it's very risky yes or no correct or not i want to know the real time information i want to know the latest information last year company may be excellent but this year we don't know until march 2020 the company is performing excellent 1920 but 2021 was completely locked down now in that lockdown what is the exact sales how do we know that's why for listed companies sebi made mandatory to prepare quarterly financial statements for listed companies as per sebi regulations they have to prepare quarterly results nothing but quarterly financial statements every listed company shall prepare quarterly financial statements and shall file with sebi and shall intimate to stock exchanges and that information shall be published now tell me every quarter i'll get what is the performance of the company during that quarter so i know very well the latest information of this quarter i know so by end of every quarter i'll get latest information same way same way what about unlisted companies you know filing of quarterly results or filing preparation of quarterly financial statements this provision is not there in the companies act it is a provision as per sebi regulations now company law has brought a new provision that is section 129a where they call it as periodical financial results where they named it as periodical financial results so what this section says the central government may require such class of unlisted companies their main focus is on what unlisted companies it may be a private company or it may be a public limited company not clearly specified central government may give by order which unlisted companies liable for this they may give some limits 100 crore capital 200 crore turnover 500 crore some borrowings or 50 crore borrowings, some limits they'll describe and they will make some companies liable under this but that right now that limits were not yet prescribed this section was added in 2021 only so central government may by order for certain unlisted companies they should prepare financial results of that company on periodical basis and in such form as may be prescribed see 129 what it says every company shall prepare financial statements every year that's what it says now what is this they are asking you to you know prepare financial results they want to talk they want to know profit or loss they want to know the overall performance of the company and position of the company periodically okay periodical basis what is periodical basis it may be quarterly or it may be half yearly depends we don't know unless the government gives notification we don't know but when government can give notification only when authority is given to the government in the act now act 129 a section brought and gave authority to the government uh, now mca release notification quarterly should be prepared yeah we will prepare all unlisted companies like us we prepare quarterly results just like listed companies so 129 a section has been added so every unlisted company whoever is covered within the government order shall prepare financial results on such periodical basis it may be half yearly or quarterly uh, in that in in the form whatever is given by the government now not only that the company shall obtain approval of board of directors and complete audit or limited review of that periodical results remember quarterly financials just like that we don't release we will conduct audit or we will conduct a limited review 
you know, as per SEBI regulations, listed companies, quarterly financials, they must be reviewed. They must be reviewed by statutory auditors under a limited review engagement. Sir, what is limited review? What is review? What is audit? What is the difference between review and audit? That much in-depth knowledge is not required at CA inter level. Ma, ignore. There is a concept called review. It is not as superb as audit, but it is not useless as well. It's medium. Uh, auditors saw everything. Uh, there is nothing wrong. Fine. Okay. So don't discuss much about review now. Okay. Don't think about it. So uh, the government may also put an odd, may also put a condition that the periodical results must be reviewed by auditors or audit might be conducted. Either audit or review might be conducted as the manner in the banner whatever prescribed okay so once quarter results prepared review report or audit report of the auditor obtained what you have to do file the copy with the registrar within a period of 30 days from the completion of the relevant period if it is a quarter from the end of the quarter 30 days if it is half year from the end of the half year it is 30 days if it is 120 days from the end of 120th day 30 days once in four months they need to prepare periodical results we don't know when once government gives the order, then only this is applicable. So that is section 129A, filing of periodical results by unlisted companies prescribed by central government. So that class of unlisted companies which are covered under the order of the central government shall prepare periodical results on such basis using such format as may be prescribed by central government. And these unlisted, you know, uh, these financial results, periodical financial results must be audited or reviewed by any person or auditor as per the order and these must be filed with ROC within 30 days from the end of the period whatever is mentioned 30 days this is important MCQ might come that's it. so that's about 129A then coming to next two more sections what that is 130 and 131 what is 130 130 is called as reopening of accounts Whereas 131 is about revision of financial statements. In fact, I call it as voluntary revision of financial statements or board of directors report. Voluntary revision of financial statements and board report. 131. Whereas 130, reopening of accounts. By, by whom? Reopening of accounts. Reopening of accounts by generally tribunal or court. Either the court or tribunal will reopen. So, sir, what is this reopening of accounts at a glance, simply? Suppose, my company doing business, every year I am preparing financial statements, audit is being conducted, every year I am filing with ROC, everything is going fine. Suddenly, one day, income tax department conducted raid. They opened and checked my past 3-4 years financial statements and books of accounts. They discovered so many frauds. Our company management committed so many frauds. Now the income tax department discovered these frauds. Are so many frauds were there? So much of under disclosure of turnover. So much of understatement of profit. Tax has been evaded. GST is also evaded. This company is completely cheating. Entire government, public, shareholders, everybody. Now income tax department, what they did? They put order on us. They added all that income. They collected income tax, everything. But now with, now with that, they didn't stop. They intimated to GST department. They intimated most importantly to NCLT. They filed a complaint with the court. Competent reason, jurisdictionary court. So they went and filed a complaint with the court that this company is cheating. Okay. So now income tax department filed a petition, filed a complaint, filed an application to the tribunal or court that our company is fraudulently preparing the financial statements for so and so years. Now what that court or tribunal can do? They can reopen the accounts. A direct ABC Limited. You prepared false accounts. I am reopening your accounts for these financial years. Okay. We will investigate. These are all the mistakes we identified. Modify the accounts like this. So that is called order for reopening of accounts. Now, for how many years or with respect to, to what period the court or tribunal can reopen the accounts maximum 8 years preceding the year. So let's see what is covered. A company shall not reopen books of accounts, shall not recast. A company shall not reopen, shall not retotal unless 
an application is made by central government or income tax authority or SEBI. Actually, central government includes income tax authority, but since still they gave separate specific point or any other regulatory body or any person concerned, aggrieved person, if anybody else aggrieved by the company fraudulent financials, he can file a complaint. And if that complaint is received by the tribunal and they convinced, they may pass an order. To whom you will make an application? A court, a com court of competent jurisdiction, the company, where the company is located, in which city, that really related court or the tribunal. Now, what court or tribunal will do? The court or tribunal may pass an order to revise the accounts, to retotal the financial statements of the company if they satisfied, they got a proof, the earlier accounts were prepared in a fraudulent manner, the affairs of the company were mismanaged during past three years, casting a doubt on the reliability of the financial statements. If the court understood that, yeah, company financial statements were fraudulently prepared, the affairs of the company were mismanaged, somebody wrongly managed this company, in that case, in that case, what, what court or can do? What court or tribunal can do? They may pass an order. They may pass an order to revise the accounts and retotal the financial statements of the company. Two reasons. Relevant earlier accounts were prepared in fraudulent manner. Uh, the affairs of the company were mismanaged during the relevant period. Which because of which there is a doubt on the reliability of the financials which are already filed with ROC. The court, you know, shall give notice to the applicant, shall take into consideration the representations, if any, made by them before passing the order. So, before you pass the order of revision, whoever applicant is there, a hey, applicant, income tax department, these are the changes I am passing an order. Are they okay or do you have any objection? I will once again ta take the representation before passing the final order. And the accounts are so revised after finally revising the accounts, after finally retotaling the entire financials, they shall be final and that cannot be revised later on. Mandatory revision. This is mandatory revision by the tribunal or court because they received an application from either the government or departments or statutory authorities or any other person concerned. When they will pass an order, if they convince that books of accounts were, sorry, financials were prepared on fraudulent manner. The company affairs were mismanaged during the period. Now, no order, there is a, sir, for how, what period? Sir, 10 years back, company, you know, fraudulently prepared balance sheet PNL, sir, can we reopen? No, no order shall be made for reopening books of accounts related to a period earlier than 8 years immediately preceding the current year. Suppose you are in the current year 21-22. Before 21-22, 8 years. Uh, in 21-22, court will pass 130 order pertaining to last 8 years excluding 21-22. Suppose if the company is maintaining books of accounts for more than 8 years because of a government order. Because some investigation is going on, company retained books of accounts for more than 8 years. In fact, right now, company is having past 10 years records. In that case, you can reopen any of the past 10 years record. Generally, for how many years company will maintain books of accounts? 8 years. So, you have to keep, you know, you have to, uh, uh, you know, you can pass order only with respect to any of the past 8 years. That's it. That's about uh, reopening. Now, revision. What is revision? Here, who will request, uh, who will revise? Company itself will put a request. If it appears to the directors of the company, if the directors of the company feel financial statements of the company, board report, do not comply with the provisions of relevant sections. 129 talks about financial statements preparation. 134 talks about board of directors report preparation. If the directors of the company felt that, sir, our financial statements in the last three years, no, one year financials, no, they were not prepared as per 129, sir. Some accounting standards we did not follow, sir. We prepared board reports, sir. Some points we, we did not follow, sir. If board of directors felt that, if board of directors discovered some mistakes in the financial statements and board report of the past three years, not eight years, reopening of accounts is eight years. This one, revision of financials voluntarily by the company is only three years. Understand? So, they do not comply with 129 or 134. They may prepare revised financial statement, revised board of report in respect of any of the three preceding financial years. Suppose, right now I am in 21-22. Right now I am in 21-22. Suppose, uh, I am in April month 2022. Why April 2022 comes in which financial year? 22-23. Now I discovered 
some error in my books of accounts some error in my financials or the same error is repeated in board of directors report also some financial highlights is there in board report financial highlights are there financial statements were wrong the same information is given in board of directors report are both are wrong now i want to revise okay which year accounts board report you want to revise 16 17 financial year are 16 17 financial year is more than 3 years you are in 20 to 23 right now you are putting application no before 20 to 23 3 years means what 21 22 20 21 19 20 ha huh. if you are in 20 to 23 now if you want to revise you can revise financial statements or board of report belonging to any 3 years any of these 3 or all of these 3 anything whatever it is so you can revise only real, relating to past 3 years you can't revise more than 3 years so now okay sir can company directly revise and file again no first before revision the revision can be made only after getting approval of the tribunal nclt after making an application you make an application to the tribunal first file an application then revise only after getting approval and once you got the approval you will get an approval by an order tribunal will give an order okay your application is approved that order whatever paised by tribunal first of give, inform to ROC hey, ROC I, I filed financial statements with you no I am revising see tribunal permission I have tribunal shall serve notice tribunal has one duty tribunal tribunal approved no along with me tribunal will also tell to income tax department GST department ROC hey, so and so company requested for revision of financial statements for so and so reasons look at all these reasons you also go and check whether companies are paying you tax properly or not they already paid tax i know but check once again because they're revising the accounts the tribunal shall give notice to the government and the tax authorities and shall take into account whatever their words representations if any made by government before passing any order under this section and remember once Books of once the financial statements and board report is revised once again revision is not permitted only one time it is permitted suppose right now I'm in financial year 20 to 23 preceding three years means what 20 uh, 21 22 20 21 19 20 now I discovered a mistake in 19 20 I discovered a mistake in 19 20 I went and filed the application with NCLT they permitted revised i revised i refiled with uh, roc everything revised again i discovered one more mistake in 2021 no you can't do that only one time see in other words from this year when a company has revised financial statements or board report pertaining to any of the three preceding years then it's actually then such revised statements shall not be revised again for the period it has been so revised you already revised for 2021 you can't revise once again so revision for a particular year financial statements and board report can only be done only once and not only that now you revise you know 20 to 23 now 20 to 23 after it is over you give financial statements for current year you give board report for current year no in that board report tell that 2021 related financials revised during the year the detailed reasons for revision of the financials and board report whatever shall be disclosed in the current year board report in the relevant year in which revision is made we made revision in 20 to 23 in this year board report you shall mention about 2021 financials which are revised and remember you can only revise where copies of the financial statements or board report has been given to members delivered to ROC laid before the company the revision must be confirmed to correction with respect to previous financial statements or report only if there is a non-compliance with these two and consequential alteration this point is not required you can revise only for one reason why you either you either Ha, you either contravened 129 or 134 only these two reasons only you can revise the accounts you can't revise accounts for any other reason sir section 129 schedule 3 division 1 format is given sir for me division 2 is applicable sir index is applicable sir but i filed financial statements with normal accounting standard now i want to revise ah revise because 129 says schedule 3 shall be followed division 2 if applicable division 2 shall be followed sir some other reason i have some other reason i have i want to sir some incomes and expenses i did not recognize in the last year sir prior period items are there can i revise no it's not a 129 item prior period item is not a 120 prior period item is covered in accounting standard and you can recognize in current year as a prior period item that's it 
only if you fail with 129 some technical things 134 some technical things then only you can revise voluntarily by making application this H point is not required how this revision shall be made central government made what is the manner of revision that is not required so that's it with respect to reopening of accounts and revision of financial statements i hope you understood thoroughly 129a periodical results 130 reopening of accounts 131 and revision of accounts by revision of financial statements or board report by board of directors i hope you're clear listen once again listen once again the past 20 25 minutes very important these three provisions 129 130 131 from exam point of view okay yes <clears throat> we'll continue now with the uh, nfra then i will continue with csr then remaining provisions of this chapter i will check it out i hope you are understanding well okay let's continue yes continuation so just we completed 129a 130 and 131 now we are discussing another important provision of this particular chapter that is 132 nfra national financial reporting authority you know uh, from in 2018 nfra was constituted in 2019 nfra was given full powers the moment nfra was given so many powers one of the power which is given for nfra is investigate chartered accountants investigate chartered accountants and audits conducted by them this created a lot of mess in the CA fraternity. Institute has opposed. So there are various reasons why ICA has opposed uh, NFRA with respect to the power to investigate audit forms. Okay. So there are so many reasons. So one of the reasons is because NFRA is a government department. NFRA officials are government people who are not chartered accountants. They may unnecessarily screw chartered accountants and get rob money from them. So, so many reasons. Uh, bribe so many reasons for there why ICI has opposed but nevertheless irrespective of opposition by ICI finally just a minute finally NFRA has been implemented now with respect to section 132 what are the important things from exam point of view there are three provisions that are important first of all what are all the companies that are covered under NFRA purview? Not every company is covered under NFRA. Only few categories of companies are covered. Five categories of companies are covered under NFRA. Five categories of companies. Okay, like listed entities, all listed entities, all listed companies are covered under NFRA. Comma. And uh, all unlisted public all unlisted public companies only public remember unlisted public companies subject to satisfaction of any one criteria they have given three criteria capital criteria turnover criteria borrowings criteria three criteria we have given any one criteria if it is satisfied even that unlisted public company is covered within the scope of nfra third category of company that is covered is special entities like insurance companies banking companies special entities electricity entities these companies are also covered within the scope of nfra fourth category of company if central government requested nfra to review investigate about a particular company that company is not covered in any of these three that is not covered in any of these three central government selected one company what is central government some income tax department or gst department somebody have detected some fraud in some private company or in some public company which does not come under category 2 which does not come under category 1 which does not come under category 3 but some severe fraud is there they want to investigate so who is who is already available experts in investigation nfra so income tax department requested nfra nfra please investigate into accounts of this company please investigate into audit so on a special request received from central government and its department nfra will investigate that company okay so special request companies special request companies and fifth category material subsidiary company or associate company of these four material associate company material subsidiary company of these four companies so if these four companies are covered under nfra purview right naturally automatically material subsidiary company material associate remember material uh, only material subsidiary companies material associate companies are covered 
only material associate companies and subsidiary companies are covered not all subsidiary companies only material sir what is a material subsidiary if that subsidiary income or that subsidiary net worth is 20 percent of the total group net worth then in consolidated financials that subsidiary company share is 20 percent then it's a material subsidiary state bank of uh, reliance industries limited is having 270 plus subsidiary companies but do you think all 274 companies are material subsidiaries no maybe hardly 5 or 10 not even 5 or 10 hardly some 2 or 3 you will find material subsidiaries for a, for a company material subsidiaries will be one or two only in spite of having hundreds of companies fine don't worry i'll come to that uh, once again while reading it okay so what are the functions of nfra first of all one of the most important function is they make recommendations on formulation and laying down of accounting and auditing policies and standards until we, before this provision came who is recommending accounting standards and auditing standards to central government who is participating in the designing of standards institute of chartered accountants of india and now nfra is taking over that power taking over that role of course now institute is also placing is participating in recommendation even nfra is also participating in the recommendation nfra is an authority constituted under companies act under companies act it is constituted authority constituted under companies act institute of chartered accountants of india is a regulatory body constituted by a separate act of parliament now so nfra make recommendations what are the functions of nfra four functions they can make recommendations to the central government with respect to designing of auditing and accounting policies and standard nfra can monitor they can enforce compliance with standards and auditing standards how okay i recommend standards are these standards followed by people chartered accountants i will see are the accounting standards implemented by companies i will monitor okay and i will check oversee quality of service of professions associated for compliance with such standard and suggest measures required for improvement in quality of service oversee the quality of services by professionals nothing but oversee the quality of services means what investigation of chartered accountant forms perform such other functions under clause abc as may be prescribed whatever given under above incidental to any other function is required that function so three main functions recommending central government uh, regarding accounting and auditing standards designing all that monitoring and enforcing compliance with these standards oversee the quality of professionals example chartered accountants next so now they have these many functions right when these many functions were there to execute these functions, NFRA should be given some powers. Yes or no? So, what are the powers of the NFRA? They have the power to investigate on their own, Suyomoto, or on a reference made to it by central government. What do you mean by central government? Central government means the central government and all its department, income tax department, GST department, finance department, these are all various departments of central government. Either on my own or by receiving a request from a central government department, I have investigation power of such class of body corporates or persons, uh, you know, into the matters of professional or other misconduct committed by any firm or firm of chartered accountants. So I can investigate into affairs of a company or person into the matters of professional or other misconduct committed by any member. So if any member of the chartered accountant, if any institute, you know, CA, did he commit any professional misconduct? Did he commit any other misconduct? I have power to investigate and check. You know, once NFRA proceedings started, no other institute, no other body shall initiate or continue any existing proceedings okay where nfra initiated once nfra take up the case of a particular chartered accountant on him whatever cases going on under icai or under some other panel everything will discontinue nfra will investigate straight away then what are the powers of the you know, nfra second power so the first power they have they can investigate any person or class of companies okay and they can investigate into any misconduct conducted by chartered accountant firms okay and while investigating they have all the powers which are given for a civil court what kind of powers that are there for civil court while they are carrying investigation same powers were also given for nfra so nfra can demand production of books of accounts and other documents at any place decided by nfra they can call someone and enforce the attendance of person they can inspect any books registers other documents of any person referred in class b that is members of ICI. 
they can refer any books of members of they can issue commissions for examination of fitness or document they can issue orders to call that person call this person so they have all the powers that a civil court is having <coughs> and you know they can investigate they can call and investigate now if professional or other misconduct is proved suppose if the misconduct is proved sir what do you mean by professional misconduct what do you mean by other misconduct ca act has a two schedule schedule one schedule two you will get this in ca final ca final advanced auditing paper three i only deal with advanced auditing paper three at ca final in that we have a chapter called professional ethics which is 12 to 14 marks chapter for ca final inside that we will be discussing ca act what is professional misconduct what is uh, other misconduct all that if that misconduct is proved nfra uh, voluntarily or based on a complaint investigated they called persons checked books of accounts all that accounts records various things documents audit working papers all that they saw and they discovered ca is grossly negligent some professional misconduct is discovered they can impose a penalty how much minimum 1 lakh or it may extend depending upon the severity five times if the auditor is individual suppose if the auditor is a partnership firm minimum five lakhs fine which may extend to 10 times not only that not only that if they will impose penalty and nfra can debar the member from being appointed as an auditor or internal or undertaking any audit in respect of financial statement central auditor any body corporate they can debar the member from taking audit assignments okay and minimum how many months they can debar six months maximum how many years they can debar 10 years nfra if if a chartered accountant like you and me if we were proved as guilty nfra will will impose penalty minimum one lakh or five times of the fee or in case of from five lakh rupee minimum 10 times of the fee whichever is whatever you know it may extend it may extend there is no such concept of whichever is lawyer whichever is side there is no such concept minimum 5 lakhs if the if the if the negligence if the misconduct if the mistake is so big 10 times of this in case of form individual 1 lakh or 5 times of this maximum now not only penalty penalty okay i'll pay you know they will debar me they will debar me for minimum 6 months to 10 years okay i am prohibited to do valuation i am prohibited to do audit not only stat audit internal audit also i am prohibited to do so these are the you know powers of nfra nfra has power to investigate nfra has same powers like a civil court if once uh, once a misconduct is proved nfra will levy penalty and nfra will debar a member from taking up audits stat internal or valuation works minimum six months or maximum 10 years these are the powers of nfra now suppose no suppose nfra passed an order on a chartered accountant and he was he is not at all ready to accept that allegation by nfra that order he can go to neclat national company law appellate tribunal national company law appellate tribunal appellate tribunal so he will go to the uh, nc neclat we call it as nclt not nclt nclt above there is an authority called neclat nclat national company law appellate tribunal that's it so you can go and file a case on the nfra finally neclat will decide suppose if neclat also failed go to high court if that is also failed, go to Supreme Court. And once Supreme Court decides, that is final. That's it. Now, uh, composition of NFRA. This concept is not required from exam point of view. Meetings of NFRA, all this not required. Now, question number 12. This is important. What are the companies that are covered under NFRA? Per I told you five categories of companies. What are they? What are they? Listed companies. Companies whose securities are listed in any stock exchange. It may be in India or outside India and not only that unlisted public company which means private limited companies are not covered within the scope of nfra remember mcq may come so any unlisted public company satisfying satisfying three conditions given any one enough if any one condition is satisfied nfra is covered okay see paid up capital minimum 500 crores turnover minimum 1000 crores aggregate loans debentures deposits minimum 500 crores as on 31st march of the last year Suppose my paid up capital, 100 crores only sir, okay, condition 1 failed, check condition 2, turnover, is it 1000 crores, no sir, check borrowings criteria, borrowings deposit, all the debentures all together, is it minimum 500, 550 crores, ah, NFRA applicable for you, sir, I am an unlisted, one condition satisfied, na, NFRA is applicable for you, 
not only that if you are coming at a special entity insurance banking companies engaged in electricity or any companies governed by any special act body corporates incorporated by any act all body corporates nfra can even investigate into icia affairs because it's a body corporate incorporated by an act nfra can investigate into lic affairs nfra can investigate into general insurance corporation nfra can investigate into food corporation of india because they're all body corporates so these are entities then so three categories one is listed unlisted public company subject to some criteria and uh, special entities and any body corporate any company any class of body corporates are government on a reference made to nfra by central government in suppose the central government in public interest requested nfra nfra look into this company case sir that company is not covered on the above three list it's okay look into then also that company is liable under nfra and then not only them a body corporate incorporated registered outside india which is a subsidiary or associate company of any company body corporate referred in the a to d above in the above four no you have above four right these four for any of these four companies if there is any material subsidiary material associate company that is also covered within the nfra company what is a material subsidiary if the income or net worth exceeds 20 percent of the consolidated income or 20 percent of the consolidated net worth any one criteria that's enough they are also covered within the nfra per view so that's enough second point sir i am an unlisted company sir last year borrowing expanded crore crossed okay nfra applicable sir this year applied Sir, but this year, you know, as on 31st March, all limits are satisfied, sir. I mean, paid up capital not satisfied, turnover not satisfied, borrowing not satisfied. Am I exempted from NFRA next year? A body corporate or company shall continue to be governed by NFRA minimum three years after it ceases to be listed, after its paid up capital turnover all falls within the below the limits. Suppose, sir, I'm a originally listed company, sir. Turnover and all 10, 10, 10 crores all very less sir but still listed nfra applied okay now i delisted sir i don't come under any of the five categories i will not fall sir now now is nfra exempted when you delisted this year only ah from this year three years nfra still applies for you after three years sir, then you are exempted suppose within three years sir, if any of the above five categories you fall under once again again nfra applies sir Okay. So, a company shall continue to be governed by NFRA for minimum 3 years even after it ceases to be a category company. Minimum 3 years. Once you come out of any of these 5 categories, once you come out of all the 5 categories, 3 years still NFRA apply. 3 years nothing. You didn't come under, you didn't touch any of the above 5 categories. Enough. You are, you are exempted from NFRA applicability. So, that's about NFRA applicability. So, question number 13 is not an important question. That is not required. Question number 13 is not required. Then, so now, now what we will discuss is same as per our order. So, 129A, 130, 131, 132. And now, 135, which is important. So, once we will discuss 135, then I will come to 134 board report, 128, 129, all that. Okay. Yes. So, we will go with 135. What is 135? Corporate social responsibility. What is 135? Corporate social responsibility. Yes. Question number 17. Come to question number 17 in this material. If at all you are following some other material, in that material you can follow. No issue at all. But this material, we, we did cover comprehensively everything. That's it. Okay. So, continue watching for CSR. Yeah. So, let's continue. So just we completed NFRA and now the most important topic that is 135 corporate social responsibility expenditure. You know this 135 is such a lengthy concept actually it has nine subsections. Most importantly uh, any that any book that you are reading or maybe ICA material you are reading this topic is spread over approximately five pages around and many students with respect to this topic they are having lots of confusion. Now, listen carefully, approximately some 25 to 30 minutes, this topic alone we will be spending. You will get a clarity like never before with respect to CSR. Okay, we'll start. First of all, you can also take notes along with me for this concept. Okay, or else, or else do one thing. First, listen to whatever I'm saying, then you copy. So, first of all, which companies has to spend 
CSR expenditure. What is first of all corporate social responsibility? I'll explain little detailed, uh, not like a pure marathon, little bit detailed, but not at the same time like a regular course. Okay, yeah. So uh, first of all, which companies are liable to spend CSR and what is CSR? Corporate social responsibility. One of the Mahatma Gandhi principle, whatever you are earning is coming from the society. So today, companies are creating empires. So lots of companies are growing like anything. How are they getting it? Of course, their idea, their business, okay, fine. But ultimately, who is paying you that money? The people around you, the general public. So you are getting that growth, money, net worth, wealth, everything from the, from the you know, society. Give back to the society. So on that principle, every company, you know, social responsibility is not just an individual responsibility. Even companies will have social responsibility. Companies must spend for social responsibility. This is not a business expenditure. Whatever a company, suppose if a company is spending under 135 because of statutory requirement, you cannot claim it as a deduction under income tax, PGBP. You don't get CSR expenditure as a deduction. You can't claim it under 80 series, chapter 6 also. Just you have to spend it. That's it. So, okay, fine, understood at a glance. Now, which companies are liable for incurring CSR expenditure? You know, every company, every company, sir, listed, unlisted, no such variation. Every company, it may be listed, unlisted, private, public, government, non-government, whatever. Every company, even foreign companies, even foreign companies, every company, including foreign company, satisfying any of the three criteria net worth 500 crore or more okay turnover 1000 crore or more net profit 5 crore or more sir all the criteria no 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 any one suppose my net worth is already 500 crore huh enough that's it you are liable for csr expenditure no not exceeding look at your turnover is it 1000 crores no not exceeding Still one more criteria. Profit. Do you have six, five crores or more than that? Ha, huh, yes, sir. Ha, huh, you are liable for CSR. Sir, I did not comply with the two criteria. It's okay, man. Any one satisfied, that's enough. You want a proof? I'll open the proof directly. You see, this is the Bear Act. So, every company, look at this. Every company having net worth. What do you mean by net worth? The definition is also given. It is not required from exam point of view. Every company having net worth of 500 crores or more or the, the, the word used is or if turno, net worth criteria not satisfied, check turnover. Turnover of rupees 1000 crores or more not satisfied. Check the third criteria. Net profit 5 crore or more. During which year? Current year? No, no, no. In the immediately preceding financial year. Suppose right now, right now I am in 22, 23 financial year. Right now I am in 22. Sir, in this year, should I spend money on CSR? What is last year? 21, 22. For 21, 22, check these limits. Ha, huh, satisfied, sir. One limit satisfied. Ah, in 22, 23, you must spend CSR expenditure. You must incur CSR expenditure. Next. Next. So, uh, so, so CSR. So, in the immediately preceding, they shall constitute a CSR committee of board of directors consisting three or more directors out of which one must be at least one independent director so what is the provision any com every company which is satisfying any one criteria what they need to do they must constitute a csr committee you know uh, csr committee means who will be part of this committee minimum three directors should participate in this committee out of these three one at least must be independent director sir mine is a private company sir Independent director question do not apply. Moreover, I'm having only two directors, sir. Okay, if you do not have independent director, if you are having only two directors, then with the two directors only form CSR committee. With the two directors only form CSR committee. Now, with respect to CSR committee, they have given one exemption. Which companies are not required to have a CSR committee? Subsection 9 says, suppose if the company amount to be spent up, if the amount to be spent does not exceed 5050 lakhs, then CSR committee shall not apply. No need to put a separate committee. 
whatever functions of the committee they can be discharged by board of directors a separate committee not required directors itself discharge when separate committee is required any of the one criteria satisfied expenditure is 50 lakhs or more okay then csr committee shall be constituted there must be a separate committee board of directors cannot handle everything they have so many works to do put a separate committee they will look exclusively into CSR activities like how audit committee looks into audit related activities CSR committee will look into CSR related activities put a separate committee they only focus on CSR related things who will be the part of this committee directors only so CSR committee so a director will have a director capacity board of director and he is also a member of CSR committee that's it now next next okay sir understood slightly every company uh, which satisfies any one criteria they must have a csr committee and through csr committee they must uh, uh, execute 135 you know conditions okay sir fine okay sir committee comes to what we have to do nothing you have to spend money you have to spend money for what social activities what activities schedule 7 there is a schedule under companies act that is called schedule 7 they described so many issues they described so many issues for all these activities you can spend money then only we will call it as csr expenditure okay sir schedule 7 funds are there so many activities are covered education you know rural upliftment so many disaster management so many were covered okay we will spend how much we should spend sir you must spend minimum how much csr expenditure minimum two percent of average net profits of three preceding financial years last three years how much is your profits total it last three years sir right now you are in 22 23 no i ignore this 21 22 2021 20, 19 20 total it by three how much average profit ah that much on that apply two percent how much amount game that much you should spend in this year in this year you have to spend sir should I spend entire two percent money, sir? I'm my company is a Reliance Industries Limited, sir. Last year I have thousand crore. That you know, last year I have thirty thousand crore. That last year I have forty thousand crore profit. That last year I'm having twenty thousand crore. So total it by three is equal to thirty thousand crore profit. I have, sir. Average profit is thirty thousand crore into two percent <coughs> means six hundred crore. Sir, 600 crore should I, should I conduct on social activities in one year only? Sir, I want to, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, develop one village, sir. That village development takes three years, sir. That village, village development takes two years, sir. I can't spend entire money within one year. How, what is the, you know, remedy in this case? I want to develop village. That is covered in Schedule 7, sir. Development of rural areas is covered. It will take two, three years, sir. But you are saying entire money shall be spent in the current year. Can I, can I spend this 2% over some number of years? Logically speaking, entire 2% must be spent in the same financial year. You must spend, means money should go out. Sir, I am trying, sir, 600 crores, I want to spend and develop some villages, sir. But it will take multiple years, sir. So this year, I only spent 300 crore, sir. Still 300 crore left with me. What should I do? You know, what is this called as 300 crore? This 300 crore is called as unspent money. This 300 crores is called as what? Unspent money. Okay, what we should do? Unspent money. Now, by the way, you are spending now already. Is it an ongoing project? No, yes, sir, it's an ongoing project. What is an ongoing project? Ongoing project is a multi-year project. What is a multi-year project? Logically, CSR expenditure must be spent in the same year. Yes or no? But, if at all, directors and CSR committee decided to spend it over two or three years, multiple years. Can they spend in the multiple years? Yes, there are some conditions. Normally, you should spend entirely in the same year. But there are some conditions. Suppose you want to spend on a particular project which will not complete within one year. But it will take few multiple years. It's a multi-year project. Then only we call it as an ongoing project. Okay, you unspent some 300 crore. No, it is really, it's an unspent money. No, is it relating to ongoing project? Yes, sir, it is ongoing project. 
you can't spend entirely one year no sir we can't spend do you really have intention to spend yes i'm having really intention that money is there already ready i'm ready to spend but the problem is time i can't spend immediately not possible only once road is constructed we can construct some water tanks and all road itself is taking one year when will i construct water tank i have money ready to spend the problem is time taken for incurring expenditure okay okay fine don't spend entirely within one year try to spend within one year not possible no don't worry so if it is something ongoing project the project you are spending on a project and that project is going more than one year multiple year project okay if it is ongoing project do one thing okay i want i want that money to be safely spent you can't cheat me i'm a ministry of corporate you should not cheat me what what condition suppose 300 crore you spent that's okay 300 crore unspent no that unspent is relating to ongoing project no that you are telling uh, what you need to do this 300 crore transfer to transfer to separate bank account called unspent csr expenditure account what is it called as unspent csr account or unspent simply unspent csr account transfer to that bank account when should i transfer sir year will complete no year will complete no suppose right now you are in 22 23 year will complete on 31st march 2023 from 31st march 2023 within 30 days within 30 days 30 days from the end of the financial year, within 30 days from the end of the financial year put this 300 crore in a bank account which bank account unspent csr activity bank account unspent, unspent csr expenditure bank account to put separate bank account deposit there uh, show me proof uh, okay fine you have money you are you are ready to spend only thing is some technical difficulties are there okay fine now Sir, unspent bank, I, I transfer, sir. Now, within what time that money kept in bank account shall be spent? Can I have infinite time? No, no, no. You have only three years of time. You have only three years of time. From when? From 30 days after? No, 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 no. From in which, on which date you transferred? Sir, somewhere on 10th April I transferred, sir. From 10th April, within three years, entire 300 crore must be spent entire 300 crore must be spent actually entire 600 crore you should spend in 22 23 only but the problem is it's not possible to spend for you so i am allowing you to spend over multiple number of years how many years maximum i will allow three years i will only wait maximum next to three years if you can't spend entire money within this year and you already started the project it is in between it is in progress ongoing project you already started the project remember the condition is it's ongoing project you already started the project as on 31st march the project is not yet complete you already spent partial some amount some partial amount is spending that is already two percent of your net profit totally you kept aside partially you spent two percent of net profit 600 crore 300 crore you spent 300 crore still pending transfer within 30 days from the end of the financial year to unspent csr activity account from that account withdraw and spend on this project finish this project within three years from the date of transfer sir i couldn't sir within three years no 280 crore i spent sir within three years i spent 280 crore still 20 crore is lying sir what should i do what will i do transfer the 20 crore to transfer that 20 crore to schedule 7 fund what is it transfer that account to schedule 7 fund what is schedule 7 in schedule 7 there are some funds called prime minister national relief fund scientific research development from some government funds are there transfer to that fund donate to that fund it's a simple like donation you fail to spend no 20 crores give it as donation to government prime minister national relief fund prime minister cares fund donate that's enough over sir Suppose I spend 300 crores on some projects that are already over in the current year. Still 300 crore remained, sir. We couldn't spend. Have you started the project or no, sir? We couldn't start any project. The 300 crore is just lying. Now only we should plan how to spend all that. Okay, you don't have any excuse. Within six months of the end of the financial year, within six months of the end of the financial year, 31st March 2023 came, within six months, transfer it to Schedule 7 transfer it to schedule 7 funds directly no more excuse no unspent account no three years time limit three years time limit when i will give you already started the project it is in between money is there project is going on three years i will wait you didn't start project itself that clearly shows you don't have any interest on spending just for namesake you kept side money you want to cheat later on no no, no i will not allow within six months a transfer to government funds we will take care 
so so that is the condition so what is the condition see i will show you here i will show you i hope you are able to reconnect i hope you are able to connect with me put a reply under the comments how you understand how how far you understood these provisions you know mention your reply so 2% no see what if you are failed to spend minimum minimum amount first disclose the reason why you couldn't spend out of 600 crore only 300 crore spent 300 you didn't spend why mention the reason sir uh, you mentioned uh, because of ongoing project 300 crores we kept aside uh, suppose if the unspent amount is other than ongoing no ongoing project no more excuse transfer entire that amount to a fund specified under schedule 7 within six months from the end of the financial year Sir, I already started the project, sir. Rural development example. It will take two, three years for developing the village. How can how come you insist on me? How come you compel me to spend entire six hundred crore through on road? Ah, suppose you are you you take up some big project, multi-year project, and because of that, that money was idle. Okay, six hundred crore, three hundred crore. You spend three hundred crore still is there. Any amount remaining unspent because of any ongoing project shall be transferred by the company within thirty days from the end of the financial year to a special account which shall be opened on behalf of the company. You know, which is called as unspent CSR account. Unspent CSR account, and that amount shall be spent for that obligation toward. CSR policy within three years from the date of that transfer within three financial years you have to transfer failing which suppose you failed at the end of third year still 20 crore lying whatever amount left shall be transferred to again schedule several fund within 30 days from the date of completion of third year once third year over within 30 days whatever amount lied in that special account transferred to government authority Sir, what are Schedule 7 funds? Can you give us one idea about what are the Schedule 7 funds? I'll show you right now. What are Schedule 7 funds? Contribution funds. Contribution to PM Relief Fund. PM Citizen Assistant Relief in Emergency. PM Cares for nothing but any other fund set up by Central Government for socio-economic development, all that. Okay, contribution to incubators, research development projects, you, which are, you know, you, all, you would have all seen this in PGBP, all that. So, all these funds you donate. Okay, especially this one, PM fund, Prime Minister, National Fund, Prime Minister, CARES fund, any other fund set up by central government or state government, so transfer to that fund. If you could not spend, if 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 at all you could not spend, no project, transfer within six months. There is a project, uh, within 30 days, uh, transfer to unspent CSR account. From that account, within three years, use it. Couldn't use within three years, whatever amount lying pending, uh, transfer within next 30 days to these fund. That's it. Sir, for what activities I can spend CSR? For basic needs like hunger, poverty, malnutrition, all this elimination, education and training, for uh, gender equality, empowering women, all that. Okay, so many, so many, setting up old age homes, all that. In, uh, for environmental purpose, ecology purpose, for uh, heritage, protection of heritage, culture, and for armed forces you can use, for sports, for sports you can use. Sir, what are all not covered within CSR purview, sir? Which expenditure do not qualify for CSR? My employees were there, sir. I am constructing houses and giving it to all my employees, sir. I am constructing my house and giving it to all my employees. Will I, can I claim this as CSR expenditure? No. The following expenditure cannot be taken as CSR. Any activities which are taken in portions of normal course of the business. Like generally, company to promote their brand name, okay, uh, uh, free samples they are distributing. That free samples, whatever distributed by company, no, you cannot call it as a, you know, a CSR expenditure. Suppose companies, you know, researching for a particular drug development. My company is a pharma company. We are developing a particular drug for a particular disease, research and development. A hey, normal pharma company, research and development is a regular activity. You don't, don't call it a CSR. Spend for something else. Hey, you know, pharma companies, they have given one special exemption. Research and development activity related to vaccine development of COVID-19. For the financial is 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23. Subject to that particular research, you know, is carried in collaboration with uh, some institutes uh, and that activity is disclosed separately in the annual report. In that case, though you are a research and development organization, if you research on COVID related thing, we will call it a CSR. Only with respect to COVID, we will call it a CSR. Okay, so normally in normal course of business, you are a research and development company, you are researching on something, you know, you don't call it a CSR. 
in normal course of business for some marketing or some reason you are distributing samples don't call it as CSR just because you are giving it free don't call it as corporate social responsibility don't link it with your with a CSR if it is something like normal course of activity so don't call it as CSR or any activity you are undertaking outside India anything that you spend outside India no we don't call it as CSR expenditure that is not covered under CSR expenditure that we will not take into account in 2% except training of Indian sports person representing any state or union territory at national or international only for training sports person outside India you can spend money for any purpose outside India you can't spend money there is so much of poverty, hunger, education needs in India. Spend in India, that's enough. Don't spend outside India. Sir, I spent in Somalia. Sir, I donated in Sri Lanka. No, 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 that is not permitted. Donation to political party is not considered as a CSR expenditure. Activities benefiting employees of the company. Okay, that is not a CSR expenditure. You spent, you constructed houses and gave to employees. How you constructed houses and gave to employees. You are benefiting your organization. Where you are benefiting to the society. We want benefit to the society, not your organization. Employee benefit is not covered under CSR. Suppose you, you gave sponsorship for deriving marketing benefits. Some Paralympics, Paralympics, like Paralympics is happening to promote, you know, paralyzed people. Getting it, you are sponsoring and advertising and getting so much brand name. Don't call it a CSR, it's a marketing expenditure. And you are spending because of some statutory obligation. There is compulsory, you know, you, you, you incorporated a fact in a backward area. As part of the license condition, you are supposed to spend some money every year in that backward area. That's a condition under law. Don't call it a CSR. Then what is CSR expenditure? That is something which you have to additionally spend because of section 135 requirement. So how should we spend? We board of directors are so busy. Don't worry. You know, create a committee. Keep some directors in that committee. They only look into CSR activities. Now, sir. Uh, okay, fine, sir. We have formulated a committee. What we have to do? Committee shall formulate a CSR policy. Policy means what, you know, see there are so many activities which companies, there are so many social activities that are there, education, rural development, disaster management, there are so many activities covered. Which activities company will take up? What is the policy of the company? So that is what covered in CSR policy. Please read this on your own, ma. single reading, not required from exam point of view. Whatever is required from exam point of view, I will be covering it full. So, corporate social responsibility means activities undertaken by the company which shall not include, okay, in pursuance of section 135, which shall not include normal course of business activities, any activity carried outside India except for training sports persons, okay, for playing on behalf of state or state or nation in a national or international games, donation, employee benefits, sponsorship and statutory obligations. And the remaining, remaining points are not required in this question. So, which companies are liable to constitute CSR committee? Every company, even foreign company, private company, public company, government company, non-government, listed, unlisted, any company, satisfying any of these net worth 500 crore or more, turnover 1000 crore or more, net profit 5 crore or more, when immediately preceding last year you need to check, okay, shall constitute CSR committee from board of directors at least 3 or more, out of which at least one director shall be independent director. Suppose if there is no independent director, if there is no independent director or if your directors are only two, then with two directors you can constitute. This point is not required, ma. The second point, holding company, foreign company, all that. Sir, mine is a foreign company, sir. In that case, net worth, turnover, net profit, uh, you know, if it's a foreign company, we will calculate as per section 381. Sir, what is 381 section? What is foreign company regulations? That is not covered in CA into. You are having in CA final paper for law, you will be getting. I don't deal paper for my ID, only paper 3, advanced auditing. Fine. Next. See, this is a marathon. Don't think that I am rushing up. I am giving you a lot of clarity. Again, I will connect totally. So, what is net worth? Net worth definition is not required. Okay. So, here some examples were given. Here some examples were given. So, please go through that. Now, sir, uh, like suppose example, sir. Last year, I came within those three limits. Fine covered under CSR, I will spend money, sir. But what happened, no, sir? This year, I didn't cover under CSR, sir. Now, am I exempted from CSR expenditure 2%, sir? Last year, I covered. This year, I spent. This year, I didn't satisfy any limit. My capital is less than 500 crores or net worth. My turnover is less than 1000. My profit is less than 5. You see here. 
exclusion of companies every company which ceases to be a company under 135.1 for three consecutive years shall not be required to constitute csr committee shall not be required to come you know comply with these criteria for three years see one time you cover under any of the limit next to three years csr expenditure you must spend next to three years you these limits not not at all came into picture continuously three years you didn't satisfy net worth criteria turnover criteria profit criteria continuously three years non none of these three you satisfied then accepted for the onwards you are not liable but once you satisfied three years you are liable to spend within these three years in all the three years all the limits are not satisfied for the year are exempted in these three years any one year again satisfied again three years it will continue which means one time if a limit satisfied three years it will apply in every year we will see next year suppose 2021 i saw net worth net worth turnover and profit okay this is not satisfied but profit satisfied ah 21 22 22 23 23 24 you have to comply 21 sir i didn't satisfy 22 i didn't satisfy 23 again sir again next three years it will continue simple logic so csr committee shall have what minimum three directors or more than that and at least one director must be independent suppose if a company is do not have independent director the company is not liable for independent director in that case two or more directors shall form csr committee so composition of csr committee this itself can be asked as a question write about composition of csr committee for three marks which company is liable to constitute csr committee they may ask you so in that case in that case you need to write uh, you need to write uh, this first point so in the 18th question first point is important first point is important fourth point is important fifth point is important composition now when csr committee is not required see you are liable for csr 130 135 by subsection 1 500 crore 1000 crore 5 crore something that is but still committee not required with the board of directors you can manage when if the expenditure if the amount to be spent does not exceed 50 lakh rupees you calculated 2% of average net profit that amount is less than or equal to 50 lakhs if it is more than 50 committee is compulsory if it is less than or equal to 50 committee not required you board of directors can go sir still i want to form committee sir my expenditure is 45 lakh but still i want to form committee okay form it we gave exemption if you don't want to use this exemption it's okay this is a new amendment now sir okay sir committee form later why why this committee sir the committee shall recommend a policy they should design and recommend to board what are the activities under schedule 7 our company can take up remember csr one condition is what you know proviso says one of the proviso says company must give attention to local areas okay where the company is situated local areas they should develop you don't come to south india or north india and develop something remote location go no look first give priority to local areas and so first develop the policy recommend what is the amount to be incurred for activities monitor how the policy is being executed and uh, give action plan every year csr committee directors don't know how to spend all that they need to release money what are all the activities we are going to do in this year okay we know 600 crore money is there what is the action plan for the 600 crore give action plan what are the projects we should take up what are the programs we should take up how should we execute how we should utilize the funds okay how how we should monitor so that funds will not be leaked people will not cheat you know how we should report and do impact assessment what is impact assessment you are spending money you no know? is it really benefiting to that people other people you are developing the rural area is it really benefiting the people in that particular rural village do impact assessment so uh, give an annual action plan now how what projects or programs how we should execute how we should spend the money how to monitor and report how to do impact assessment give an annual action plan that is also your responsibility so what are the duties of csr committee this itself can be asked as a four marks or six marks question what are the what are the active what are the duties of csr committee now okay csr committee understood now what is the board of directors duty with respect to csr they they formed a separate committee they recommended policy no approve the policy being a director approve ultimate decision is with you only approve the policy see that activities are you know included as part of the csr and what are all the activities you are taking display on your website being a director display so what are the duties of board of director in relation to csr so this can be asked as a 3 marks or 4 marks question and how much amount you have to spend 
I only two percent of average net profits. So what is average net profits, sir? Average of last three years, sir. My company incorporated last year only, sir. Then last year profit itself is average profit. Two years only your company is existing, then two year average. If the company is existing for three or more than three, take three years average. Otherwise, uh, one or two years average. That's it. And if you fail to spend, I already explained. Now, uh, sir, you know, as you said, sir, we are spending some CSR projects, sir. We are spending projects, uh, self-help groups we created, women empowerment related, some, some activities we created, you know. Um, we created some small, small business ventures for rural women, sir. When that business venture is carried on, they got some profit. What should we do? Left back into the same project. Put back that profit into the in course of CSR project. If you get any profit accidentally or incidentally, you know, put it back into that. Don't take it into your PNL account. Okay. The board shall ensure, you know, sorry, any surplus arising out of CSR shall not form part of business profit of the company and it shall be put back into the same project. It shall be transferred to unspent CSR account. Okay. If there is no uh, CSR, I mean, in persons of CSR annual action plan, unspent CSR account, if it is ongoing project, suppose if it is not an B point ongoing project, suppose no ongoing project. From a particular project, you got surplus suddenly. That is not an ongoing project. Over that surplus, what you should do? Transfer to Schedule 7 fund within 6 months from the expiry. If it is related to ongoing project, to put transfer to unspent and spend from them. Spend, spend from that. Put back to the same project. Spend in the same year. Whatever surplus you got, spend in the same year. Couldn't spend. Ongoing project. Transfer to unspent CSR activity account and then use it within 3 years. Not ongoing project. Transfer to Schedule 7 fund within 6 months. Simple. And sir, Understood, sir. CSR means what you are telling is entire money, 600, we must spend on rural development only. Sir, but for spending all this, no, we need to recruit staff, we need to recruit some people, stationery, all that, no, so much of administrative expenses we will incur, no. Can we, out of that 600, can we use something for administration? Yes, you can use. How much? Maximum 5% of the total expenditure. Administrative overheads shall not exceed 5%. See, you, 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 you kept 600 crore aside for CSR, out of which 5% means 30 crore. Maximum administration overhead, how much? 30 crore. Remaining 570 crore must go for welfare of the people. Sir, in this year, no, I spent 750 crores, sir. I am actually liable to spend only 600, but 750 I spent. I spent extra, no. Will I have any benefit for the extra? Yes, you can carry forward and spend over next three years. Set off over next. Where a company spends an amount in excess of uh, uh, requirement, that excess amount will be set off against requirement to spend up to three succeeding years. That excess amount shall not include surplus in the project. You got surplus in the project, don't keep that in the excess amount. So that you pluff back. If you spend any excess amount, getting don't set off that surplus. No, 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 no. Surplus is different. The excess amount is different. Any any byproduct or profit you got in the project that keep that for keep for that project. The excess amount spent means what? Total amount 600 plus 150 you spent extra. That is excess amount. The board shall pass a resolution for that effect. Pass a resolution that within next three years we are going to set off. If you do not pass resolution, you can't. So this itself, what if an excess amount is spent? You that company, that excess amount, whatever is spent, can be used to set off against the amount to be spent. Suppose this year 600 crore you are supposed to spend, 750 you spend, 150 you spend extra. Next year 500 only you have to spend, set up 150, only 350 you spend, that facility is there. That's it. Sir, you know as part of CSR, no, I bought one big mission sir. Okay, can I buy a capital asset like this, fixed asset or entire expenditure should be revenue? Ah, you can have a capital asset also, provided it must be in the name of the company established under section 8 for the purpose of CSR. See, actually there is a manner, there is a question called manner of implementation of CSR policy. Sir, how company should spend money? Can company spend directly? Yes, company can directly spend CSR or through a company established, form section 8 company separately. Okay, you only, your company has formerly another company. Suppose Reliance formed Reliance Foundation. Tata group formed a Tata Foundation. Getting it? Okay. Uh, so there are some foundations. So form some Section 8 company. Transfer 600 crore to that Section 8 company. And then spend from spend through that company. All conditions apply. Or you can spend through another company. Which is established by government. 
or you can spend through any entity which is established by parliament or you can spend through any company which is established which is which is a section 8 company which is registered society registered under income tax law also and which is already having established track record of three years so with that company you spend you create your own company transport to government owned company transport to parliament statute special entity or transport to another company which is already in existence for three years or spend in your name directly anyway you can spend and suppose sir okay uh, you know i don't want to spend in my name sir i want to i want to form section 8 company what is the procedure this is newly added 2021 every entity which is intended to undertake csr activity shall register itself with the central government by filing csr1 electronically with effect from 1st april suppose sir i want to you know spend money in my name only sir you register for csr registration no in not in your name another section 8 company name some section 8 company you formed register that yeah registration is compulsory for the company itself as well as for another company through which this company is spending money CSR1 shall be signed and submitted electronically by the company shall be verified by a chartered accountant on submission of this form unique registration number like corporate identification number CSR registration number shall be generated a company may engage into international oh, this is not required ma. and a company may also collaborate with other companies for undertaking projects programs or CSR activities uh, provided they need to report separately on the projects and programs like two companies Infosys we put together developing some villages locality nearby villages ah, they can do together they can do provided they should maintain separate records for each of the expenditure spent that's it so manner of implementation of csr policy this itself can be asked as a four marks question how a company can implement a csr policy directly on its name or through section 8 company incorporated by this company or through uh, 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 or the company can spend through a company which is owned by government or a, a body corporate or entity established by parliament or a company which is already in existence for at least three years okay and whether you spend it directly on your own or through another company all of them should have csr unique registration number what is the procedure they should file csr1 electronically it should be signed and submitted electronically by the entity and certified by chartered accountant or company secretary or cost accountant or somebody that's it and write about csr reporting okay finally fine sir we are liable for csr expenditure we formulated committee we, we developed a policy, board of directors approved it and showed it on website, we spent 2% money, some money is unspent, we transferred as per the rules to unspent account or some amount we directly transferred, you know, if it is not ongoing project, we directly transfer to schedule 7, so much we did know with respect to CSR, should we report all this in the financial statements, no, put a separate report called CSR report, what is it called as CSR report, there is a concept called CSR report, the board of directors report of a company shall include an annual report on CSR, so prepare an annual report on CSR, okay, suppose if it is a foreign company, whatever CSR report is there, Please attach it to the financial statements. Please attach it to the financial statements. Further, further. Okay. If a company is having CSR obligation of 10 crore or more in the three previous years, in the three previous years, 10 crore or more, you are having CSR, you spent 10 crore or more. In that case, do impact assessment of every project where 1 crore or more is involved. In the last three years, you spent 10 crore or more approximately for CSR. Now, you are having so many projects, no? 1 crore or more, whatever projects were there, no? Do impact assessment. Whether the project is giving yield or not. Impact, impact assessment report shall be placed before the board of directors and shall be attached with CSR report. A company undertaking impact assessment may book expenditure towards that. Okay, which shall not exceed 5% of the. So, impact assessment related expenditure, whatever is that, that can also be you know, uh, uh, booked under CSR expenditure, which shall not exceed 5% of the total expenditure. I don't think impact assessment is also important. So, not, not important from exam point of view. What are the activities covered under Schedule 7? That is also not important from exam point of view. I think one of the attempts that they have asked it, but actually it is not important. I think in CMA or somewhere, I, I, I remember, uh, not in CA, okay, but it's not important at all. If possible, give single reading. What are the activities covered under Schedule 7? And some important clarifications were given by MCA. That is not required. Out of that, two clarifications are important. Suppose, 
if a company is carrying like uh, events such as marathons, 10 km marathon, awards functions, charitable contribution, advertisement, sponsorship, they don't come under CSR. Sir, mine is a company, sir. It's an Indian company, but I have a foreign holding company. That company came to India and spent so much money, sir. Can I claim that money as a CSR expenditure of mine? Yes, sir. Expenditure incurred by foreign holding company for CSR activity in India will qualify as CSR for Indian subsidiary if that expenditure are rooted through Indian subsidiary and if the Indian subsidiary is required to do so as per 135. If Indian subsidiary is liable for 135 and foreign company gave me the money and I spent that money for CSR activity, it is treated as I spent CSR. That's it. So these are the two points which are important. So remaining points are not that important. Okay, these are the two clarifications which are important. And with respect to, to COVID, they gave some clarifications, not required ma. from exam point of view, it is not required at all. So with this CSR also we have completed close to 40 minutes we discussed only on CSR. If possible, shall I do, uh, shall I, uh, you know, just a small request. Give one, once again, just listen whatever I told, then, then read these questions. Then give a single reading of all these questions. Question number 17, 18, yes, question number 17, 18 and uh, 19, duties of board, amount to be spent and what is the manner of implementing the policy, how, we, how the company should spend and uh, after spending what they should report and what activities company can spend upon and clarifications given by MCA. Totally 17th question to 25th question is completely single section 135, one of the most complicated provision in this chapter. So be completed. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed until now CSR. Hmm? So with this CSR uh, expenditure is also completed. So now again I will come back to this one, our initial diagram. Our diagram, I will come back to diagram. I do, I hope our rest of students are also watching. Our Sresta students are also watching this classes. So please read. So what are all we have completed? So uh, 130 we completed, 131 we completed, 132 we completed, 135 we completed, 129 we completed. Now only small small provisions are pending. 128, 129, 134, 136, 137, 138. Very small provisions. Okay. So we'll continue. So with this 135 is done. Remaining are actually even if you read on your own, you can understand remaining provisions. Main important crux provisions I explained. That's it. <clears throat> yeah, so let's continue. Section 135 is done, 132 is done, 130, 131, 129A is also done. So now let's discuss 136 and 137. Okay, these are also important from MCQ point of view or they may ask a straight question. So what is section 136? So, uh, sending of the financial statements to members, nothing but right of members to copies of audited financial statements. How this will be circulated first of all? What is the manner in which the financial statements first shall be circulated? How the financial statements shall be circulated? Okay, first I will, you know, uh, 136 talks about uh, every member of a company have right to receive the financial statements. Okay, fine, I agree. How a company shall circulate by electronic mode where the shareholding is in DMAT format and mail IDs are registered with the depository. Suppose if you are holding shares in with a DMAT account, you will get electronically the financials. Suppose where the shareholder is shareholding is held otherwise not in DMAT form. Nowadays it is not possible. Only in private companies this might be there. Okay. So to such members who positively consented in writing for receiving by electronic mode. Suppose if at all he gave a consent that oh, okay I am eligible, I am ready to receive electronic mode to the company. Consent he has given. In that case, you know, uh, he can get electronically. If he has not given consent and shares are not in DMAT format, then you must dispatch physical copies through any recognized mode of delivery. So, if a shareholder shares are not in DMAT format, you must dispatch them. Physical financial statements, audit report, board report, annual report shall be dispatched. By the way, to which companies this provision apply? Manner of circulation. It is applicable for all listed companies and public companies having net worth of 1 crore and turnover of 10 crore rupees. Public company having 1 crore and net worth of 10 crore. For them it is applicable and all listed. So what about private companies? 
private companies no need to circulate the financial statements it is enough if they keep the financial statements at the registered office members can come and inspect that's it so that is a manner of circulation so this itself can be asked as a straight question for three marks please keep a note now first of all okay we understood how a company circulates the financial statements now to whom a company shall circulate when they shall circulate every company every company <coughs> Section 136 provides that a copy of the financial statements including consolidated financials if applicable section 129 subsection 3 talks about consolidated financials I'll come to that later little while so an auditor's report and every other document whatever is important required they shall be laid before a company in the general meeting whatever is liable to be you know kept in general meeting shall be sent to the following persons at least 21 days before to whom every member every trustee of the debenture holder to all other persons you know whoever is so entitled whoever is eligible nothing but simply whoever is eligible to receive notice of AGM notice of AGM to all of them you must send the financial statements plus consolidated financials plus auditors report plus board report and all the documents whatever is liable sir can i send these financial statements for a period less than 21 days i don't have time sir it's already financials are prepared let we are conducting agm little earlier notice also given at a short short period so the financials has to be sent for less than 21 days i can't send more than 21 days before can i yes provided 95 percent of the shareholders agree 95 percent of the shareholders 95 percent voting power related shareholders suppose if it is having share capital not having share capital no share capital 95 percent of the voting power having share capital who represent 95 percent of the paid up capital nothing but in both the cases 95 percent voting power if they give consent okay less than 21 days the, if the copies of documents are sent less than 21 days before the date of meeting it is valid only if shareholders given consent having 95 percent of the paid up capital so if the company is not having paid up capital share capital then voting power 95 percent this is not required now further for listed companies there is additional condition for listed companies they have additional conditions sending 21 days before to members that alone is not they have additional conditions what the copies of the documents they must be available for inspection at the registered office of the company during working hours for 21 days before the date of meeting before you conduct general meeting 21 days before keep all the financials at registered office if anybody want to come and inspect they can inspect and a statement containing silent features important features of the documents okay uh, shall be sent to every member of the company and every trustee okay not less than 21 days before the meeting unless shareholder ask for full financial statements so in case of listed company important features of the financials shall be sent to members and entire set of the financials and documents can be kept at the a registered office shall be kept at the registered office for inspection further not only that listed companies they shall publish on the website every listed company shall place the financials consolidated financials all of the documents on the website further if a company is having subsidiary place a separate audited accounts in respect of each subsidiary on the listed company website provide a copy of audited separate audited or unaudited financials in respect of subsidiary to any member who asks for it if a member is asking for subsidiary companies financial statements whether they are audited or unaudited doesn't matter send him okay so your financial statements and consolidated finance your standalone financials consolidated financials both place it on your website and if any you have subsidiaries subsidiary financial statements place it on website some member is asking the financial statements to send him physically send him take money from him it's okay suppose sir I have a foreign subsidiary sir I'm a listed company Indian but I'm having a foreign subsidiary and that foreign subsidiary you know it is preparing financial statements that foreign subsidiary related financial statements also should I put it on my website yes sir they were unaudited still put it on the website sir they were in some other language translate into english and then put it on the website sir they were prepared in something different format make it convert into your indian format and then put it on the website simple see where a foreign subsidy is required to prepare consolidated financials under the law of that country the requirement of this provision shall be met this provision we assume it is okay if the consolidated financials is placed on the website of the company simple foreign subsidiary you know their financials keep it on your website 
their consolidated financial statements also keep it on the website that foreign company holding company will prepare some consolidated financials okay that foreign subsidiary might have some subsidiary foreign companies having some subsidiary and so it is having it is preparing consolidated financials keep that also on the website if the foreign company nothing but see you are a, you are an indian company you are having a subsidiary company this is situated in foreign this is having subsidiary company let us assume so foreign company is preparing two sets of financials standalone financials of foreign company consolidated financials of foreign plus it's a subsidiary both you should keep on your website where so foreign company is not required to get the financial statements audit suppose there is no audit requirement in that country for that foreign company and uh, does not get the financial statements audited then our indian company may place an audited financial statements on the website and suppose if it is in other than english translated copy of financials in english shall be mentioned sir you are having a foreign subsidiary it is preparing consolidated financial stand alone both keep it on the website sir you are having a foreign subsidiary it is not liable for audit at all audit okay keep that on audited accounts sir they are in other than english translate them into english for the format of accounts of foreign subsidiary should be in accordance with the requirements under companies act as per, so in in case if it is not possible why it is not possible just mention if the foreign company accounts are very different completely complete new terminology different terminology even if we mention in our indian website our shareholders may not understand you know convert them into our indian gap and then publish so general what companies do you know original foreign company financials they will give and translated version both will be kept that's it you see here example this is important this this itself can be asked as a four marks question reliance industry limited a company incorporated under companies act has its shares listed on a stock exchange one of the subsidiary of reliance is a foreign company incorporated outside okay foreign subsidiary in the agm of the company reliance has placed its audited financial statements including consolidated financials on the website correct no in the agm it is placed even on the website it is placed Reliance Industries has also placed on its website separate accounts of all its subsidiary located in India except one subsidiary which is foreign company. Okay, all subsidiary company audited financials they mentioned in the website. But one foreign subsidiary they didn't put on the website which is located outside India. Why on the grounds that foreign company is not required to get it? Uh, what they are saying, one foreign company related financial statements, uh, separate unaudited financial statements, uh, they didn't put on the website. What are they claiming? Hey, they were not audited, so we didn't put that. Okay, so you are required to examine whether Reliance has complied, not complied. What is the, what is the duty? Website, uh, where foreign subsidiary is not required to get financials audited under any other law. The Indian company shall place the unaudited financials on the website. Uh, and uh, where if it is in other than language translated copy must be kept see here no reliance industry not complied with the provision because it is required to place unaudited financials of foreign subsidiary if they were not audited even if it is not required to get audit that's it so this and all is not required nidhi company point not required from exam point of view so uh, with this uh, we understood a uh, manner of circulation and uh, you know uh, right to receive for the members uh, okay so it is not just sending the financials so placing on the website is important keeping it for inspection is also important financial statement shall be kept for inspection at the registered office of the company at least to 21 days before and you must send copies to all the shareholders members debenture trust you all the at least 21 days before how what mode electronic mode dmat here sir suppose it is not possible to send within 21 days sir I mean, at least to 21 days time earlier, you can't send less than that. Okay, send at least 14 days before, send at least 10 days before, get 95% shareholders approval. Then only you can do that. Then next, okay, you sent financials, everything over, members came to the AGM, members came to the AGM. Okay, now, once members, first of all, AGM might be conducted or AGM might not be conducted sir agm is not conducted sir but financial statements everything is there we didn't conduct agm what is the last date for the agm identify yes sir identified sir 30th september we identified as 30th september just a minute we identified as 30th september just a minute so uh, whatever financials were there 
file them with register right now we are discussing section 137 136 is over 137 we are discussing filing of the financial statements with the registrar okay you prepared financials you sent to member you kept it on website what about ROC you need to file the financial statements with ROC also what is the time limit within what time I should file I have not conducted AGM suppose identify what is the last date for conducting AGM from the last date within 30 days file with the ROC sir suppose I held AGM sir AGM conducted sir AGM conducted sir then two situations are the financial statements adopted adopted means approved by the members if the answer is yes are the financial statements not adopted are the financial statements not adopted suppose sir the financial statements were not adopted by members sir members did not approve the financials in the AGM where the financial statements are not adopted at AGM or adjourned AGM such unadopted financials shall be filed with ROC within 30 days of that AGM okay it's okay they were not adopted file it with ROC the ROC shall take them as provisional financials till the financial statements filed after adoption once again company will adjourn make shareholder sit adopt it and then file once again until filing the adopted financials unadopted financial statements will be taken as provisional so if the financial statements are finally adopted in the adjourned AGMs they shall be filed with ROC within 30 days uh, of the adjourned AGM date with the fees additional fee whatever applicable so very simple sir in AGM there were financials were not adopted sir okay within 30 days file with ROC that they are not adopted keep it as provisional dear ROC I urgent AGM once again I will call shareholders all of them will come will approve the financials within 30 days one second I will file until then take them as provisional they are final that's it so this itself can be asked as a four marks question write about filing of the financial statements with ROC if the financial statements were not adopted at AGM this itself can be asked as a four marks question write about filing of the financial statements if AGM is not held whatever we discussed E point this is B E point can also be asked as a straight question hope you're able to understand accounts of company see so lengthy chapter I told no revision itself is taking this much time imagine my imagine the regular session it will take at least 10 hours regular class now filing of the financials suppose financials are adopted generally this is the most practical scenario financial statements not adopted AGM not held very rare cases now financials are adopted in that case a copy of the financial statements including consolidated financial statements along with all the documents which are required to be attached to financials like audit report board report all that shall be filed with registrar within 30 days of the date of AGM once AGM is complete within 30 days now every NBFC shall file financial statements with registrar and consolidated financial statements with registrar in some other format okay so this actually second point is not required first point is only important and not only filing financial statements in particular format AOC 4 form XBRL is also required for the following companies the following companies shall file financial statements in XBRL format what is, what is XBRL format you will understand in EIS subject group 2 so which companies they should file XBRL financials all listed companies and companies having paid up capital 5 crores or above even though it is unlisted 5 crores paid up capital is there XBRL applicable sir 5 crores not there sir I am I'm not a listed company sir turnover 100 crore is there yes sir applicable sir turnover also not there sir but are you preparing NDIS financial statements using NDIS accounting standard ah yes sir then also it is applicable so this itself can be asked as a side question for 3 marks which what are the classes of companies that are liable to file financial statements in XBRL format extended you know uh, yeah, extensible business reporting language format which companies shall file their financials using XBRL AOC 4 4 categories of companies listed companies or companies with paid up capital 5 crore or more or companies with turnover 100 crore or more or companies which are liable to prepare financial statements using NDIS rules they are all liable to file XBRL which companies are exempted from XBRL rules NBFC is exempted housing finance company is exempted company engaged in banking and insurance sector is exempted so banking insurance sector they are all exempted next and you know once once filing of the financial statement is applicable it is applicable forever 
it is applicable forever even if the fb xbrl once applicable it is applicable forever a point is not required b point you remember the companies which filed financial statements under xbrl rules shall continue to file the financial statements under sub rule 1 though they do not fall under once you you filed xbrl forever applicable later you unlisted less than 5 crore less than 100 crore no in this that and all does not apply <coughs> so look at this example read this example so sir what about one person company financials which are adopted by members with all the documents shall be filed within 180 days from the closure of the financial you shall file one person company not 30 days from agm 180 days from the closure of the financial very important mcq mcq one person company what is the time limit for filing of the financial statement 30 days from the end of the agm falls 180 days from the closure of the financial year very important observation now sir what about subsidiary real subsidiary companies financials should we file them also yes a company along with its financial statements attach accounts of the subsidiary which were incorporated even outside india which which do not have place of business in india with respect to foreign subsidiary also you have to file where foreign subsidiary is not required to audit okay the holding in a company shall file unaudited accounts along with the declaration to the effect that they were translated even foreign subsidiary related accounts must be filed with roc even though they were unaudited further format of accounts of foreign subsidiaries shall be as per the requirements of companies act so here they have given a very clear example please please solve this example please solve this example even at the end of this chapter there are some practical questions please solve them so what is a penalty for failure to comply with 137 we didn't file within 30 days what is a penalty so all that uh, you know that penalty related provision is also covered here that's it so i didn't take that much in depth mark 138 internal audit that i will cover in the next chapter audit and auditors it is very easy my internal audit question is very easy 138 is very easy then then i'll come to books of accounts section 128 and 129 if we complete these two this chapter is completed 134 board report uh, director responsibility statement authentication of board report that is not that much important okay 134 if possible i will try to cover 134 also so first of all books of accounts what is what are the provisions related to books of accounts they should be maintained on accrual basis they should be maintained under double entry system what do you mean by books of accounts what 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 books of accounts definition include this can be asked for two marks or four marks or three marks any for any weightage they can ask what is the place at which books of accounts shall be kept this is important from exam point of view books of accounts every company shall prepare and keep books of accounts at registered office only sir i know i want to keep at corporate office sir our registered office is a very small small you know you know small you know a flat but we took a very big corporate office that is not registered office this is registered office is this one that is corporate office can i keep there yes sir provided all or any of the books of accounts may be kept at such other place in india only if board of directors decide where such a decision is taken by board the company shall within seven days file with registrar giving full address of that place if books of accounts are kept at some other place inform roc within seven days simple sir what about branch related books of accounts keep it branch itself that's okay need not bring to you know registered office sir what about foreign branches suppose okay if any books of accounts are maintained outside india they shall be sent to registered office at a quarterly interval foreign branches related books summary shall be obtained the summarized returns of the books of accounts of the company kept and maintained outside india that is foreign branches shall be sent to registered office on a quarterly interval which shall be kept and maintained at the register of the company and it is open for inspection okay sir understood about keeping books of accounts sir these books of accounts can be inspected by any director yes during business hours sir what about subsidiary company books of accounts can they be inspected by board of directors yes a person can inspect subsidiary related company books of accounts provided board of directors resolution shall be necessary now uh, this point is not required sir a director want to get some financial information sir but that information is there outside india sir how should he get where any other financial information which is maintained outside india is required by any director a director requires some information but that information is available outside india the director first file a request with the company what are the details of information you want 
for which period related information you want first to file an application with the company the company shall give that information to the director within 15 days of the receipt the director can get information only personally individually he can go and ask personally i cannot send my agent to go and ask for foreign information not by attorney holder agent or representative with respect, with respect to financial information maintained outside the country so if the company is maintaining some financial information outside india a director can request that information by putting a specific application and mentioning what details you want which period related information you want and company shall send that information to the director within 15 days director shall make this request personally not through agent this itself can be asked as a three marks question write about uh, financial information maintained outside india being requested by a director three marks question they can ask so this is the answer sir for how many years books of accounts shall be kept eight years sir. okay the books of accounts together vouchers whatever it is it shall be preserved for at least not less than eight years immediately preceding the previous year so right now we are in 22 23 as on today how many years books of accounts will be there 21 22 and before seven years sir. so okay so uh, 22 23 before eight years means what 21 22 20 21 19 20 18 19 17 18 uh, 16 17 15 16 14 15 these books of accounts I should compulsorily keep even in 22-23. Suppose if any investigation is ordered, government passed an order that you should keep for more than 8 years, don't discard. Okay, you should not dismantle or discard books if at all you have to maintain for more than 8 years. And who are the persons liable for maintaining the books of accounts? These are the persons. These are the persons. And what is the penalty for contravention is given here. Sir, can a company maintain books of accounts in electronic format? Yes, absolutely. Books and papers can be maintained in electronic format, shall be accessible in India and usable for later reference. Compulsory, these are the guidelines. Okay, further, the books of accounts which are maintained in electronic format shall have an audit trial feature with effect from 1st April 2022. What is audit trial feature? See, suppose audit trial means it shall have it shall have a log it shall have a log record today you entered one transaction later you opened this transaction in change room a change or something narration or something in audit trial log it will record original transaction second version third version fourth version like that every version will be recorded so that is called audit trial so the electronic software should provide audit trial feature Further, entire books of accounts must be kept in original format only. No change, vouchers, everything, they should be kept as it is. Whatever information that you are receiving from branches, don't alter. Original information, keep it as it is. Further, whatever information you are keeping in electronic form should be displayed in legible format. Further, there should be a storage retrieval display, print out all electronic record, whatever, as audit committee, board of directors, whatever they want and suppose if at all the electronic information books of accounts are kept outside india server compulsorily periodically they must be brought back to india and keep it in a server located in india <coughs> and inform the roc who is the service provider sap tally what is the ip address where he is located and what are the books that are maintained on cloud so all that you need to file with roc then uh, write about uh, definition and concept of financial statements under Companies Act. This you can definitely read on your own. In this entire thing, no, in this entire thing, no, exemption from preparation of consolidated financial statements is an important question. Which companies are exempted from preparing consolidated financial statements? This is important. Remaining are not that important. Question number five. Second point is not required. Question number five. First point is important. First point is important. Or even second point also you can keep. First and second point. Question number five. Write about concept of financial year under Companies Act. This is very easy. Ma. That's why I'm not repeating. 
and uh, every company shall prepare financial statements. Financial statements include balance sheet, p &L, cash flow, statement of changes in equity and notes. One person company, small company and a private company if it is a startup, they, may, they are exempted from cash flow statement. One person, small company, private company if it is a startup. What is a startup company? It's a company in accordance with commerce and industry board. It is recognized as startup that is exempted. And see, this exemption from cash flow is available only when the exception modification whatever is applicable to private company only if it is not committed in default in filing 137 or annual return under 92 only if that private company did not default under 92 did not default under 137 only then this exemption is applicable that's it now financial statements shall be prepared as per schedule 3 accounting standard and they shall be true and fair view companies engaged in defense production they are exempted from segment reporting That's it. So with this, 128, 129 is also completed. <coughs> Only thing what we kept is 134. Authentication of financial statements by board of directors. Authentication of financial statements by board of directors. It's very easy, ma. Just you can have a look. Authentication of financial statements by board of directors. Give single reading of question number 14. Single reading. Question number 14. Authentication of financial statements. Actually, he first we have given snapshot. Not that important. So, what are they saying here? Let me just give at a glance. The financial statements, including consolidated, shall be approved by board of directors before they signed on behalf of the board. Okay. So, who shall approve? At least a chairperson of the company if he is authorized by the board or two directors out of which one must be managing director if available and ceo must uh, you know uh, you know uh, signed must sign it cfo must sign it and secretary must sign it what if it is a one person company only one director he shall sign it audit report shall be attached to every financial statement a signed copy of the financial statements and consolidated shall be circulated published uh, along with notes audit report board report i told you 136 a manner of circulation all that so they have given an example so please go through that write about board of directors report and the contents therein uh, you know for all companies board report format is rule 8 for one person company for one person company the board report format is uh, rule 8a for one person company the format of board report is rule 8a that's it 8a is applicable okay abridged board report so abridged board report is applicable for one person company and a small company so what are the contents of the board of directors report what are the contents of the board of directors there are so many points but there any five points you can remember any five points contents of board report and board report shall contain responsibility statement board report shall contain responsibility statement that is question number 16 this is also asked once in a company law director responsibility statement write about direct responsibility statement four marks question can come this question number 16 is also important what is the direct responsibility for preparation and presentation of financial statements on going concern basis for uh, con for maintaining accounting policies consistently see uh, in preparation of annual accounts applicable standards have been followed and directors selected and applied accounting policies consistently and accounting estimates are reasonable and they give true and fair view this is completely auditing terminology the director had taken proper care for maintenance of accounting records the director prepared annual accounts on a going concern basis the director in case of listed company has set up has laid internal financial controls for ensuring these okay actually the directors had laid down ifc to be followed by the company and they are adequately followed and operating effectively this is enough actually this point is not required and finally the director put proper system to ensure compliance with laws and regulations totally six points actually these six points are covered in internal control objectives in auditing management is responsible for preparation of financial statements on going concern basis management is responsible for preparation of financial statements in compliance with accounting standards management is responsible for uh, you know uh, this one for management is responsible to lay down internal financial controls management is responsible to comply with laws and regulations this is completely audit related uh, stuff so with this 134 everything has been discussed 
mainly in this chapter what I told you 129A, 130, 131, 132, 135, 136, 137. These are important provisions. 128, 129, 134, Jujubi, not that, not that, uh, you know, important. Dividend we discussed thoroughly, accounts of companies we discussed thoroughly. Approximately both these two chapters together, uh, 12 to 15 marks weightage in company law. And you know what? The next chapter that we are going to discuss is audit and auditors. Just a minute. The next chapter that we are going to discuss is audit and auditors. You know what? Audit and auditors. Actually, I did one uh, marathon in uh, last year, May 2021, revision. CA Inter Audit. You know, many students at uh, Group 1 Company Law, they ignore this chapter. December 21 attempt and July paper attempt, 4 to 6 marks question came from this chapter, two times. Even last attempt also, not even 4, I think 8 marks question came from this chapter. Every attempt, minimum 4 marks will come pakka from this chapter. And most of the students of company will ignore this chapter. Please don't ignore. So I am giving you my audit marathon related recording for this. In audit, we call it as company audit. So that recording we are giving. Now, that recording which I am giving, you know, in that, two points, there is an amendment now. There is an amendment now for two points. Okay, one point is, one point is when it come there, just make a note right now. Resignation of auditor, resignation of auditor, the resignation of auditor, there is an amendment. The maximum penalty for resignation of auditor is 2 lakhs. In that particular revision, no, continuation, you are watching continuation, no, audit, company audit chapter, nothing but audit and auditors. There, I might have told 5 lakhs maximum penalty. Now it is only 2 lakhs. That's the only amendment, major amendment. Okay, so watch the continuation revision which I did for CA inter audit. Okay, so company audit. So that revision I'm merging along with this. Anyhow, you're, you're seeing, you know, another two hours is there, another two, two and a half hours video is there. Okay, so that two hours video is a company audit inter recording. Please watch it for sure. Don't miss it. That's it. The next topic of revision is uh, share capital and debentures. A very lengthy chapter, very big chapter. You can expect some 8 to 12 marks from this chapter. So share capital and debentures. As you all know, company can mobilize funds through issue of securities. Primarily under this chapter, I am going to categorize those securities into two types, shares and debentures. So debenture related provisions we will study under section 72, sorry 71. And then uh, with respect to share capital, we are going to cover from section 43 to section 70. So from this topic, you can expect a question from either either from buyback or bonus issue or, you know, issue of preferentials, issue of differential, uh, issue of equity shares with the differential rights. Prima facie, these four topics are very, very important. So buyback, every three items, you can see two times buyback question will be there ne next one bonus issue next one uh, uh, preference shares as well as you know equity shares with the differential rights sometimes you know securities premium question was asked and then uh, rights issue there was a question on rights issue okay let's start the discussion first one is types of share capital first of all you all know share means share in the share capital of the company and it includes a stock so stock is nothing but bundle of shares uh, a transferability point of view stock is preferable but at present in the demat form of uh, securities you can't see this stock in olden days stock concept is very popular so transferability point of view you can transfer you know point 0.1 stock point 0.2 stock that means stock can be transferred in fact fractions whereas shares will be transferred only on lot system lot basis fine so share means share in the share capital of the company we had two types of share capital not three only two one is equity the other one is preference so equity share capital means you know share capital which is not preference share capital and coming to preference share capital earlier we had only one definition but we had two definitions for preference share capital one is any share capital which carry preferential rights with respect to payment of dividend, 
and with respect to repayment of capital so when compared to equity share capital the any share capital which is carrying preferential rights with respect to one payment of dividend the other one is with respect to repayment of capital in the event of liquidation so these benefits you know these uh, preferential rights if there are uh, if any share capital is having that share capital is preference share capital and the latest one you know recently added point that is even though these two benefits are the, not there even though these two priorities two preferences suppose you know payment of dividend repayment of capital preference is not there but still if any share capital which is having participatory rights along with equity shareholders so preference share capital means any share capital which carry two preferential rights one is payment of dividend and second one is repayment of capital compared to equity share capital and then uh, you know any share capital with participation rights participation with respect to you know distribution of surplus or dividends and distribution of surplus in the event of liquidation that share capital is also treated as preference share capital now next one yes write about equity shares with a differential rights equity shares with differential rights here these differential rights are of two types superior voting rights and then fractional voting rights so what is meant by differential rights generally ma one share can give you one vote and equal priority with respect to dividend equal dividend simply so each and every share will give you equal voting so one lakh shares are there one lakh votes will be there you know if all these one lakh shares are fully paid up and repeat if they are fully paid up then each and every share will carry one vote but if one share is having you know more than one vote they are nothing but superior voting rights or you know if one share is having less than one vote for example 10 shares can give you one vote 10 shares can give you one vote such kind of shares are you know fractional voting rights so if one share is not giving you one vote that is nothing but differential they are not equal they are not equal you know they are differential in nature so differential rights are of two types superior voting rights fractional voting rights now the point is for issue of equity shares with differential rights what are the conditions to be satisfied what are the conditions to be satisfied so conditions conditions for issue of equity shares with the differential rights for this the first condition aoa authorization check whether articles permit issue of differential rights or not if articles permit then you can offer equity shares with differential rights or else uh, amend the AOA simply alter the AOA under section 14 by passing special resolution file the altered AOA with ROC ROC shall register the same and issue the certificate next one ordinary resolution from members ordinary resolution from members so if if equity shares were listed on a recognized stock exchange then this ordinary resolution shall be passed through postal ballot this is one mode of conducting a voting mode of conducting a voting fine so once you get members approval you can proceed but there are some more conditions you need to satisfy that is maximum limit maximum limit you can issue differential rights subject to a limit what is that limit sir the voting power from differential rights i repeat voting power from differential right it should not exceed 74 percent of total voting power total voting power post issue of differential rights post issue of differential rights so out of total voting power of the company 70 maximum 74 percent you know differential rights can present so voting power from differential rights shall not exceed 74 percent of total voting power of the company so these are normal conditions and next one conversion is not possible conversion of normal rights to differential rights differential rights to normal rights is not possible and you need to maintain a separate register sorry you need to ident you need to highlight them or you need to differentiate the members in registers which you maintain under section 88 so you need to differentiate you know the persons who are holding differential rights you need to uh, differentiate them next one 
they will carry same privileges that means whatever normal right holders are getting you know dividends or bonus shares or right shares these people will also get but subject to their rights subject to their rights and one more important point that is you know default very important to remember you know almost some 16 17 defaults were prescribed the company should not possess following defaults that means only a company which is regular in complying companies act 2013 which is uh, which is a uh, simply you know active complaint only a, com a company which is complying all the applicable provisions only that company can offer equity shares with differential rights so the company should not have following defaults for better you know understanding as well as for remembering these defaults i categorize these defaults into two types you know subsisting defaults the company should not have these defaults at the time of issue of equity shares with differential rights so no subsisting defaults the other one is no defaults but i categorize them as time with respect to time so you should not have the following defaults time defaults under subsisting defaults you know i categorize four defaults one is failure to repay redeem preference share capital preference share capital and dividend thereon failure to redeem simply you know default in redemption of debentures and interest thereon failure to repay deposits and pay failure to pay interest on deposits then failure to pay dividends to equity shareholders you know declared dividends declared dividends failure to pay declared dividends understood next one following you know company should not have following time defaults here i categorize these time defaults into two types you know three years last three years company should not have last three years last three years company should not default in the following aspects one is with respect to roc filings roc filings you know every year company has to file two returns two forms with roc one is you know financial statements aoc4 annual returns uh, mgt7 mgt7 so last three years company should not commit any default with respect to roc filings and last three years company should not be penalized company should not be penalized under regulatory sectors under regulatory sectors like you know rbi fema rbi fema sebi and securities contract regulation act and other regulatory sectors as may be prescribed so the company should not be penalized under regulatory sectors during the last three years now coming to and one more topic that is you know five years cooling period five years cooling period so if company commit any of the default with respect to following areas with respect to following areas after rectification company should wait for five years after rectification ignore that year and wait for five years that means after rectification you can't issue equity shares with a differential rights during the I mean next five years understood so what are those defaults or what are those defaults you know term loans term loan which you borrow from banks or financial institutions so term loan repayment of term loan and interest thereon interest thereon next up Failure to pay preference dividend, preference dividend, failure to pay preference dividend and failure to transfer monies to investor education and protection fund, failure to transfer monies to money or shares, whatever it might be to investor education and protection fund. So subsisting default means at the time of issue of equity shares, you should not possess these defaults. Three years means last three years company should not possess these defaults five years concept means once you know default happened you rectify them after rectification wait for five years and then you can issue equity shares with differential rights so very important to remember these defaults ma'am already uh, uh, it's there in material also so aoa approval is must unlisted companies okay ordinary resolution listed company same ordinary resolution but postal ballot concept is applicable 
max 74% of voting power and it should be regular filer with ROC that's what I told you it should not it has not defaulted in filing ROC returns you know last three financial years and uh, no defaults no defaults with respect to deposits preference capital debenture interest dividends term loans and employee statutory dues IEPF dues if you are writing the notes you know at this point also employee statutory dues employee statutory dues statutory dues so upon rectification wait for five years that is last point this is last category last category whereas you know these points last three years don't possess these defaults subsisting default means okay default is there no problem you know you rectify them and immediately you can offer equity shares with differential rights understood now if default is made good wait for five years that is applicable only with respect to you know term loans preference dividend employee statutory dues and then uh, employee uh, iepf dues only to those four points five years concept is there and you know it should not be penalized under the regulatory sectors already gave in the notes next one conversion is not possible and they had all rights similar to normal uh, rights they carry same privileges when compared with equity shares with uh, normal rights but the only difference is voting or dividend voting or dividend maybe they will get high voting with less dividend or low voting with high dividend that is the only differentiation factor remaining rest of the things are same okay that means equity shareholders with normal rights they will get bonus shares these people will also get bonus shares right shares right shares but similar shares if i'm holding normal share i'll get normal share under bonus or rights if you are holding differential uh, rights then under bonus share or under bo uh, rights issue you will get same security you'll get similar security next you know disclosures in the register of members disclosures in the board report very small very simple concept ma'am even though it is lengthy you can remember quickly and you can revise it quickly so i think hardly i took some eight minutes to explain this topic right okay next one section 46 share certificate to be a proof of uh, shares held so share certificate this is all about share certificate uh, you know at present due to latest amendments you know all unlisted companies unlisted public companies already listed companies you know their securities are in dmat form coming to unlisted public company there is a rule that they should convert all their physical securities all their material securities into dmat form of securities so only private companies are left with you know holding uh, shares in material form for them this section is applicable so what about this section no issue of share certificate the moment you become member of the company you will get share certificate within two months you know within two months of allotment or within two months of incorp within two months of incorporation in case of transfer transmission case within one month from the uh, submission of documents submission of documents with the uh, uh, company so now the point is uh, allottee or transferee will get share certificate that share certificate is valid only if con if it contains certain points what are those points sir it should be distinctively numbered as it is already there you know it should be distinctively numbered so next one it should be under common seal of the company if common seal is there common seal you need to affix common seal if there is no common seal then you know it should be signed by two directors in case company having secretary then one director and one secretary i'm telling you if common seal is there you need to fix common seal and director signature continued if there is no common seal then you know two directors if company is having secretary one director plus one secretary should sign the share certificate or else that share certificate is invalid it is simply you know document showing title document showing title understood so whose name appears on the share certificate and the number of shares appeared on the share certificate yes that fellow is owner with respect to that many shares suppose if original share certificate is lost you can apply for duplicate share certificate for that you need to submit prescribed documents you need to submit prescribed documents but remember whatever the provisions under section 46 are there they are not applicable to the shares which were held in dmat form for example 
in DMAT form of security, you can't see signatures of the directors, you can't see common seal and you can't see distinctive number. For example, I'm having 2000 rupees. I can show you on that, you know, you can see a serial number, a distinctive serial number, right? On that, you can see RBA, RBA governor signature. But if the same 2000 rupees is there in my bank account, can I tell you the denomination? Can I tell you the serial number of currency? Can I tell you whether the signature of RBA governor is present or not? No. So these norms are not applicable when money was held in bank account. Similarly, when shares are held in DMAT account, the provisions of, you know, signing, the provisions of distinctive numbering are not applicable. But remember, my dear students, in case company makes fraud with respect to issue of duplicate share certificate without proper application without proper documents if company issue duplicate share certificate then officer in default is going to get punished under section 447 officer in default is going to get punishment under section 447 but company the punishment to company understand clearly minimum five times of the face value of shares involved in the duplicate certificate but it may extend to 10 times or 10 crores whichever is higher don't get confused with three limits i'll write here minimum punishment in case of defraud minimum five times of face value of uh, securities involved face value of shares involved okay face value of shares involved in the duplicate maximum 10 times of face value or 10 crores whichever is higher for example the shares involved in duplicate issue the shares involved in duplicate and uh, where company issued them with an intent to defraud uh, is some around 50 lakhs imagine 50 lakhs then minimum punishment is 5 times of 50 lakhs that means 2.5 crore maximum 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 how much ma 10 times of 5, 50 lakhs 10 times of 50 lakhs that is 5 crores or 10 crores whichever is higher that is 10 crores so minimum 2.5 crore maximum 10 crores the frequency is minimum uh, sorry the length uh, the punishment is minimum 2.5 crore maximum 10 crores officer in default is already punished uh, he is already liable under section 447 next one 47 it is all about voting rights see ma'am Nowadays, you know, a person will take shares because of only two things, either dividends, dividend income, simply, you know, uh, gain he is getting from investing, investment or voting point of view. So promoters always concentrate on voting, whereas, you know, small investors will always concentrate on the profits of the company, right? But, you know, each and every shareholder is entitled to have voting rights. If you are holding equity share, if you are holding an equity share, you will carry vote, you will uh, that equity share capital will carry voting rights and you will automatically get voting rights. Sir, how much voting rights, sir? It depends upon the proportionate of paid up share capital. What is the total paid up share capital? In the total paid up share capital, how much you are holding? What is the percentage of your holding in the total paid up share capital? Sir, total paid up share capital 100 crores, sir. In that, I am holding 25 crores, sir. That means your voting power is 25%. Sir, I am holding only 1 crore, sir. My voting percent is 1 crore. Understood? So, in total paid up share capital, how much you are holding? You know, how much paid up share capital you are holding? How much paid up share capital you are holding? That is your voting power. Understood, my dear students? So, this is with respect to poll. Modes of voting, you know, there is a poll concept, postal ballot concept, show of hands concept, electronic voting concept, you know, these four, these four types of voting you can study under uh, management and administration chapter. But the point is, in case of poll, proportionate voting power is uh, given. Whereas show of hands, show of hands, each and every member is entitled to one vote, irrespective of holding number of shares. Suppose under show of hands, I'm holding 1 million shares, you are holding one share. I'll be given one vote, you'll be given one vote. So each and every person will have one vote under show of hands. Whereas under poll, person will have voting rights proportion to the total paid up share capital. He's holding in the total paid up share capital. That proportionate, he will have voting power. And there is a point, you know, for Nidhi companies, special point for Nidhi companies. 
to eliminate a dominant position to eliminate dominant position suppose if you are holding a 20% of paid up share capital you will get only 5% voting power you won't get a 20% voting power this is simply to avoid concentration of power with few people next one preference share capital sir preference share capital holders will they get voting power with respect to general meeting no ma with respect to general meeting no but they have voting power with respect to the matters affecting their rights with respect to the matters affecting their rights suppose initially i offered 10% preference shares you know 10% preference share capital now company want to decrease this 10% to 9% now whose right is getting affected preference share holders now preference share holders consent is required i repeat preference share holders consent is required for reducing the dividend from 10% to 9% next one any resolution for winding up of the company next one for reduction of share capital so with respect to these three matters preference shareholders will get voting rights and there is an exceptional circumstance that is two or more years no consecutive two or more years if preference dividend is not paid I repeat if preference dividend remains unpaid for a period two or more years then they will also get voting rights in addition to equity shareholders that means they are also entitled to attend general meeting in that general meeting along with equity shareholders preference shareholders will also get voting power how much voting power sir proportion of total paid up share capital suppose my equity share capital is 10 crores preference share capital is 5 crores so total paid up share capital total paid up share capital 15 crores suppose mr x is holding 1.5 crore sorry 3 crores mr x is holding 3 crores equity share capital 3 crores equity share capital suppose if preference dividends were paid on timely basis now mr x will get 30 percent voting power how much 30 percent how sir 3 out of 10 3 crores by 10 crores x will get 30 percent voting power understood whereas whereas just uh, if preference dividend remain unpaid preference dividends are not paid then x voting power is not 30 percent it is 20 percent how 3 out of 15 crores total paid up share capital including preference share capital you need to take basis you need to take it as basis and your holding in the total capital you will get a voting power understood ma only you know only if equity shareholders are having voting power then x voting power is 30 percent preference shareholders also got voting power because of non-payment of dividend then x voting power is 20 percent 3 by 15 next one you know section 47 applicability in case of private company it is different private company you know you need to see AOA articles of association of the company if AOA is silent then section 47 is applicable but if AOA of a private company provides something else like you know in any case preference shareholders won't get voting rights in any case preference shareholders are not going to get any voting rights in that case preference shareholders won't get any dividend even if their dividend remains unpaid for 10 years 15 years 20 years 25 years getting my point students but this privilege is available to private company only if they are regular in filing financial statements annual returns with a roc if they are regular with filing annual returns and financial statements with roc then such private company can take this privileges next one ma variation of rights of shareholders under section 48 of the companies act 2013 I'll take one small example to explain this concept. So this section 48 is available only if company had issued different classes of shares. You know, if company issued only one class of share, then this section is not applicable. Because for variation of one class, this section is not applicable. The general meeting is uh, sufficient. Annual general meeting is sufficient. So here you know we are going to conduct class meeting in that class meeting the persons who are holding particular class of shares they will attend and they need to give approval suppose company issued equity shares with normal rights company issued equity shares with differential rights company issued preference shares you know two or more class of shares were involved 
now if company wants to change you know rights of one particular class if company wants to change rights of one particular class then only this section is applicable understood ma for the time being company issued you know 10% preference shares you know 10% preference share capital rupees 60 crores that means every year at the end of the year company should pay dividend of how much ma 6 crores 6 crores now company wants to reduce this 10% to 8% because of you know covid pandemic company is not in a position to generate adequate profits they want to cut the profits you know from 10% sorry they want to cut the dividend from 10% to 8% is it possible sir yes but for this a class meeting should be called for and then out of the 60 crores out of the 60 crores 3 fourth people Three fourth of the no, it's not three fourth of the people. Three fourth of sixty crores. That means how much? Forty five crores. If you are passing, you know, resolution through postal ballot, then holders, you know, persons holding forty five crore paid up share capital should give consent in favor of variation. No, sir, I can call meeting, sir. In that case, you know, special resolution is sufficient. If you are able to call meeting, special resolution is sufficient. Or if you want to take consent through postal ballot. Then three fourth consent is required. Three fourth of the issued clause. But you know, before conducting meeting or before uh, conducting voting, you need to check whether your constitutional documents allow such change or not. Whether M O A A O A permits the variation or not. If M O A A O A is silent, then check the issue terms. You know, uh, for getting this money, for issuing these shares, you might have offered prospectus. or you might have offered private placement document open the document check whether variation is prohibited or not prohibited suppose variation is not prohibited now you can proceed with variation now you can proceed with variation first one check moa aoa if moa aoa is providing uh, uh, if it is giving power of variation then vary the terms if it is not providing variation in that case in that case check issue terms if issue terms no variation is not prohibited then proceed how to how to proceed sir simply take consent of 3/4 of the class of shareholders 3/4 of the the class capital shareholders and one more point my dear students if you know if you uh, if change of one particular class changing the rights of one particular class is having effect on other class of shareholders i want to change rights of equity shareholders with differential rights because of this if normal right holders getting affected if the if the other class shareholders are getting affected then you need to take consent from both the classes both the classes so you need to take consent from two classes of uh, shareholders okay if you get consent then you can proceed with variation however there is a, a right to the dissenting shareholders sir who are the dissenting shareholders dissenting shareholders are one who cast vote against to the variation suppose we don't want that variation sir we need 10% dividend we are not we are not okay with 8% so we call them as dissenting shareholders so dissenting shareholders are having a power to file a petition with nclt provided two conditions to be satisfied one is they should be minimum 10% of the class capital that means these dissenting shareholders should hold at least 6 crores out of 60 crores 10% means 6 crores 6 crores capital they should hold first one second one they should file a petition with nclt within 21 days how many days 21 days from the date of uh, consent now you know you now the ball is in the court of nclt so nclt can declare whether to approve the variation suppose if that variation is prejudicial prejudicial if it is having negative impact they will reverse the variation or else they may allow the variation whatever nclt is giving you know whatever the order nclt is giving company has to file that nclt order with roc within 30 days so file a copy of nclt order with roc within 30 days if you make any default then following punishment is applicable and you need to check amendments with respect to punishments ma so the those all part you can find under uh, uh, separate uh, video 
so you can get all those points in a separate video but variation you know only five points are very important so whether constitutional documents permit or not whether issue terms permit or not next consent how much consent is required powers of dissenting shareholders and then nclt order is final filing nclt order with roc these five points if you remember you can answer this question easily next one very very small topics section 49 to 54 49 is all about you know calls on shares so who is having power to make calls on shares board of directors so if a single director say for suppose managing director issuing notice calling for uh, mom in notice uh, making for calls on shares now he's making calls on shares you know single director issuing notice that is null and void simply void a issue. board resolution is important and that board resolution should cover two points you know call amount and then next one time limit for payment of call amount under SEBI regulations you know for listed companies so they need to convert partly paid up into fully paid up by making calls on shares within 12 months from the date of issue of course that is not part of our syllabus you know just ignore for your academic knowledge i'm telling you so within 12 months or oh, every listed company within 12 months from date of issue they need to convert into fully paid up by making calls on shares so normally you know for getting funds board of directors can make calls on shares that call amount that call amount should be on uniform basis that means you know with respect to particular class that call amount should be equal you can't fix you know two rupees from 10 shareholders and you can and one rupee from uh, five shareholders half rupee from 50 shareholders you can't fix like this uniform basis you know fixed amount it should be same for all the members holding that particular class understood next one calls in advance if any member if any member want uh, if he uh, if he want to pay something extra then call money can company accept that amount or not suppose if a member is ready to deposit extra amount extra you know more than call amount can he deposit sir can company accept it sir the only condition is articles of association check whether aoa permits or not if your aoa is permitting calls in advance then accept the calls in advance but for calls in advance company has to pay interest interest on the calls in advance subject to aoa provisions understood and you know this calls in advance this is not a part of capital this will be shown under liabilities this will form part of capital only when company make calls on shares subsequently so since this is not a capital this is a liability to the company here you won't get any extra voting rights here you won't get any extra dividends understood no extra voting rights with respect to calls in advance because just now i told you voting depends upon total paid up share capital so calls in advance is not part of paid up share capital are you all getting my point students so you won't get any extra voting rights with respect to calls in advance and then proportionate dividend here you understand this word subject to AOA subject to AOA generally whenever you see the news you know company reliance industry declared 60 percent dividend 70 percent dividend sir that 70 percent 60 percent on what sir you know on face value on face value forget about whether it is partly paid up or fully paid up so whenever you heard about you know 70 percent dividend 80 percent dividend that percentage you need to apply on face value but if company wants to pay you know if company wants to apply that percent on paid up capital 70 percent on paid up value not on face value that point should be disclosed in aoa if company is authorized by aoa if company is authorized by aoa then only company can pay uh dividend on paid up capital understood ma understood so if aoa is silent then you will get dividend on face value that means that means both on paid up value as well as calls in advance sometimes if there is no calls in advance then also you will get dividends i'll tell you one example suppose you know face value 10 rupee paid up value 6 rupee paid up value 6 rupee if aoa permits then company will pay dividend on paid up value 
If AOA is silent, then company has to pay dividend on face value. That is the only point. Next one. Next one. Write about issue of share set premium under section 52. Students remember that there is no condition in Companies Act with respect to issue of share set premium. There is no condition. There is no condition on the company to issue share set premium. So it is completely at the discretion of company. So company can issue shares at premium or at par. How much premium? There is no that restriction also. You can't find restriction in companies that you know premium should be 200 percent of face value. Premium should be 300 percent of face value. There is no such restriction. Company is free to fix premium. And even if even if AOA is silent, company can fix premium amount. But section 52 is placing only conditions with respect to utilization of securities premium. Utilization of security premium. So how you are going to utilize securities premium? That is the only condition kept under section 52. So all companies can utilize security premium for five purposes. One is bonus shares, bonus for issue of bonus shares, or writing of preliminary expenses, issue related expenses, which might be commission or discount, whatever it might be, and premium payable on redemption as well as buyback of shares. You can utilize security premium for five purposes. But if you are a company, where you are following accounting standards in presentation of financial statements. So for preparation of financial statements, if you are following accounting standards, then you can utilize security premium only for three purposes. One is, you know, buyback. Next one, issue related expenses. Next one, bonus shares, bonus issue. That means writing of preliminary expenses, premium payable on redemption. These two are not available for the companies which prepare financial statements based on accounting standards. Suppose if you utilize security premium for a purpose other than stated purpose, other than permitted purpose. In that case, you can't reduce the amount of security premium. You need to reduce share capital amount. In that case, you know, reduction of share capital provisions will apply. I repeat, reduction of share capital provisions will apply. Understood? Next one. So with this section 52 issue of shares at premium also completed 53 issue of shares at discount. So can a company issue shares at discount? Obviously no. If company issue shares at discount, it is void. Company has to return the money and company has to take back these shares. In addition to that company need to pay interest on that money it received under issue of shares at discount. Plus company has to pay penalty also penalty. How much sir? you know amount involved in the issue of shares at discount or five lakhs, whichever is less issue at discount amount involved in the issue amount involved in the issue or rupees five lakhs, whichever is less. And I told you, you need to refund all the money along with interest at the rate of 12% per annum understood my dear students. But you know, there are two exceptions to this general rule. General rule, you can't issue shares at discount. Exceptions, you know, exception case, you can issue shares at discount. You can issue shares at discount. Sir, what are those cases, sir? Those cases are sweat equity shares, where company will offer shares to its um, employees, directors. And second one, issue of shares under debt restructuring scheme or any statutory resolution plan which was prepared according to the RBI norms okay under DRS debt restructuring scheme or statutory resolution plan companies allowed to issue shares at discount simply you know internal reconstruction ma in accounts you might have done that you might have prepared this chapter internal reconstruction where you know creditors agree to forfeit some amount for remaining amount they will accept shares in that case according to the resolution plan or debt restructuring scheme which was approved uh, which was approved under that scheme you can offer equity shares at discount basis and this speaks about you know shares only right this speaks about shares so you can offer debentures at discount that is completely outside this section 53 so section 53 speaks about only shares and coming to the last topic of this part this part 2 is sweat equity shares 
so sweat equity shares so this is the uh, motivation financial motivation to the employees so under this concept you know company can offer sweat equity shares either at a discount that means less than face value or for a consideration other than cash that means here company is not going to get any money in fact company is going to get some intellectual property rights from the employees so here you know company can give these shares only to the permanent employees permanent employees not temporary employees those employees or directors they might work you know they might work in our company or our holding company or our subsidiary company simply in a, in a group holding subsidiary yes that employee can be in our company or our holding company or subsidiary company but that employee should be permanent he might work either in india or outside india it is irrelevant the only relevant condition is permanent employee and previously we had a condition that you know that employee should complete one year of service in our company but right now there is no such condition even a newly joined employee is also eligible to take share under sweat equity is it clear okay employee stock option same point ma employee stock option employee definition is very very sim very same sorry uh, employee definition under ESOP, employee definition under sweat equity share there is no change but sweat equity we offer shares at discount or for consideration other than cash Whereas ESOP, here we are going to get cash, but here we offer discount to the market value. We offer discount to the market value. Suppose face value 10 rupee, market value 100 rupee. Sweat equity share, I may offer it for, you know, less than or equal to 10. Less than or equal to 10 or less than 10, you know, simply, you know, discount, right? Less than 10. But coming to employee stock option, employee stock option here, I will offer shares at a price, you know, more than face value, greater than or equal to face value, but less than market value. So employee stock option is different. Sweat equity share is different. Don't get confused. So at a predetermined price, we will give offer to them. Uh, so on the predetermined date, so on, a, on the date, you know, whatever date we tell on the date, we will offer options to the employee. Next one, conditions for issue of sweat equity shares, as you all know, special resolution is compulsory from the members because there is there arises a dilution of control, right? So equity shareholders will have voting rights. Under section 47, we studied the same. Now issue of sweat equity shares, certain percentage of ownership is getting diluted to the employees. So that's why you need to take approval from members and that approval is valid for a period of 12 months. For getting approval, you need to issue notice calling for general meeting. In that notice, you need to disclose the number of shares offered under sweat equity, what is the current market price and what is the benefit, you know, what are the class or class of uh, shares offered to the class or class of directors or employees, what type of shares you are offering and to whom you are making offer. For listed companies, you know, in addition to companies act, they need to comply SEBI norms. In prospectus chapter, I think section 24, I made it very clear. I made a very clear statement. Listed company issue and transfer of securities are subject to two SEBI guidelines. Other than listed companies, they are subject to two company rules, company share capital and debenture rules. Next one, sweat equity shareholders will carry same rights. They will also get uh, voting rights in the general meeting. They will also get dividend rights. They will also get same rights, limitations, restrictions. That means they are when compared to other equity shareholders, they are also same. Next important conditions with respect to amounts ma. In a single year, I can offer sweat equity shares, you know, maximum 15%. Suppose my paid up share capital excluding sweat equity is 100 crores. In a year maximum, I can offer 15% sweat equity that is 15 crores or 5 crores, whichever is higher whichever is higher but overall during the lifetime of the company it should not exceed 25 percent suppose if i increase this amount you know if i increase this amount to 200 crores then these amounts will also automatically get increased but out of you know total paid up share capital sweat equity shall not exceed 25 percent overall overall excluding sweat equity how much capital is there on that maximum 25 in a year 15 percent or 5 crores whichever is higher throughout the lifetime of the company 25 percent 
But you know, for startup companies, we give a privilege because you know the startup companies can grow only with the uh, work of employees. If one, if employees work smart, if one employees work hard, then definitely the startup companies will, per, I mean, they will grow. Yes or no? So for startup companies, it's not 15, 25. Uh, they will be given flat 50 percent of capital. So they can issue sweat equity shares up to 50 percent and there is a lock-in period ma you know sweat equity shares today if i give share to the employee so they can't transfer such shares up to three years from the date of allotment so lock-in period how many years three years next one what is the value of the share what is the value of intellectual property rights you know these this valuation should be done by a registered valuer a registered valuer so under insolvency and bankruptcy board of india ibbi there is a course called you know registered valuer for security financial assets person holding such qualification such license can value the shares as well as intellectual property rights next one though that person will value the shares issued under sweat equity and assets which we got you know intellectual properties which we got from the employees because these intangibles are subjected to amortization every year so if there is for if that is for indefinite time period you know we can enjoy these intellectual property rights for unlimited number of years then every year you need to check for impairment or there may be a uh, life suppose you know we can use this property intellectual property rights for 10 years then over a period of 10 years you need to amortize you need to amortize are you all getting my point students next one you need to disclose the same in board of directors report so this year we issued equity shares under sweat equity under sweat equity scheme so these many shares were offered and there should be a identified in a members register also so maintain separate register for sweat equity shares with respect to non-cash consideration the treatment as i already told you if i am getting any asset by getting any asset then you know it is subject to the amortization so the return down value will be carried in the balance sheet you can see return down value in the balance sheet if i am getting nothing so no asset i am getting just as a matter of motivation i offered sweat equity shares beginning only in that case the amount you know the amount specified by the registered valuer suppose the value of share is 90 rupees and i offered 1 lakh shares 1 lakh into 90 90 lakh rupees i should straight away transfer to the profit and loss account so expenditure employee benefit expenses staff expenditure so employee under employee welfare expenditure or employee benefit expenses i need to charge to profit and loss account suppose asset is 50 lakhs asset value is 50 lakhs shares i issued is 90 lakhs now you do one thing 50 lakhs take it to balance sheet 90 lakhs minus 50 the difference 40 lakhs charge to profit and loss account under employee benefit expense suppose if these shares are issued to the directors then this amount of 40 lakhs you know 40 lakhs will be deducted from their managerial remuneration under section 197 calculation of managerial remuneration okay fine so employee definition already i told you that he should be permanent whether working in india or outside india whether in our company or our subsidiary company or holding company and coming to the director whether whole time or not but they should be in employment category right so with this part two also completed ma the next section is section 55 issue and redemption of preferences so this single section covers both two aspects one is issue of preferences and the second one is redemption of preferences so section 55 preferences just follow the points ma the conditions with respect to issue is first one articles of association authorization if your articles permit you to issue preferences then you can offer preferences or else amend AOA under section 14 of the Companies Act you know by passing special resolution file the documents with ROC and you will get a certificate with respect to that now you can issue preferences 
सेकेंड पॉइंट मेंबर्स अप्रूवल वॉट काइंड ऑफ अप्रूवल सर स्पेशल रेजोल्यूशन द रीजन इज वेरी सिंपल कंपेर्ड टू इक्विटी शेयर कैपिटल यू नो प्रिफरेंस शेयर कैपिटल कैरी टू प्रियोरिटीज वन इज पेमेंट ऑफ डिविडेंट द अदर वन इज रीपेमेंट ऑफ कैपिटल सो नो इक्विटी शेयर होल्डर्स इंटरेस्ट इज गेटिंग एफेक्टेड बिकॉज ऑफ दीज टू प्रियोरिटीज दट्स वाई यू नीड टू टेक कंसेंट फ्रॉम मेंबर्स ऑफ द कंपनी and for getting uh, approval you need to give notice calling for general meeting in that notice you need to attach explanatory statement there you should provide all the details of you know how much of preference share capital what is the tenure and then uh, what what are the speciality of the specialities of this preference shares you know are they convertible or non convertible cumulative or non cumulative participative or non participative everything you need to communicate with a member then only you can obtain consent from the member next one at the time of issue the company should not have subsisting default that means these default should not be in existence at the time of issue of preference shares so what are those defaults sir you know failure to pay dividends pay preference dividend failure to pay preference dividend failure to redeem preference share capital so at the time of issue these two defaults either of these defaults should not be there so if these defaults are there first rectify them the next minute you can issue preference shares sir can i issue preference shares you know irredeemable preference shares no ma you can issue only redeemable preference shares irredeemable preference shares concept is not there then sir can i fix tenure for 50 years sir no the maximum tenure is 20 years max 20 years but if you are a company engaged in infrastructure projects which were notified under schedule 6 of the company act schedule 6 of the company act 2013 then so for such companies the maximum tenure is 30 years provided from 21st year onwards 10% redemption 10% you know every year you need to redeem 10% of the preference share capital so 10 years you will you are going to redeem preference share capital completely so at the end of the 30th year you will find 0% preference share capital right so because everything got redeemed from 21st year onwards right next one so these are the conditions with respect to issue these are the conditions with respect to issue with respect to redemption what are the conditions we need to satisfy sir what type of shares i can redeem sir you know remember only fully paid up shares only fully paid up shares can be redeemed if they are partly paid up you know convert them into fully paid up either make uh, i mean simply make calls on shares convert them into fully paid up then you can redeem next one source of funds source of funds sir from i mean which funds i can utilize for redemption so here the redemption value it will be of two parts two parts one is face value the other one is premium on redemption premium on redemption suppose you know face value is 100 rupee and you agree to redeem at 120 that extra 20 is premium on redemption so with respect to 100 rupees i can utilize either divisible profits of the company you know profits that are available for distribution and payments of uh, dividend distribution and payment of dividend either you can utilize divisible profits or you can utilize fresh issue proceeds so proceeds of fresh issue proceeds of fresh issue but the point is when you select divisible profits then the nominal value of preference shares so redeemed that amount you need to transfer to crr account capital redemption reserve account so only the nominal value the face value of shares which you are redeeming so that amount you need to transfer from reserves to crr account if you select proceeds of fresh issue then no need of such transfer because there is no uh, uh, effect on capital base there is no effect on capital base next sir with respect to premium on redemption you can utilize either same you know divisible profits divisible profits or securities premium but the point is if you are a company which follow accounting standards in preparation of financial statements you know accounting standards uh, notified under section 133 so section 133 you know companies which prepare financial statements according to schedule 3 they need to follow accounting standards such companies can use only divisible profits whereas all other companies can utilize securities premium or divisible profits for premium on redemption of preference shares 
once you know redemption is completed simply communicate the matter with roc company should communicate the same matter with roc in form number sh7 within 30 days of redemption within 30 days of redemption company should communicate the same with roc so this is the major part of the section ma and there is one more small point in this section which was recently tested you know in the previous attempt i think may 2022 there is a question on this uh, simple concept that is you know demod redemption i should i should not call it as demod redemption but listen carefully when company is unable to redeem its preference shares unable to redeem preference shares because of its financial position because of its uh, worst financial position in that case it can go with this concept you know redemption of unredeemed preference shares redemption of unredeemed preference shares so here you know what company can do with the consent of three-fourth of preference share capital holders capital capital is important word three-fourth of value of three-fourth of value holders if you uh, you need to take consent and then take nclt approval with respect to this redemption once you get nclt you know nclt will give you approval only if dissenting shareholders are repaid dissenting shareholders are repaid so first of all what about this demand redemption so here we are not going to give cash here we are not going to pay cash here we are going to issue new shares in the place of old shares so we'll take old shares and we'll give them new shares now that new shares also of tenure maximum 20 years new shares you know that concept is also maximum tenure is 20 years they are also redeemable preference shares but for doing that you need to take consent from preference shareholders next you need to file application with nclt for getting nclt approval nclt will give you approval only when the dissenting shareholders were paid off finally ma here the new preference shares the new preference shares which you are issuing they should cover not only old preference share capital but also dividends which are in arrears so the dividends which are in arrears you need to cover that amount also and one more point because of such demut redemption you know reduction of capital or you know increase in capital provisions are not going to get affected so no need to comply those provisions simply communicate the matter with roc so this time we redeemed preference shares by issuing new preference shares understood my dear students so on this point there is a question in may 2022 you can check it fine so this is all about section 55 of the company set redemption of uh, issue and redemption of preference shares so i'll highlight the point here also just go through it so this is the point you know tested in the recent exams just go through this point three-fourth in value is important word next one transfer and transmission of securities if you go through section 45 of the company act, what is the nature of a share or debenture nature of security you know it is movable property it is movable in nature and if you read the definition of goods under sale of goods act so goods includes securities so shares are shares or debenture simply you no know, securities they are movable in nature that means you can transfer them but the transfer is subject to AOA articles of association because when you read private company articles they contain three conditions you know restrictions on transfer of shares if you read public company AOA you can't find that restriction so that means you know securities are freely transferable right so now finally you know securities are transferable how sir you know how so what are the prerequisites for transfer and transmission first of all is transfer and transmission both same or different see transfer and transmission both are different transfer is a voluntary act where you know buyer and seller will come to the market there is no compulsion on them seller want to exit from the company seller want money buyer want to become member of the company and buyer want to purchase the shares now you know buyer will come to seller if terms are matching now buyer will pay the money and buyer will take the shares so this is voluntary act there is no compulsion on them but coming to the transmission it happened due to operation of law that means if a person gets deceased you know if a person is deceased if person deceased now the 
due to succession concept you know the legal heirs of the deceased person will become members of the company that means the shares get transmitted from deceased person to legal heir or if the person become insolvent now through court order official assignee will become member of the company you know the shares automatically gets transmitted in the name of official assignee under court order that is all about transmission getting my point students so there is a difference between transfer and transmission now let's take the concept of transfer what can be transferred sir very simple you know either security or interest in a company if you are a company with share capital if you are a company with share capital then securities are transferable sir i am a company without share capital sir then there is no concept of security so here what happens here the interest of a member which he get because of memorandum of association that will be transferred for that what are the prerequisites remember my dear students the transferor one who transfers shares transferee they need to execute an agreement in writing so oral transfer is invalid in writing they need to execute an instrument that is you know sh4 we call it as transfer deed so both the parties should execute this deed along with this if transferor is having original share certificate then he will attach original share certificate so the transferor recently became member you know under allotment process he is having only letter of allotment sir he is not having share certificate then you know attach letter of allotment letter of allotment now these two documents you know transfer deed uh, and original share certificate or transfer deed and letter of allotment should be submitted to company by transferor or transferee within 60 days of execution within 60 days of execution you know on transfer deed you will you can find the word date from the date onwards within 60 days submit the document to company suppose you know if uh, shares are fully paid up then you know company will register the shares in the name of transferee company will incorporate the details of transferee in the registers maintained under section 88 suppose if the shares are partly paid up if the shares are partly paid up and and such execution was done by transferor listen carefully execution of transfer deed was done by transferor shares were partly paid up in that case company will register the shares only after getting intimate after getting approval from the transferee i should not use the word approval but you know company can register or you know company is not allowed to register such transfer without giving intimation to transferee so here two weeks intimation you know company once company receive you know application for transfer of shares you know those transfer of shares is with respect to partly paid up partly paid up and next one it was executed by transferor alone in that case company cannot or company shall not register the transfer or sorry shall not register the transfer without intimating transfer company should intimate transfer transfer the shares are partly paid up in future when we make calls on shares you are liable in future if company goes into liquidation and if company assets are not in a position to meet its liability then you are liable to pay contribution amount like that company should give intimation if there is approval from transferee come on proceed with the registration of transfer if there is no response from transferee then you know consider it as deemed approval register the transfer but that care should be taken only if two conditions are satisfied one is partly paid up shares and application was executed by transferor alone understood ma everyone but whatever the procedure i told you you know transfer deed submission of these documents and it should be properly stamped you know you need to pay stamp duty according to indian stamp act 1899 all these points are not applicable to or not applicable in two cases one is when securities are held in demat form no need to execute transfer deed and you know when the securities are uh, held by government government you know government company do you remember government company so shares will be in the name of president of india in case of central government company uh, governor of state in case of state government company so for transferring these kind of securities the procedure is different it was specified under in specified in indian constitution you need to introduce bill in the parliament or assembly after approval of that bill you know when house gives approval to that bill then president uh, 
or governor signing that bill then only such securities can be transferred so for that the procedure specified under section 56 is not going to apply so these exceptions you need to remember bonds issued by government company so here simply you know transfer shall give intimation to company along with bond certificate that's it intimation is sufficient and securities held by nominees of the government so government company will enjoy these privileges only if it is regular in filing financial statements as well as annual returns with roc understood my dear students next one ma suppose ma you know transferee was negligent and he lost the instrument of transfer he lost the instrument of transfer now sir can transfer be registered actually no but if he submit indemnity bond if he submit indemnity bond now company may register the transfer understood so partly paid shares already told you you know consent of transfer is required two weeks intimation we need to provide two weeks intimation means so today if we are giving intimation the transfer should respond within two weeks transfer should respond within two weeks and i told you instrument of transfer is not required in case of transmission because you know transfer should execute transfer should execute transfer date however transfer either he got deceased or he become insolvent in both the cases he lose contractual capacity you know how he can sign instrument deed understood ma next one time limit for issue of share certificate what is the time limit for issue of securities securities suppose you know company got incorporated now you know all the subscribers should get share certificate within two months from the date of incorporation if it is allotment case then within two months from the date of allotment if it is transfer case you know secondary market issue relate issue is covered under primary market so company will get money transfers will happen in secondary market so in case of transfer or transmission when you deposited all the documents with company from that date onwards within one month company should issue security certificate but if it is with respect to debentures, you know, six months from date of allotment because you no know, debentures are uh, you need to appoint debenture trustee, execution of debenture trust deed, and then creation of charge. So there is a lengthy procedure. So that's the reason under debentures, you know, six months time period is given. But with respect to shares, remember two two, and with respect to transfer, transfer or transmission forget about whether it is a share or forget about whether it is a debenture the concept of one month is applicable concept of one month is applicable understood so these two speaks about share this point speaks about security that means you know both share and debenture this point speaks about only debenture identify the difference ma next one next one suppose sir mr m is a member of a company c limited he got deceased and mr n is the legal heir of m the moment m get deceased n under transmission he will become member of the company right he will become a shareholder but here n is having two options option one to get register shares in his own name to get enrollment in the register of members so yes registering shares in his own name or he can transfer shares to other persons you know outsiders so yen either he can become himself as a member of the company or even without becoming member yen can execute transfer deed in favor of other person now when company receives this transfer deed company should not object company should register the transfer in the name of a outsider provided you know yen should submit original share certificate plus you know death certificate of the deceased person plus you know a succession certificate succession certificate so i am the only legal heir i will get all the rights with respect to mr m so succession certificate and then you know, transfer date sh4 so sh4 should be duly stamped duly stamped suppose you know if he opt to become member you know to uh, to get registered in his own name in that case no need to execute transfer deed no need to pay stamp duty no need of uh, you know signature of transferor and transferee all these particulars are not applicable understood so legal here is having two options either to get register himself as a member that means to declare himself as a member 
by filing documents under transmission or transfer shares to the outsiders so if company makes any default with respect to 56 suppose you know delay in issue of share certificate within two months they need to issue share certificate if it commit delay or even if instrument deed is incomplete but still company allows the registration in those cases company is going to get punishment of you know 50,000 penalty of 50,000 you know and the other persons you know depository company as well as officer in default 50,000 if shares are held in DMAT form and if depository or depository participant is making mistake you know to defraud a person then section 447 punishment will apply section 447 punishment will apply next one ma forged transfer what is meant by forged transfer sir in forged transfer the signature of transfer or the signature of transfer or will be forged that means you know imitating signature of transfer or if someone is signing the document on behalf of transfer or without his permission it is nothing but forged transfer here just listen to the example o is the original member of the company original member of the company from o f looted the sec security f looted security from o and he executed transfer deed you know which was forged you know f signed f a fraud person simply you know f a fraud person signed as if you know pretending himself as o and executed transfer deed in favor of f company should object such transfer company should not register the transfer suppose if company registered the transfer that means company is in default okay fine and f suppose you know f transferred the shares to a innocent person innocent purchaser innocent purchaser so now you can see here total how many parties are there ma three parties o is the original member f is the fraud person i is the innocent purchaser in this situation Whenever you know who comes to know about this fact and who goes to the company, suppose who went to the company and who is asking what happened. So, sir, this is a forger transfer. Sir, how you registered forger transfer? Now, what are the duties of company? Company should remove the name of I from the register of members and company should incorporate the details of who. That means who name should be restored whatever dividends paid during this period company should pay all the amounts to O. and then sir then what about i sir you know i will suffer loss no sir yes definitely i i will suffer loss but who is responsible for such loss company why company should not register this transfer however company registered transfer negligently company is at default right so company should compensate i company should compensate i now if you observe who is at loss company is at loss because you know company gave shares to original member company restored the name of O, and company paid amount to i so that is a loss to company in this case company will get reimbursement from f so f has to indemnify company once again, I'm telling you in the entire case, why company is taking a, a risky position, sir? Because, you know, company should not register forged transfer. It failed. It negligently registered forged transfer case. So, company is liable to original member. Company is liable to original member. And company is also liable to I because, you know, I purchased shares because of, uh, he's thinking that F is a member of the company because, you know, share certificate share certificate is the proof document showing title i told you document showing title so seeing that share certificate i purchase shares so now i is at loss so company should reimburse i and finally whatever loss company suffered that loss company is going to get reimbursement from f because he is the party at fraud so that is the total concept of forged transfer you just read one time you know this here the third party buyer is mr i simply third party buyer is mr i now you read this entire concept you'll get to know remedy to the company you know company will get indemnity from the first transferee here the first transfer is mr f under the forged instrument you know under forged instrument who is the transferee mr f understood so just read the point ma next one punishment for personation of shareholder what is this punishment concept sir what is this personation sorry personation if someone pretends himself as a owner of the company 
if someone pretends himself as a owner of this particular security so why he is making such a you know uh, personation sir so i told you personation means pretending myself as owner of the security simply changing the identity i am changing my identity in order to uh, tell that i am the owner of particular security i am the owner of the company so why personation why he will do personation sir very simple in order to get some securities or gains on security so gain on the security so whenever a person attempts to personate himself in order to get security you know already he obtained security or he is attempting to obtain security or receive the amount or attempting to receive the amount in that case the person who is doing such personation is punishable he is going to get punishment the punishment is both imprisonment and fine imprisonment 1 year to 3 years fine 1 lakh to 5 lakh simply you should not pretend yourself as a owner of the security that's it if you do it with an intention to obtain security with an intention to obtain money from the transfer of security then you'll get punishment next uh, section 58 very small concept you know refusal to register the shares refusal to register the transfer sorry refusal to register the transfer you can observe here you know transfer or transferee both executed transfer deed and they submitted transfer deed to company now company within one month they need to issue share certificate in the name of uh, transferee or you know one month issue share certificate issue security certificate okay issue certificate security certificate or within 30 days within 30 days issue notice of refusal notice of refusal so because of these reasons we are not going to register the transfer suppose they are very they are partly paid up and transferee is not financially capable person to repay call amounts in future or you know this is a private company uh, we had some restrictions on transfer of shares you know stating the reasons issue notice of refusal issue notice of refusal suppose you know transferee is getting notice of refusal he is getting notice of refusal sir uh, or suppose you know company failed to issue notice of refusal company failed to issue notice of refusal that means you know no notice of refusal issued understood so uh, i divide uh, so total two branches received notice of refusal receive i mean no notice of refusal no notice of refusal listen carefully if the shares are related to private company or public company so here also two concepts private company public company so let's start the point let's begin the uh, each and every case you know sir transferee received notice of refusal and the shares are related to private company then within 30 days of a refusal within 30 days of refusal transferee can file a petition with nclt sir these are not valid rounds you know private company rejected my transfer sir these are not valid rounds like that he can file an application with nclt if it is a public company then within 60 days of refusal within 60 days of refusal so this you know this concept is when you receive notice of refusal suppose sir no notice of refusal i didn't receive any notice of refusal then if you are a private company you know if you are, if you are, if you are, if securities are involved if securities are related to private company then within 60 days of delivery of documents delivery of documents for transfer you know delivery of documents for registration of transfer for registration of transfer that means here the time limit is from the date of delivery of documents from the date of delivery of documents 60 days in case of public company within 90 days of delivery of transfer documents 90 days of delivery of transfer documents so these are the time limits for making a petition with nclt 
Are you getting my point, students? So just listen, just uh, see carefully. So I received notice of refusal. Securities related to private company. Then within 30 days of receipt of notice of refusal. Public company within 60 days of notice of refusal. Sir, I didn't receive any refusal notice, sir. Then, you know, you delivered documents, right, with private company. Already 30 completed, you didn't receive security. You didn't receive notice of refusal. So, additional 30. So, simply 30 plus 30, you are having 60 days. So, 60 days from delivery of transfer documents for registration in case of private company. In case of public company, 90 days of delivery of transfer of uh, transfer documents. You are having a time to file an application with the NCLT. Now, NCLT is having uh, two options. Either dismiss the appeal. Dismiss the appeal. Okay, the reasons, the justification of company is correct. So, this transfer is not allowed. Dismiss. Or order company to register transfer and issue certificate within 10 days. Within 10 days from the order. And you know, reimburse transfer all legal expenses. Reimburse transfer all the expenses he incurred in bringing the suit. So, this is the power of NCLT. So, this is all about section 58, ma. This is all about section 58. Section 59 is rectification of register of members. Rectification of register of members. Suppose I am the member of company, but my name was wrongly omitted from the register. Or, I am not a member, but my name is wrongly entered in the register. My name is wrongly entered in the register. In these cases, yes, an aggrieved party can file a petition with NCLT. If you are an Indian member, if you are Indi Indian, I mean, that means if your if your uh, stay is in India, then you can file an application with NCLT for rectification. First, you know, I'll, I'll write a letter to the company, sir, I'm not a member, but my name is included. Or I'm a member, but my name is excluded. Like that, I'll write a letter to company. If company rectify, no problem. Or else, I'll file petition with NCLT. There is no time limit, ma. You can file petition with NCLT within reasonable time. Suppose, you know, if mistake happened in foreign register. Now, foreigner, there is no obligation on foreigner to come to India to file petition with NCLT. So, foreigner, you know, uh, outsider can easily, so he can file an application with a competent court specified by central government. So, central government will specify the court in that area. So, you can file petition in that court. Now, this person, you know, NCLT or competent court, after hearing to both the parties, so they will order company to rectify the register. They may dismiss the appeal or they will order company to rectify the register. So, and compensate the plaintiff. The person who filed suit, you know, compensate the person. That is all about 59. So, 58 is refusal of registration and appeal against such refusal and 59 is all about rectification of register of members so two points i covered just go through it you'll get to know the points so with this uh, part three of share capital completed next one part four of share capital so this is as per stress term material okay fine so next uh, next concept is different ways of alteration of share capital so in how many ways i can alter share capital sir in five ways either increase or decrease consolidate subdivide conversion of shares into stock reconversion of stock into shares so in five ways i can uh, i can alter the share capital once again i'll tell you so increase in capital decrease in capital consolidation means you know uh, suppose i issued shares of face value 10 rupee now I'll consolidate all the shares into one share. I will divide them into uh, shares of higher amounts. Higher amounts. Suppose you know 100 rupees. Before consolidation, share value is 10, face value is 10. After consolidation, face value may be 100. Understood. Next one. Because of consolidation, you know, if there is change in voting percentage, if there is change in a uh, uh, member's uh, voting, if there is change in members per holdings holdings then they need to take approval of nclt in my regular class i told this point in a very clear uh, with a clear example so since this is a revision i can't uh, provide such examples 
we need to complete the topic within the restricted limited time within the limited time so okay fine so because of consolidation i repeat because of consolidation if uh, members holding is getting disturbed members holding is getting changed then they need to take approval of nclt so that's what the point is here see change of voting powers of shareholders then a prior approval of tribunal is required next one conversion of shares into stock reconversion of shares into stock into shares so transferability point of view i told you stock is better concept right now you know such concept is not in existence next is split subdivide suppose you know face value 10 rupee i'm dividing uh, each share into five parts face value would be 2 rupees recently irctc happened this this one only next one you know cancel of shares that is nothing but decrease of capital so the moment you alter share capital you need to file it with roc but remember students for alteration of capital three conditions are very much important one is ordinary resolution from members ordinary resolution from members the second one is aoa authorization actually this is the first one and this is the second one check whether aoa permits the alteration or not once aoa permits the alteration then you know by taking ordinary resolution pass the i mean uh, alter the moa capital clause and last condition you know filing with roc in sh7 filing with roc within 30 days of uh, alteration that means you know within 30 days of uh, alteration file this information with roc so three conditions and how many ways of alteration five ways of alteration in that consolidation if it is affecting voting percentage voting uh, of the members then nclt prior approval is required clear ma next uh, section 62 further issue of shares so here you know issue of shares will take place in will take place two times one is at the time of incorporation directors should issue shares to the subscribers that is initial issue and any issue other than in initial issue we call it as further issue any issue other than initial issue is further issue so further issue of shares so under section 62 that further issue of shares can be done in three ways one is to the existing members existing members uh, pre-m2 rights or rights issue proportionate offer of shares to the existing members that is one way the other way is employees under employee stock option plan or stock option scheme the last one is to the others simply you no know, other than you know existing members and employees so last category if you take last category others it might be either of uh, public offer or uh, an offer to the identified persons if it is a public offer prospectus is required if it is an offer to identified persons up to 200 then private placement section 42 is going to apply so depending upon the case you need to comply chapter 3 of companies act 2013 you know prospectus and prospectus and allotment of securities so here section 62 speaks about further issue of shares to the members so whenever company make further issue of shares to the existing members they need to issue a document called letter of offer what is the name of the document letter of offer so this should be given at least three days before opening of a rights issue and that rights offer offer period should be offer period should be minimum 15 maximum 30 the range would be 15 to 30 days offer period should be minimum 13 15 days max 30 days but if you are a private company i repeat if you are a private company after taking consent from 90 percent of members 90 percent of the members you can reduce this three days you can reduce this 15 days so 15 days three days is subject to reduction only in case of private company not in all companies and you need to take consent from the members 90 percent of members should agree for shorter notice 90 percent of members should agree for shorter period then only it is possible I know here we offer shares and the if you see the contents of the letter of offer you know the ratio in which you are offering a share suppose for every 10 shares you are holding one additional share will be given at so and so price so and so price like that all the contents should be incorporated and you know if your aoa is silent renunciation is permitted and that point is also to be specified in aoa 
that means you can allow any person to become member of the company to subscribe that additional share are you all getting my point students next one next one so the notice of offer shall contain explicit statement that's what i told you so contents contents of the uh, letter of offer this point should be there if you are not willing to purchase the sorry subscribe the additional share you can transfer such right to the known people next one on expiry date you know the offer period completed but we didn't receive any application from the member and we didn't receive any rejection uh, letter from the member in that case board of directors may dispose the shares in a manner not disadvantageous to the company suppose the value of share is 60 rupees value of share is 60 rupees you offered the share at 58 to the member because you know he is our existing owner that's why you offered the share to the member now you know members didn't took the such shares suppose if member uh, failed to file application then you can dispose the uh, residual shares in a manner not disadvantageous to the company that means you can't trans you can't issue such shares less than uh, 58 rupees because if you offer such shares less than 58 it is a loss to the company company is going to miss some funds so loss to the company is nothing but indirect loss to the members understood everyone so these are the conditions to be satisfied ma but listen carefully for making rights offer no need to take consent of members because we are offering shares to the owners only because of this you know there would be no dilution of control there is no dilution of control existing members shares number of shares getting increased yes or no and you can't find a uh, dilution of control because before issue after issue there is no change in voting percentage next priority you can go with employees and you know that employees are internal in the internal part of the organization they know about our company so no need of advertisement no need to issue prospectors no need to issue private placement simply offering options to the employees so here the conditions to be remember is aoa permission obviously you need to check aoa permission next one members approval is very much required what kind of approval sir all cases special resolution but if you are a private company and regular in filing roc returns regular in filing roc returns then ordinary resolution is sufficient understood and sir i'm a listed company sir you know myself listed company sir then you need to follow sebi regulations also you need to follow sebi regulations also so these are the primary conditions next one for getting approval you need to issue notice calling for general meeting along with that notice you need to give explanatory statement you know in explanatory statement we will give complete information with respect to uh, how many options we are giving to employees to whom we are offering our shares what is the exercise price what is the vesting period everything will disclose all material information will provide in the explanatory statement and remember that vesting period that means you know time gap between uh, grant of options and uh, exercise of options exercise of options should be minimum one year and yes company is having complete freedom to fix lock-in period with respect to exercise of options so in sweat equity with respect to unlisted companies three years lock-in period is there right and you know until uh, employee become member of the company simply you know he's having option right so we can pay dividend to them those options can be transferred those options can be placed is completely wrong until he become member he can't get dividend his options are not transferable and he can't place the options if he do that it is null and void suppose you know if employee got deceased before exercising the option now legal hair can exercise the option legal hair can exercise the option understood next one ma so definition of employee so who is eligible to get uh, uh, shares under eSOP? you know permanent employee whether working in india or outside india whether in our company or holding company or subsidiary company but you know two people are specifically excluded who are they promoters promoter working as an employee in the company and the next one is director holding more than 10 percent equity in that company director holding more than 10 percent equity in that company these two people are prohibited from employee stock options 
very very important to remember these points because there is a chance of asking practical question so company is planning to allot shares under employee stock option scheme to the promoter of the company so do you agree and you know it obtains special resolution from the members of company so do you agree with the decision of the company the answer is no the answer is no understood but what would be your answer if it is a startup company so the answer is again different so the above conditions are not applicable up to 10 years from the date of incorporation of a startup company so care should be taken on exceptional cases so if you're reading main provision one time you know read exceptions twice thrice next one any other persons any other persons chapter number three conditions to be satisfied but since you know you're offering shares to the outsiders members consent members interest is getting affected their voting percentage will come down how previously you know one lakh share capital one lakh you know held by the existing members they are having 100 percent capital now company is offering additional one lakh shares to the outsiders as a result total share capital would be two lakhs existing members voting percentage will come to 50 percent so in that manner their voting percentage is getting affected understood next one ma so summary of this section 62 subsection 1 is further issue further issue to existing members existing members to employees in this case special resolution is must of course private company which is regular in filing ROC returns ordinary resolutions to the outsiders you know to the others simply you know others outsiders or others in that case special resolution is required plus valuation report you know registered valuer report with respect to fixation of price you can see that point here you know valuation report of a registered valuer plus chapter number three rules and regulations chapter number three rules and regulations you need to comply so this is the summary of section 62 subsection 1 right members employees with special resolution others with special resolution but this concept is not going to apply in the following cases this concept is not going to apply in the following cases sir what are the following cases sir following cases are you know uh, i issued convertible debentures some 10 years back i issued convertible debentures or convertible preferentials so today i need to convert them so under conversion process i'll take existing securities and i'll give equity shares so what law is telling whenever you are issuing equity shares you know further issue to the others you need to take special resolution you need to take registered value or report and you need to comply chapter number three rules but here no need to apply because 10 years back when i offered convertible shares convertible securities i should take special resolution at that point of time only so that means when i'm offering convertible securities first i need to take approval from existing members already i took existing members approval at the time of issue of convertible securities so no need of one more approval at the time of conversion so no need to take approval from the members at the time of conversion straight away you can issue preference shares sorry you can issue equity shares next this is a normal point and this is a special point you know special point listen carefully company took some loan from government company took loan from government or company issued debentures to the government at the time of maturity you know company was not in a position to repay unable to repay because of its financial condition financial condition is worse so it is it is not in a position to repay in that case government considering public interest considering financial affairs of the company issued terms considering all these factors government may order company to convert these loans or debentures into equity shares so when government is ordering company to convert them into equity now also no need to take special resolution from members no need to take valuation report no need to comply chapter number three rules but if company is not okay with the decision of the government company can go to nclt within 60 days of government order 
NCLT will fix the deal whether to allow or not to allow NCLT will fix the deal but the point is so in these two cases one is you know convertible securities convertible securities the other one is government order to convert their loans or debentures into equity shares in these two cases the aforesaid provisions won't apply and finally whatever the thing happened you know communicate the same with ROC fine coming to the next concept issue of bonus shares issue of bonus shares so bonus shares you know the shares which are given at free of cost no need to pay money you know the shares will be given at free of cost the other name to this concept is capitalization of profits so when you see the financial statements of a company you might have accumulated reserves and surplus and those accumulated reserves and surplus you can't find them under cash so that some portion of reserves and surplus may be available in fixed assets that means it is not available in cash so if company if members request company come on pay dividends or you are having more and more profits no more and more surplus but the point is i already invested that portion of reserves some portion of reserves in fixed assets they are not available in the form of current assets how can i pay dividend so for better you know for better capital structure for uh, presenting uh, financial statements in a better manner you can capitalize some profits capitalize that means you know issue shares here the entry would be like this you know reserves and surplus free reserves account debit securities premium account debit crr account debit to equity share capital now i'm capitalizing these reserves so capitalization of reserves concept will be there so the conditions for issue of bonus shares is first aoa important thing aoa aoa permits or not next approval from members ordinary resolution is to be taken why because we are capitalizing the profits capitalization of profit is taking place so you need to take approval from members ordinary resolution and you know at the time of issue of bonus shares company should not commit some defaults like you know repayment of deposits payment of interest on deposits employee statutory dues or uh, debentures you know debt related part company should not commit any default and with respect to sources you can utilize only three sources free reserves securities premium account crr account uh, for issuing bonus shares remember my dear students bonus is allowed in three parts you know bonus is available in three parts one is converting converting partly paid up to fully paid up partly paid up to fully paid up this is converting second one is issue of fully paid up bonus shares fully paid up bonus shares you know an extra share new share the third one is combination combination understood so bonus you can provide bonus in these three ways right next one uh, coming to the sources you know you can utilize only these three sources in reserves and surplus if you find revaluation reserve it is not permitted to utilize revaluation reserve for the concept of bonus issue and coming to the conditions you know aoa first board will recommend and members has to approve ordinary resolution and company should not possess the following defaults you know debt related instruments and then statutory dues of employees so partly paid up shares should be converted into fully paid up before issuing bonus shares understood so by making calls on shares or by providing bonus element and finally remember this point you know you can't substitute a dividend with bonus so declaring dividend so suppose you know i declare dividend instead of paying it in cash i can't give them bonus shares or in the place of dividend i can't issue bonus shares you know dividend is a separate aspect bonus is a separate separate aspect getting my point students so you can't replace both you can't replace dividend with the bonus shares next one very small section section 64 that is intimation to roc what all about this sir? what about this intimation very simple you know whenever you alter capital whenever you redeem preferences whenever you know you had a direction from the government with respect to conversion of debentures into equity conversion of loans into equity in all these cases 
company should communicate that matter with ROC. What is the time limit sir? 30 days. Form number SH7 I already told you. In case of default, you know, if delay happened, then punishment to the company is 500 for each day delay. But this is subject to maximum penalty of, you know, 5 lakhs in case of company, 1 lakh in case of officer in default. So 30 days you need to file. You know, you took 60 days for filing. Additional how many days? 30 days you violated. So 30 days into 500, that means, you know, 15,000 rupees to company, 15,000 rupees to each and every officer in default. But this is restricted to 5 lakhs and 2 lakhs as the case may be. Understood, ma? Everyone. And the final part of this share capital and debenture is uh, section 66 to 71. Reduction of capital under section 66 of the Companies Act 2013. If you take any share, you know, it will have face value. Say for suppose face value 10 rupee. Paid up value. In one case, it is 10 rupee. In another case, uh, it was uh, suppose 8 rupees. Now the point is, under reduction of capital, I may reduce this face value or I may reduce this paid up value. Either of the things will happen. I may reduce face value, I may reduce uh, paid up value. Suppose, you know, if you take this case, reducing face value 10 to 8, this is also reduction of capital. As a result, member liability becomes zero. That is nothing but extinguishment of member's liability. If I reduce this 10 to 9, 9 minus 8 member liability is 1. Originally member liability is 2, but now it was reduced to 1. That is nothing but reduction. See, my intention is not reducing the liability of members, but as I am reducing share capital, as I am reducing share capital, the final impact is on liability of the members. And the next one is either with or without extinguishing or either with or without reducing the liability of any of its shares with respect to cancel any paid up share capital. So in this case, I am changing this paid up value figures. I am reducing this paid up value figures. Next one, pay off any paid up share capital which is in excess of wants of the company. So this is different, buyback is different. Under buyback, you know, company will take shares and company will repay money. Company will pay money, company will take shares. Whereas here, you know, company won't take any share from the member. Company won't take any share from the member and company straight away will pay some portion of paid up value. Because of these three reasons, members liability may be reduced or members liability may be extinguished. This first part, you already, you know, you are very familiar with first part under internal reconstruction chapter. In internal reconstruction chapter, you have already done many problems on this aspect. So reduction of uh, capital where, you know, certain portion of paid up capital, you will transfer to, you will transfer it to capital reduction and all the assets, you know, miscellaneous assets, goodwill uh, will be transferred to capital reduction where you will have final impact. That means, you know, total this reduction of capital may take place in three circumstances. One is, you know, cancellation of uncalled capital, first point. Second one, cancellation of paid up capital. Third one, pay off paid up share capital, which is in excess of wants of the company. So in these three ways, reduction of capital provisions will get affected. But the procedure, what is the procedure, sir? See, first of all, this concept is applicable only to the company having share capital and limited liability. So listen carefully, three companies will follow sorry two companies will follow this concept company with share capital company limited by shares next one company limited by guarantee and having share capital only to these companies only to these two companies section 66 is applicable now coming to the provision sorry procedure first point aoa authorization is must for reduction of capital next take members approval that is special resolution what kind of approval special resolution is required for reducing the capital next one the company should not have the following defaults no defaults at the time of reduction one is you know with respect to deposits and the next one is interest on deposits company should not commit any default in repayment of deposits and payment of interest on deposits once these three conditions are satisfied. Now obtain a certificate from chartered accountant, certificate from company auditor, simply you know company auditor who is chartered accountant in practice. So with respect to 
financial statements with respect to financial statements preparation of financial statements so the financial statements and this capital reduction had effect according to the accounting standards now once this is ready now file an application with nclt that means without nclt approval capital reduction won't happen so for reduction of uh, capital nclt approval is must so now here starts the procedure company has to file application with nclt with respect to reduction of capital immediately nclt will forward the application to four people four people central government roc if a company is listed company then sebi and finally you know all the creditors so yes creditors consent is also required so nclt will forward this application to the four people and it will give three months time period so if you have any objection so cg roc sebi creditors if you have any objection file your objections within three months from the receipt of this notice so nclt will fix the deadline so within three months if any objection was received by nclt nclt will ask company to eliminate so to remove those uh, objections simply to settle them suppose some creditors are objecting capital reduction come on company pay them if no objection is received no objection is received from these people then nclt subject to auditor certificate with respect to accounting treatment in books of accounts regarding capital reduction and subject to creditors consent so nclt will give approval of capital reduction to the company so capital reduction approval finally nclt will give you the moment you get nclt order company should file the same with roc for the purpose of registration so roc will register the same and issue the certificate from that date onwards the capital reduction is set to be effective so tell me students when capital reduction is set to be effective from which date onwards capital reduction is set to be effective sir from the date of filing with roc sorry from the date you know roc register capital reduction from that date onwards capital reduction is set to be effective in this case the members will be liable for the balance uh, unpaid amount sorry uncalled or unpaid amount suppose you know original face value is 10 rupee original paid up value is 10 rupee company is thinking that we had excess funds so let's pay some funds and reduce the face value and paid up value so company plan to reduce face value to 8 paid up value to 6 for example they paid 4 rupees per share for example company paid 4 rupees per share to the member so paid up value got reduced to 6 and company decided to reduce face value to the 8 now 8 minus 6 so 2 rupees is the maximum liability of the members 2 rupees is the maximum liability of the members but remember students if company did this practice in order to cheat creditors how sir you know nclt will forward the application to the creditors which creditors company creditors so who are the creditors of the company do you think nclt know who are the creditors of the company no sir so company will provide a list of creditors to nclt sir these people are my creditors sir these people are my creditors originally there are 100 creditors each and every one liability you know each to each and every person company is liable for example 1 crore the total liability is 100 crores however company concealed some 60 creditors details company concealed some 60 creditor details they filed only 40 creditor details with nclt nclt gave application to 40 creditors 40 creditors gave no objection and finally you know nclt approved this uh, reduction and nclt you know it will definitely ask a company to publish to publish nclt order in two newspapers publish nclt order in two newspapers so after seeing that advertisement you know after seeing that publication the 60 creditors came to nclt sir sir my my detail is not my details are not there in the register sir or my details are not provided to you sir that's why i didn't give i didn't raise any objection so i am the creditor to company these are the details like that if any creditor comes forward subsequent to the reduction of capital that is nothing but fraud that is nothing but cheating so company cheated its creditors now what nclt will do nclt will simply uh, take back this nclt order so it will simply cancel this nclt order 
the moment nclt order gets cancelled what happens members liability what is the original liability that original liability will continue suppose you know face value is 10 rupee original face value 10 rupee paid up value original paid up value 10 but you know they were paid 4 rupees right so 10 minus 4 6 so original face value 10 and paid up value is 6 so the balance amount 4 rupees so members persons who are members as on date of reduction as on date of capital reduction they are liable to contribute 4 rupees to all those creditors you know 4 rupees per share 4 rupees per share they need to contribute that means if reduction if capital reduction happened fraudulently in that case the officers of the company who are in default they are going to get punishment under section 447 and members are going to get punishment sir members what kind of punishment sir their original liability gets retrieved so they are not liable for the reduced portion they are liable for original amounts so their maximum liability is original liability understood ma everyone and who will be held liable ma the persons who are members who are members at the time of reduction of capital so that is all about section 66 very simple section uh, think one year back this question came in the exam so procedure for reduction of capital probability 5 marks 5 marks question ma so you can see here all the points i covered so nclt is subject to the approval of creditors and subject to the auditor certificate with respect to accounting treatment it will give order once company get that order company should register that order with roc and company should publish that order in two newspapers so that any creditor details were omitted that creditor can file an application with nclt now nclt will lift the uh, lifted order that means it will scrap the order now members liability original liability will be continued and the officers in default they were they are going to get punishment under section 447 understood so very simple topic small concept next one section 67 a company is restricted to purchase its own shares comment obviously yes ma buyback is different purchase of its securities is different I repeat you know don't get confused with buyback and you know section 67 and section 68 under 68 you know under buyback the moment company take its shares you know the company uh, purchase shares from the members it will cancel all those shares but section 67 is like this you know purchase of shares means their intention is to hold the shares the intention of company under section 67 is to hold the shares tell me is it logical you know will you buy your own assets i'm asking you suppose you had a bike it's your bike it was registered in your name only will you purchase it will you purchase it no sir no so similarly how a company is allowed to purchase its own shares ma so no company is permitted to purchase its own shares directly indirectly you know company is not allowed to finance anyone either its employee or any outsider so company public company is prohibited from financing anyone to purchase its own share are you getting my point but this section is not applicable to two companies you know nidhi company and uh, private specified ifsc public companies of course you know private company should satisfy all these conditions to get the privilege these conditions we already discussed under deposits concept ma it, uh, no other body corporate has invested money in this private company and the borrowings of this private company should be you know twice of its paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less and there should be no default in repayment of such borrowings any private company fulfilling these conditions section 67 is not applicable logically speaking that means public interest in such company is zero so that company can do anything so that company can purchase shares from its members okay nidhi company nidhi rules will apply so don't worry next one next point no public company can finance any person to purchase its own share directly or indirectly but to this general rule we had three exceptions suppose if you take banking company their business is lending what is the business their business is lending so yes they are giving money you know, based on the security and they are not bothered with that money which was uh, which was uh, you know which borrower is having so borrower whatever he do with borrowed funds it is none of the business of a banking company 
based on security they will grant some loans are you getting my point now you know borrower buying a bank company shares it is immaterial but the only point is such loan should be done in ordinary course of business suppose you know that fellow provided security worth 1 crore as per banking norms i can give finance up to 80% i should give finance of 80 lakhs only imagine you know bank gave 8 crores finance with respect to security of 1 crore now this is not ordinary course of business in that case this general rule is once again applicable so this general rule no public company shall finance any one directly or indirectly indirectly means you know giving guarantee providing some security some other financial assistance so you should not provide any financial assistance to any one to purchase your company shares your holding company shares this is general rule but exceptions are more important than general rule first one banking companies simply lending business second one you know we are providing uh, benefits to the employees under a scheme so we want our employees should get uh, some perpetual gains so throughout their life they should get some gains it is possible only uh, in the form of uh, you know dividends you know if company is regular in paying dividends definitely its members will get uh, amounts perpetuity you know throughout their life throughout the life of the company yes it will pay some money so members only will get dividends chalo let's make employees as members of the company we'll form a trust in that tr this trust is only for the benefit of employees now company can finance this trust to purchase shares of the company of course three conditions are to be satisfied for forming the trust special resolution members approval is required first thing members approval is required second thing this trust should be for the benefit of employees and third thing the trust should acquire only fully paid up shares they should subscribe fully paid up shares if these conditions are satisfied then definitely uh it will be covered under exception so general rule is not going to apply and the third exception is employee company sorry employee loans so instead of forming a trust you know if you, if you had hundreds of employees then form a trust but you know you had very less employees very few employees and one of them are interested to become member of the company but they are not having that much financial assistance now on the request of that person you can grant loan to that person provided that loan amount should not exceed 6 months pay it's 6 months salary maximum 6 months salary you can help him you can provide financial assistance and with that amount he should acquire he should subscribe or he should purchase fully paid up shares not partly paid up and moreover employee should not be kmp employee should not be director so if those three conditions are satisfied then so loan given to the employee to purchase the company shares is not treated as a offense because it is already covered under exceptions and you know you need to disclose all the points in the board report that is as usual and penalty for contravention if you violate the provisions of section 67 then you know company 1 lakh to 25 lakhs minimum 1 lakh maximum 25 lakhs officer in default imprisonment and fine imprisonment up to 3 years fine minimum 1 lakh to maximum 25 lakhs so this is all about section 67 very simple my dear students two general rules no company is allowed to purchase its own shares to this general rule we had two exceptions private ifsc com private company ifsc public company and then nidhi company second general rule no public company should provide financial assistance either directly or indirectly to any of its employees or outsiders in order to acquire shares of the company or its holding company but we had three exceptions what are those three exceptions lending business next one uh, money uh, money lent to a trust for the benefit of employees you know after taking special resolution only and the trust is taking only fully paid up shares next one third exception is loans to the employee but employee excludes directors and key managerial person maximum loan you can provide 6 months 6 uh, months salary and then with that loan amount he can purchase only fully paid up shares understood next point buy back of shares buy back of shares so section 68 to 70 
it speaks about only buyback first of all for making buyback sources of funds sir from where they will get money sir from where they will get money you know they had uh, three sources one is issue proceeds they can issue equity shares with that money they can make buyback they can make buyback but the point is shares involved in issue shares involved in buyback should not be same category they should not belong to same class understood so issue proceeds of uh, other class of shares first one second one free reserves third one securities premium they can utilize these three amounts for the purpose of buyback repeat Free reserves, security premium, issue proceeds. But issue proceeds of the shares should not belong to the you know the shares involved in buyback and the shares involved in issue should not be same. Next one, ma. When you select you know reserves concept, you know other than issue proceeds, then you need to create CRR, capital redemption reserve account, and CRR shall be utilized only for the purpose of issuing fully paid up bonus shares, which we discussed under section sixty three of the Company Act. clear so with this sources completed this point was asked uh, think three times in last 10 attempts this point was asked for three times ma next one conditions for buyback first uh, aoi authorization compulsory so you blindly remember the point you know company to do any activity it should get permission from aoi and this is a general permission yes company can make buyback of securities but how much to what extent it can make buyback for that you know secondary approval is required it depends upon the percentage of buyback suppose you know if the amount involved in buyback if the amount involved in buyback is 10% of paid up equity share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium then board resolution is sufficient board resolution is sufficient if the amount involved in buyback i repeat amount involved in buyback that means amount to be invested in buyback amount involved in buyback if it is up to 10% of paid up equity share capital plus free reserves plus security premium board resolution is sufficient but with special resolution maximum you can go up to 25% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium here you need to identify the difference here i'm writing the word equity share capital but whereas here i wrote the word paid up share capital in a single financial year in a single financial year a buyback is permitted up to 25% of paid up equity share capital this is with respect to you know number of shares number of shares this is with respect to amount in buyback as i already told you amount involved in the buyback the amount which we can invest in buyback is the first point number of shares which we can buy back per year maximum 25% of paid up equity share capital understood the limit should be very clear ma next sir, amount completed number of shares completed there is one more condition that is debt equity ratio debt equity ratio post buyback after completion of buyback the debt equity ratio should not fall below 2 is to 1 sorry should not fall above i mean should not cross 2 is to 1 that means for every 1 rupee equity max 2 rupees debt it should not go beyond 2 it should not go beyond 2 so in debt equity ratio what components we can consider you know long term debts either secured or unsecured debt equity ratio will consider only long term debt ma whether secured or unsecured in coming to the equity you know equity uh, simply you know capital reserves and surplus so these three conditions as you all know because you might have done some 20 25 problems in buyback chapter so only based on these three conditions you use it to complete buyback problems right so these three conditions are important next one ma the shares should be fully paid up the shares involved in the buyback should be fully paid up and then coming to the rules and regulations if you are a listed company if you are a listed company you need to follow sebi guidelines sir unlisted company sir company share capital and debenture rules are sufficient next one time gap between two buybacks sub so maximum sorry in a year how many buyback i can do sir in a year how many times i can do buyback only one time and moreover the time gap between two buybacks should not uh, sorry should not fall less than one year i repeat the one year gap is between 
closure of earliest buyback earlier buyback and opening of next buyback the time gap is not you know date of commencement of buybacks you should not check one year from uh, date of commencement of previous buyback to date of commencement of next buyback it is not like that previous buyback when completed from that date onwards up to one year you are not permitted to make one more buyback understood everyone so that's what you know lock in period next uh, procedure for making buyback conditions i fulfilled procedure so board resolution is sufficient if amount involved is up to 10 percent beyond 10 percent definitely members approval is required for that you need to call them for general meeting so you need to issue notice calling for general meeting along with notice you need to give explanatory statement since it is a special business so you all know what is an ordinary business what is a special business or else read once management and administration chapter there you will come to know so all the decisions taken by members in a company general meeting are classified into two types one is ordinary the other one is special and for all special businesses explanatory statement is compulsory so in explanatory statement you need to disclose all the points you know necessity of buyback class of shares amount to be invested time limit for completion of buyback you need to disclose all the points and one more point the board resolution or special resolution which you took is valid for a period of 12 months that means within 12 months you need to complete buyback sir unfortunately 12 months completed but we didn't complete buyback sir take approval one more time take approval one more time and then from whom we can make buyback sir that means you know who from whom we can take shares you will be you are given three options one is you know all the existing members on proportionate basis so for every 10 shares held by you company will take one share and company will pay you sufficient money or some from open market you know go to the stock market uh, stock exchange who are willing to sell at that point of time take their shares or next one you know purchase of specified securities that means previously you have offered some shares under sweat equity or under employee stock option now take those shares pay the money and important point you need to select one option and you should complete buyback only in that option changing of options is not permitted okay and during the buyback yes the directors minimum two directors minimum two directors should file a declaration stating that company position is good so company is in solvent position only it is not in insolvency so next to one year company will not be liquidated or company will not be uh, will not be resulted into insolvency so the logic of this concept is simply only solvent companies are permitted to make buyback so next to one year why one year sir because generally you know going concern concept is only for one year going concern means company will do business for the next one year so standing on 31st march 2022 if i am able to do business till 31st march 2023 that means going concern is appropriate or else there is no concept of going concern now board of directors should file this declaration that sir next one year we will do the business company will not be regarded as insolvent even if a company went into liquidation even if company goes into liquidation the assets are in a position to meet its liabilities so no worry with respect to creditors like that you know declaration should be signed by two directors one should be managing director and once you know buyback completed within seven days cancel all those securities if they are in physical form you know simply scrap them if they are in dmat form reduce the number reduce the number extinguish the dmat securities and finally ma'am cooling period once buyback is completed the next six months you are not permitted to issue same class of shares to anyone six months you need to wait after six months you can issue same class of shares same class of shares understood <clears throat> so because of buyback my paid up share capital will come down but my authorized capital is same i can issue you know unissued shares or you know unsubscribed shares i can offer but the point is shares involved in buyback that class of shares should not be offered for a period of six months of course to this general rule we have exceptions you can offer shares under bonus issue or you can offer same shares under you know to the uh, persons holding convertible preference shares convertible debentures or you know we gave uh, we had an obligation 
to allot shares under employee stock option or under sweat equity then you can offer same shares so in these cases general rule is not applicable because these are genuine cases there there arises an obligation because of past uh, events past in past they made a promise that you know your preference shares will be converted your debentures will be converted you are going to get shares under esop like that you know in past i made promise so fulfilling those promises you can issue same class of shares which you bought back recently so for that six months time period is not applicable and you need to maintain register of buyback in register you need to update all the particulars finally the buy when buyback is completed file the returns with roc that is the last point ma once buyback is completed file returns with roc return of buyback and any provision if you violate you are going to get punishment under section 68 subsection 11 so punishment how much sir company 1 lakh to 3 lakhs officer in default 1 lakh to 3 lakhs simple punishment uh, CRR, I already told you, when you select a option of a buyback out of, you know, divisible profits or security premium, the nominal value of shares which you bought back shall be transferred to CRR. CRR shall be utilized only for issuing fully paid bonus shares. And section 70, uh, in 2019, I guess there is a question on this section 70. So list down the circumstances where buyback is prohibited. List out the circumstances where buyback is prohibited. Simply, if you remember equity shares with differential rights, uh, disqualifications, you know, defaults under equity shares with differential rights, you simply write those points sufficient. Ma. That means, listen carefully. If I am having following defaults, then I am prohibited from making buyback up to five years, sorry, up to three years after rectification. So, what are those defaults, sir? Failure to pay dividend, failure to repay preference capital, failure to pay preference dividend, failure to pay debentures, failure to pay interest on deposits, failure to repay deposits, failure to repay term loans, failure to repay interest on term loans. Simply, you know, write down the sources of finance. Write down the sources of finance. In the sources of finance where you commit mistake, you are prohibited from buyback. So dividend on equity or preference, preference share capital, preference dividend, debentures, only debentures. Next, interest on deposits, deposits, term loans, interest on term loans. If you make default, first rectify them. First make the defaults good. After that, wait for three years. Next year, you can make buyback. And then if you commit any default under section 92, filing of annual returns, 123 declaration of dividend 127 failure to pay declared dividend under 127 and then 129 financial statements preparation of financial statements if you had these defaults then also you are not allowed to make buyback so simply a solvent company which is regular in filing returns with roc which is regular in paying monies to the creditors uh, and then preference shareholders only those companies are permitted to make buyback understood then last part of this chapter you know that is debentures so debentures so here section 71 only section 71 is important with respect to debentures all the conditions you will find under section 71 of course for debentures there is only one section that is 71 so I'll tell from first point onwards. So sir, company can issue convertible debentures, non-convertible debentures, no problem. But if company decides to issue convertible debentures, special resolution from members is required. Under section 62 also I told you, at the time of issue of convertible debentures only, company should obtain special resolution from the members. In case of non-convertible debentures, you need to check whether you no know, proposed loan plus outstanding loan that means you know loan balance as on date plus new loans if they are within the limits of you know 100 percent of paid up share capital plus free resource plus security premium then you know for non-convertible debentures board resolution is sufficient but if they exceed the limit suppose if they exceed the limit in that case for non-convertible debentures members resolutions members 
approval is required one time special resolution is required one time special resolution is required if they are convertible debentures forget within the limits or outside the limits forget about the limit if they are convertible one special resolution is required understood so members approval when required sir convertible debentures required non convertible debentures but they are within the limits sir you know outstanding loans plus proposed loans so all together they are within the limit of 100% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium then board resolution is sufficient or else take special resolution next one next one voting rights prohibited because debenture holder is a creditor he is an outsider he won't get any voting rights you can offer secured debentures you can offer unsecured debentures but if you are offering secured debentures if you are issuing secured debentures then you must create charge on asset charge on asset that asset market value should cover both principal amount as well as interest amount and this charge should be registered under section 77 of the companies act with roc within 30 days or else they are not treated as secure debentures they are treated as unsecured and you know the maximum tenure of debentures is 10 years but if you are a company engaged in infra doing infra business or doing infra finance or you know infra debt fund company debt fund company so simply you know engaged in infra then for you the redemption period is up to 30 years up to 30 years general tenure 10 years whereas infra companies 30 years so creation of charge security appointment of debenture trustee all these points are as usual but remember my dear students if you are offering debentures to 500 mem more than 500 members or if you are offering debentures to public at a large public at a large then debenture trustee appointment is compulsory of course you know a person whoever having requisite qualifications and not having disqualifications is eligible to act as a debenture trustee you know company will appoint one person as a trustee company will uh, publish debenture trustee details in the offer document next one limit on borrowings from debentures that's what i told you section 180 subsection 1 clause C is all about 100 percent of you can see here 100 percent of paid up share capital free reserves and security premium so this point already i covered ma next one debenture trustee just now i told you if you are offering debentures to members you know more than 500 or if you are offering debentures to the public at a large then trustee appointment of trustee is compulsory so before appointment you need to take consent letter from the debenture trustee proposed candidate however he should not possess following disqualifications so once read this point carefully debenture trustee may be member of the company but he should not have beneficial membership not holding shares beneficially not holding shares in beneficial interest beneficially so beneficial interest he should not have beneficial interest that means he may hold shares on behalf of someone he should not have beneficial interest in the shares of the company and he should not be promoter, director, KMP or any officer of the uh, group companies. You know, our company, our associate company, our subsidiary, our holding company. And he should not be related to these two persons. He, he should not be related to all these persons. And he should not be creditor to the company. He should not be debtor to the group companies. He should not be debtor. He should not be creditor. He should not be surety with respect to debentures. With respect to debentures payment, he should not be surety. That means he should not provide any guarantee. And he should not have any pecuniary relationship with the company during the last two financial years as well as current financial year. So pecuniary relationship means how much amounts are, you know, 2% of the gross turnover or, you know, total income, total service income or rupees 50 lakhs out of all these amounts whichever is less you, you need to take it as standard amount and compare the amount of transactions you happen uh, you had with company so amount of transactions amount involved in the transactions if it is uh, uh, higher than this amount you know if it is uh, equal to or higher than the standard amount then you are said to have this pecuniary relationship once you had pecuniary relationship you are said to be disqualified 
नेक्स्ट वन इन केस ऑफ कैजुअल वेकेंसी ऑफ ट्रस्टी यू नो ट्रस्टी वेकेंसी मे बी ऑफ टू टाइप्स वन इज यू नो रेजिग्नेशन द अदर वन इज अदर देन रेजिग्नेशन इन केस ऑफ अदर देन रेजिग्नेशन बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स विल फिल द वेकेंसी बट इन केस ऑफ रेजिग्नेशन यू नो बोर्ड विल फिल बट फॉर दट मेजोरिटी ऑफ डिबेंचर होल्डर्स कंसेंट इज रिक्वायर्ड नेक्स्ट वन yes removal of trustee if debenture holders want to remove the trustee you know by passing a special resolution simply 3/4 in value of the debentures so total debentures rupees 50 crores now 3/4 means 37 and of crores so people holding 37 and of crores one person or two persons or 10 persons put together holding 37 and of crores their consent is required for removal of the trustee so the role of debenture trustee you know he will simply act as a whistle blower ma he will act as a whistle blower he, he will take all the steps to protect the interest of the debenture holders he may conduct meetings on suo moto or he may conduct meeting once he receive any requisition from the holders holding not less than 1/10th of the value of debentures next one if debenture trustee is negligent then he is 100% liable even any clause uh, avoiding debenture trustee from liability any clause in the trust deed protecting debenture trustee from any liability such clauses will be treated as void so he is 100% liable but he can be protected with the consent of you know 3/4 the total value of debentures of such clause if 3/4 the total value of debentures of such clause give approval then his liability will become zero or else he is liable in all the negligent cases next one company is liable to pay interest periodically and company should repay debenture amount as it promised suppose you know if company is not in a position to pay the amounts if it is not in a position to pay the amounts maturity date you know it is after one year but right now company is losing its solvency position company is becoming insolvent then trustee can file a petition with nclt it's like an anticipatory breach today it didn't commit any breach but after one year it may commit breach sir definitely so trustee can file a petition with the tribunal stating that sir please stop company from incurring new liabilities now nclt will order company yes stop incurring new liabilities after repayment of these debentures you can incur new liabilities next one suppose on maturity date itself if company made default on maturity date company made default then any debenture holder can file petition with nclt nclt will order company to pay interest to pay principal portion to the debenture holder the difference between you know ninth point and d point is only simple ninth point is like anticipatory breach as of now it is not maturity it is not at maturity before maturity but company is no company may commit default whereas d point company is already at a default so in ninth point you know trustee will file a petition because debenture holder don't know the position of company only trustee will know the position trustee will file a petition with the tribunal here debenture holder or trustee can file a petition now ma with respect to security of debentures debenture trust deed and then inspection of debenture trust deed or uh, debenture certificate debenture redemption reserve all other matters any matter you know central government is having superior power to frame rules it is having a power to frame the rules so the parliament is giving power to central government to frame rules with respect to these points and next one ma debenture redemption reserve debenture redemption reserve this is one more crucial point so how much sir you know it is 10% ma 10% so 10% of outstanding debentures they need to create a, a reserve account they need to create reserve so with respect to the debenture redemption reserve you just uh, have this chart ma you know you just have this chart all india financial institutions no need to create any debenture redemption reserve with respect to both public issue and private placement and next one nbfcs with respect to public issue they need to create drr of just 10% of outstanding value now listed companies are also not required to create any drr and coming to the unlisted you know other companies other than uh, companies which were prescribed above 
for them you know 10 percent of value both you know public issue as well as 10 percent of value under private placement all these they need to create a debenture redemption reserve so just go through this question one time and you know after maintenance of drr of 10 percent 15 percent that is maturing the year 15 percent maturing during the year you need to maintain that balance on liquid assets similar to the deposits you know you need to create deposit repayment reserve and you need to invest that money on liquid assets here also you need to maintain 10 percent reserve but 15 percent on liquid assets i know they need to reduce it but okay fine 10 percent provision 10 percent provision and whatever the funds you kept aside under a provision you know that money you need to keep it on liquid assets but you know percentage to be maintained on liquid assets is 15 percent of debentures maturing during this year clear so if they are convertible debentures then no need to maintain drr no need to invest on liquid assets if they are partly convertible debentures so non-convertible portion non-convertible portion on that only you need to maintain drr on that amount only you need to maintain uh, liquid assets is it clear so with this share capital and debentures chapter marathon completed